Section 18 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. The Unity of the Church. Encyclical Letter Satis Cognitum, June 20th, 1896. It is sufficiently well known unto you that no small share of our thoughts and of our care is devoted to our endeavor to bring back to the fold, placed under the guardianship of Jesus Christ, the chief pastor of souls, sheep that have strayed. Bent upon this, we have thought it most conducive to the solitary end and purpose to describe the exemplar and, as it were, the linkaments of the church. Among these, the most worthy of our chief consideration is unity. This the divine author impressed on it as a lasting sign of truth and of unconquerable strength. The essential beauty and comeliness of the church ought greatly to influence the minds of those who consider it. Nor is it improbable that ignorance may be dispelled by the consideration, that false ideas and prejudices may be dissipated from the minds chiefly of those who find themselves in error without fault of theirs, and that even a love for the church may be stirred up in the souls of men, like unto that charity wherewith Christ loved and united himself to that spouse redeemed by his precious blood. Christ loved the church and delivered himself up for it. If those about to come back to their most loving mother, not yet fully known or culpably abandoned, should perceive that their return involves not indeed the shedding of their blood, at which price, nevertheless, the church was bought by Jesus Christ, but some lesser trouble and labor, let them clearly understand that this burden has been laid on them, not by the will of man, but by the will and command of God. They may thus, by the help of heavenly grace, Realize and feel the truth of the divine saying, My yoke is sweet and my burden light. Wherefore, having put all our hope in the Father of lights, from whom cometh every best gift and every perfect gift, from him, namely, who alone gives the increase, we earnestly pray that he will graciously grant us the power of bringing conviction home to the minds of men. Although God can do by his own power all that is affected by created natures, Nevertheless, in the counsels of his loving providence, he has preferred to help men by the instrumentality of men. And, as in the natural order, he does not usually give full perfection, except by means of man's work and actions, so also he makes use of human aid for that which lies beyond the limits of nature, that is to say, for the sanctification and salvation of souls. But it is obvious that nothing can be communicated amongst men save by means of external things which the senses can perceive. For this reason, the Son of God assumed human nature, who being in the form of God, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of a man. And thus living on earth, he taught his doctrine and gave his laws, conversing with men. And since it was necessary that his divine mission should be perpetuated to the end of time, he took to himself disciples, trained by himself, and made them partakers of his own authority. And when he had invoked upon them from heaven the spirit of truth, he bade them go through the whole world and faithfully preach to all nations what he had taught and what he had commanded, so that by the profession of his doctrine and the observance of his laws, the human race might obtain to holiness on earth and never-ending happiness in heaven. In this wise, and on this principle, the church was begotten. If we consider the chief end of this church and the proximate efficient causes of salvation, it is undoubtedly spiritual. But in regard to those who constitute it, and to the things which lead to these spiritual gifts, it is external and necessarily visible. The apostles received a mission to teach by visible and audible signs, and they discharged their mission only by words and acts which certainly appealed to the senses so that their voices falling upon the ears of those who heard them begot faith in souls. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And faith itself, that is, assent given to the first and supreme truth, though residing essentially in the intellect, must be manifested by outward profession. For, with the heart, we believe unto justice, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In the same way, in man, nothing is more internal than heavenly grace, which begets sanctity. But the ordinary and chief means of obtaining grace are external. That is to say, the sacraments which are administered by men, specially chosen for that purpose by means of certain ordinances. 
Jesus Christ commanded his apostles and their successors, to the end of time, to teach and rule the nations. He ordered the nations to accept their teaching and obey their authority. But this correlation of rights and duties in the Christian commonwealth not only could not have been made permanent, but could not even have been initiated except through the senses, which are of all things the messengers and interpreters. For this reason, the Church is so often called in holy writ a body, and even the body of Christ. Now you are the body of Christ, and precisely because it is a body is the Church visible, and because it is the body of Christ is it living and energizing, because by the infusion of his power Christ guards and sustains it, just as the vine gives nourishment and renders fruitful the branches united to it. And as in animals the vital principle is unseen and invisible, and is evidenced and manifested by the movements and actions of the members, so the principle of supernatural life in the Church is clearly shown in that which is done by it. From this it follows that those who arbitrarily conjure up and picture to themselves a hidden and invisible Church are in grievous and pernicious error, as also are those who regard the Church as a human institution which claims a certain obedience and discipline in external duties but which is without the perennial communication of the gifts of divine grace, and without all that which testifies by constant and undoubted signs to the existence of that life which is drawn from God. It is assuredly as impossible that the Church of Jesus Christ can be the one or the other, as that man should be a body alone or a soul alone. The connection and union of both elements is as absolutely necessary to the true Church as the intimate union of the soul and body is to human nature. The church is not something dead. It is the body of Christ endowed with supernatural life. As Christ, the head and exemplar, is not wholly in his visible human nature, which Photinians and Nestorians assert, nor wholly in the invisible divine nature, as the Monophysites hold, but is one from and in both natures, visible and invisible. So the mystical body of Christ is the true church, only because its visible parts draw life and power from the supernatural gifts and other things whence spring their very nature and essence. But since the church is such by divine will and constitution, such it must uniformly remain to the end of time. If it did not, then it would not have been founded as perpetual, and the end set before it would have been limited to some certain place and to some certain period of time, both of which are contrary to the truth. The union, consequently, of visible and invisible elements, because it harmonizes with the natural order, and by God's will belongs to the very essence of the Church, must necessarily remain so long as the Church itself shall endure. Wherefore, Chrysostom writes, Secede not from the Church, for nothing is stronger than the Church. Thy hope is the Church, thy salvation is the Church, thy refuge is the Church. It is higher than the heavens and wider than the earth. It never grows old, but is ever full of vigor. Wherefore, Holy Writ, pointing to its strength and stability, calls it a mountain. Also, Augustine says, Unbelievers think that the Christian religion will last for a certain period in the world, and will then disappear. But it will remain as long as the sun, as long as the sun rises and sets. That is, as long as the ages of time shall rule, the Church of God, the true body of Christ on earth, will not disappear and in another place. The church will totter if its foundation shakes. But how can Christ be moved? Christ remaining immovable, it, the church, shall never be shaken. Where are they that say that the church has disappeared from the world, when it cannot even be shaken? He who seeks the truth must be guided by these fundamental principles. That is to say, that Christ the Lord instituted and formed the church. Wherefore, when we are asked what its nature is, the main thing is to see what Christ wished, and what in fact he did. Judged by such a criterion, it is the unity of the Church which must be principally considered, and of this, for the general good, it has seemed useful to speak in this encyclical. It is so evident from the clear and frequent testimonies of Holy Writ that the true Church of Jesus Christ is one, though no Christian can dare to deny it. But in judging and determining the nature of this unity may have erred in various ways. Not the foundation of the Church alone, but its whole constitution, belongs to the class of things affected by Christ's free choice. For this reason, the entire case must be judged by what was actually done. We must consequently investigate 
not how the church may possibly be one but how he who founded it willed that it should be one but when we consider what was actually done we find that jesus christ did not in point of fact institute a church to embrace several communities similar in nature but in themselves distinct and lacking those bonds which render the church unique and indivisible after that manner in which in the symbol of our faith we profess i believe in one church the church in respect to its unity belongs to the category of things indivisible by nature though heretics try to divide it into many parts we say therefore that the catholic church is unique in its essence in its doctrine in its origin and in its excellence furthermore the eminence of the church arises from its unity as the principle of its constitution a unity surpassing all else and having nothing like unto it or equal to it for this reason christ speaking of this mystical edifice mentions only one church which he calls his own i will build my church any other church except this one since it has not been founded by christ cannot be the true church this becomes even more evident when the purpose of the divine founder is considered for what did christ the lord ask what did he wish in regard to the church founded or about to be founded this to transmit to it the same mission and the same mandate which he had received from the father that they should be perpetuated this he clearly resolved to do this he actually did as the father has sent me i also send you as thou hast sent me into the world i also have sent them into the world but the mission of christ is to save that which had perished that is to say not some nations or peoples but the whole human race without distinction of time or place the son of man came that the world might be saved by him for there is no other name under heaven given by men whereby we must be saved the church therefore is bound to communicate without stint to all men and to transmit through all ages the salvation effected by jesus christ and the blessings flowing therefrom wherefore by the will of its founder it is necessary that this church should be one in all lands and at all times to justify the existence of more than one church it would be necessary to go outside this world and to create a new and unheard of race of men that the one church should embrace all men everywhere and at all times was seen and foretold by isaiah when looking into the future he saw the appearance of a mountain conspicuous by its all-surpassing altitude which set forth the image of the house of the lord that is of the church and in the last days the mountain of the house of the lord shall be prepared on the top of the mountains but this mountain which towers over all other mountains is one and the house of the lord to which all nations shall come to seek the rule of living is also one and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say come and let us go up to the mountain of the lord and to the house of the god of jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths explaining this passage Abtatus amulevis says it is written in the prophet isaiah from sion the law shall go forth and the word of the lord from jerusalem for it is not on mount sion that isaiah sees the valley but on the holy mountain that is the church which has raised itself conspicuously throughout the entire roman world under the whole heavens the church is therefore the spiritual scion in which christ has been constituted king by god the father and which exists throughout the entire earth on which there is but one catholic church and augustine says what can be so manifest as a mountain or so well known there are it is true mountains which are unknown because they are situated in some remote part of the earth but this mountain is not unknown for it has filled the whole face of the world and about this it is said that it is prepared on the summit of the mountain furthermore the son of god decreed that the church should be his mystical body with which he should be united as the head after the manner of the human body which he assumed to which the natural head is physiologically united as he took to himself a mortal body which he gave to suffering and death in order to pay the price of man's redemption so also he has one mystical body in which and through which he renders men partakers of holiness and of eternal salvation god hath made him christ head over all the church which is his body scattered and separated members cannot possibly cohere with the head so as to make one body but st paul says 
all the members of the body whereas they are many yet are one body so also in christ wherefore this mystical body he declares is compacted and fitly joined together the head christ from whom the whole body being compacted and fitly joined together by what every joint supplieth according to the operation and the measure of every part and so dispersed members separated one from the other cannot be united with one in the same head there is one god and one christ and his church is one and the faith is one and one the people joined together in the solid unity of the body in the bond of concord this unity cannot be broken nor the one body divided by the separation of its constituent parts and to set forth more clearly the unity of the church he makes use of the illustration of a living body the members of which cannot possibly live unless united to the head and drawing from it their vital force separated from the head they must of necessity die the church he says cannot be divided into parts by the separation and cutting asunder of its members what is cut away from the mother cannot live or breathe apart what similarity is there between a dead and a living body for no man ever hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it as also christ doth the church because we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones another head like to christ must be invented that is another christ if besides the one church which is his body men wish to set up another see what you must beware of see what you must avoid see what you must dread it happens that as in the human body some members may be cut off a hand a finger a foot does the soul follow the amputated member as long as it was in the body it lived separated it forfeits its life so the christian is a catholic as long as he lives in the body cut off from it he becomes a heretic the life of the spirit follows not the amputated member the church of christ therefore is one and the same for ever those who leave it depart from the will and command of christ the lord leaving the path of salvation they enter on that of perdition whosoever is separated from the church is united to an adulteress he has cut himself off from the promise of the church and he who leaves the church of christ cannot arrive at the rewards of christ he who observes not this unity observes not the law of god holds not the faith of the father and the son cling not to life and salvation but he indeed who made this one church also gave it unity that is he made it such that all who are to belong to it must be united by the closest bonds so as to form one society one kingdom one body one body and one spirit as you are called in one hope of your calling jesus christ when his death was nigh at hand declared his will in this matter and solemnly offered it up thus addressing his father not for them only do i pray but for them also who through their word shall believe in me that they also may be one in us that they may be made perfect in one yea he commanded that this unity should be so closely knit and so perfect amongst his followers that it might in some measure shadow forth the union between himself and his father i pray that they all may be one as thou father in me and i in thee agreement and union of minds is a necessary foundation of this perfect concord amongst men from which concurrence of wills and similarity of action are the natural results wherefore in his divine faith he ordained in his church unity of faith a virtue which is the first of those bonds which unite man to god and whence he received the name of the faithful one lord one faith one baptism that is as there is one lord and one baptism so should all christians without exception have but one faith and so the apostle st paul not merely begs but entreats and implores christians to be all of the same mind and to avoid difference of opinions i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no schisms amongst you and that you be perfect in the same mind and in the same judgment such passages certainly need no interpreter they speak clearly enough for themselves besides all who profess christianity allow that there can be but one faith it is of the greatest importance and indeed of absolute necessity as to which many are deceived that the nature and character of this unity should be recognized and as we have already stated this is not to be ascertained by conjecture but by the certain knowledge of what was done that is by seeking for and ascertaining what kind of unity and faith has been commanded by jesus christ 
the heavenly doctrine of christ although for the most part committed to writing by divine inspiration could not unite the minds of men if left to the human intellect alone it would for this very reason be subject to various and contradictory interpretations this is so not only because of the nature of the doctrine itself and of the mysteries it involves but also because of the divergencies of the human mind and of the disturbing element of conflicting passions from a variety of interpretations a variety of beliefs is necessarily begotten hence come controversies dissensions and wranglings such as have arisen in the past even in the first ages of the church irenaeus writes of heretics as follows admitting the sacred scriptures they distort the interpretations and augustine heresies have arisen in certain perverse views ensnaring souls and precipitating them into the abyss only when the scriptures good in themselves are not properly understood besides holy writ it was absolutely necessary to ensure this union of men's minds to effect and preserve unity of ideas that there should be another principle this the wisdom of god requires for he could not have willed that the faith should be one if he did not provide means sufficient for the preservation of this unity and this holy writ clearly sets forth as we shall presently point out assuredly the infinite power of god is not bound by anything all things obey it as so many passive instruments in regard to this external principle therefore we must inquire which one of all the means in his power christ did actually adopt for this purpose it is necessary to recall in thought the institution of christianity we are mindful only of what is witnessed to by holy writ and what is otherwise well known christ proves his own divinity and the divine origins of his mission by miracles he teaches the multitudes heavenly doctrine by word of mouth and he absolutely commands that the assent of faith should be given to his teaching promising eternal rewards to those who believe and eternal punishment to those who do not if i do not the works of my father believe me not if i had not done among them the works that no other man hath done they would not have sinned but if i do the works though you will not believe me believe the works whatsoever he commands he commands by the same authority he requires the assent of the mind to all truths without exception it was thus the duty of all who heard jesus christ if they wished for eternal salvation not merely to accept his doctrine as a whole but to assent with their entire mind to all and every point of it since it is unlawful to withhold faith from god even in regard to one single point when about to ascend into heaven he sends his apostles in virtue of the same power by which he had been sent from the father and he charges them to spread abroad and propagate his teaching all power is given to me in heaven and on earth going therefore teach all nations teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you so that those obeying the apostles might be saved and those disobeying should perish he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be condemned but since it is obviously most in harmony with god's providence that no one should have confided to him a great and important mission unless he were furnished with the means of properly carrying it out for this reason christ promised that he would send the spirit of truth to his disciples to remain with them for ever but if i go i will send him the paraclete to you but when he the spirit of truth is come he will teach you all truth and i will ask the father and he shall give you another paraclete that he may abide with you for ever the spirit of truth he shall give testimony of me and you shall give testimony hence he commands that the teaching of the apostles should be religiously accepted and piously kept as if it were his own he who hears you hears me he who despises you despises me wherefore the apostles are ambassadors of christ as he is the ambassador of the father as the father sent me so also i send you hence as the apostles and disciples were bound to obey christ so also those whom the apostles taught were by god's command bound to obey them and therefore it was no more allowable to repudiate one iota of the apostles teaching than it was to reject any point of the doctrine of christ himself truly the voice of the apostles when the holy ghost had come down upon them resounded throughout the world 
wherever they went they proclaimed themselves the ambassadors of christ himself by whom jesus christ we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith in all nations for his name and god makes known their divine mission by numerous miracles but they going forth preached everywhere the lord working with all and confirming the word with signs that followed but what is this word that which comprehends all things that which they had learnt from their master because they openly and publicly declared that they could not help speaking of what they had seen and heard but as we have already said the apostolic mission was not destined to die with the apostles themselves or to come to an end in the course of time since it was intended for the people at large and instituted for the salvation of the human race for christ commanded his apostles to preach the gospel to every creature to carry his name to nations and kings and to be witnesses to him to the ends of the earth he further promised to assist them in the fulfillment of their high mission and that not for a few years or centuries only but for all time even to the consummation of the world upon which st jerome says he who promises to remain with his disciples to the end of the world declares that they will be forever victorious and that he will never depart from those who believe in him but how could all this be realized by the apostles alone placed as they were under the universal law of dissolution by death it was consequently provided by god that the magisterium instituted by jesus christ should not end with the life of the apostles but that it should be perpetuated we see it in truth propagated and as it were delivered from hand to hand for the apostles consecrated bishops and each one appointed those who were to succeed them immediately in the ministry of the word nay more they likewise required their successors to choose fitting men to endow them with like authority and to confide to them the office and mission of teaching thou therefore my son be strong in the grace which is in christ jesus and the things which thou hast heard of me by many witnesses the same command to faithful men who shall be fit to teach others also wherefore as christ was sent by god and the apostles by christ so the bishops and those who succeeded them were sent by the apostles the apostles were appointed by christ to preach the gospel to us jesus christ was sent by god christ is therefore from god and the apostles from christ and both according to the will of god preaching therefore the word through the countries and cities when they had proved in the spirit the first fruits of their teaching they appointed bishops and deacons for the faithful they appointed them and then ordained them so that when they themselves had passed away other tried men should carry on their ministry on the one hand therefore it is necessary that the mission of teaching whatever christ had taught should remain perpetual and immutable and on the other that the duty of accepting and professing all their doctrine should likewise be perpetual and immutable our lord jesus christ when in his gospel he testifies that those who are not with him are his enemies does not designate any special form of heresy but declares that all heretics who are not with him and do not gather with him scatter his flock and are his adversaries he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth the church founded on these principles and mindful of her office has done nothing with greater zeal and endeavor than she has displayed in guarding the integrity of the faith hence she regarded as rebels and expelled from the ranks of her children all who held beliefs on any point of doctrine different from her own the arians the montanists the novatians the quartodecimans the eudicians did not certainly reject all catholic doctrine they abandoned only a certain portion of it still who does not know that they were declared heretics and banished from the bosom of the church in like manner were condemned all authors of heretical tenets who followed them in subsequent ages there can be nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit nearly the whole cycle of doctrine and yet by one word as with a drop of poison infect the real and simple faith taught by our lord and handed down by apostolic tradition wherefore from the very earliest times the fathers and doctors of the church have been accustomed to follow and with one accord to defend this rule origen writes as often as the heretics allege the possession of the canonical scriptures to which all christians give unanimous assent they seem to say behold the word of truth is in the houses 
but we should believe them not and abandon not the primary and ecclesiastical tradition we should believe not otherwise than has been handed down by the tradition of the church of god irenaeus too says the doctrine of the apostles is the true faith which is known to us through the episcopal succession which has reached even unto our age by the very fact that the scriptures have been zealously guarded and fully interpreted and tertullian it is therefore clear that all doctrine which agrees with that of the apostolic churches the matrices and the original centers of the faith must be looked upon as the truth holding without hesitation that the church received it from the apostles the apostles from christ and christ from god we are in communion with the apostolic churches and by the very fact that they agree amongst themselves we have a testimony of the truth and so hilary christ teaching from the ship signifies that those who are outside the church can never grasp the divine teaching for the ship typifies the church where the word of life is deposited and preached those who are outside are like sterile and worthless sand they cannot comprehend rufinus praises gregory of nazianzum and basil because they studied the text of holy scriptures alone and took the interpretation of its meaning not from their own inner consciousness but from the writings and on the authority of the ancients who in their turn as it is clear took their role for understanding the meaning from the apostolic succession wherefore as appears from what has been said christ instituted in the church a living authoritative and permanent magisterium which by his own power he strengthened by the spirit of truth he taught and by miracles confirmed he willed and ordered, under the gravest penalties, that its teachings should be received as if they were his own. As often, therefore, as it is declared on the authority of this teaching, that this or that is contained in the deposit of divine revelation, it must be believed by every one as true. If it could in any way be false, an evident contradiction follows. For then God himself would be the author of error in man. Lord, if we be in error, we are being deceived by thee. In this wise, all cause for doubting being removed, can it be lawful for any one to reject any one of those truths without by the very fact falling into heresy, without separating himself from the church, without repudiating in one sweeping act the whole of Christian teaching? For such is the nature of faith that nothing can be more absurd than to accept some things and reject others. Faith, as the church teaches, is that supernatural virtue by which, through the help of God and through the assistance of His grace, we believe what He has revealed to be true, not on account of the intrinsic truth perceived by the natural light of reason, but because of the authority of God Himself, the Revealer, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. If, then, it be certain that anything is revealed by God, and this is not believed, then nothing whatever is believed by divine faith. For what the Apostle St. James judges to be the effect of a moral delinquency the same is to be said of an erroneous opinion in the matter of faith. Whosoever shall offend in one point is become guilty of all. Nay, it applies with greater force to an erroneous opinion. For it can be said with less truth that every law is violated by one who commits a single sin, since it may be that he only virtually despises the majesty of God the legislator. But he who dissents even in one point from divinely revealed truth absolutely rejects all faith since he thereby refuses to honor God as the supreme truth and the formal motive of faith. In many things they are with me, in a few things not with me, but in those few things in which they are not with me, the many things in which they are will not profit them. And this indeed most deservedly, for they who take from Christian doctrine what they please lean on their own judgments, not on faith, and not bringing into captivity every understanding unto the obedience of Christ they more truly obey themselves than God. You, who believe what you like of the Gospels, and believe not what you like, believe yourselves rather than the Gospel. For this reason, the fathers of the Vatican Council laid down nothing new, but followed divine revelation, and they acknowledged an invariable teaching of the Church as to the very nature of faith, when they decreed as follows, All those things are to be believed by divine and Catholic faith, which are contained in the written or unwritten word of God, and which are proposed by the Church as divinely revealed, either by a solemn definition or in the exercise of its ordinary and universal magisterium. Hence, as it is clear that God absolutely willed that there should be unity in His Church, and as it is evident what kind of unity He willed, and by means of what principle He ordained that this unity should be maintained, 
we may address the following words of St. Augustine to all who have not deliberately closed their minds to the truth. When we see the great help of God, such manifest progress and such abundant fruit, shall we hesitate to take refuge in the bosom of that church which, as is evident to all, possesses the supreme authority of the apostolic see through the episcopal succession? In vain do heretics rage round it. They are condemned partly by the judgment of the people themselves, partly by the weight of councils, partly by the splendid evidence of miracles. To refuse to the church the primacy is most impious and above measure arrogant, and if all learning, no matter how easy and common it may be, in order to be fully understood, requires a teacher and master, what can be greater evidence of pride and rashness than to be unwilling to learn about the books of the divine mysteries from the proper interpreter, and to wish to condemn them unknown? It is, then, undoubtedly the office of the Church to guard Christian doctrine, and to propagate it in its integrity and purity. But this is not all. The objects for which the Church has been instituted is not wholly attained by the performance of this duty. For, since Jesus Christ delivered himself up for the salvation of the human race, and to this end directed all his teaching and commands, so he ordered the Church to strive, by the truth of its doctrine, to sanctify and to save mankind. But faith alone cannot compass so great, excellent, and important an end. There must needs be also the fitting and devout worship of God, which is to be found chiefly in the divine sacrifice and in the dispensation of the sacraments, as well as solitary laws and discipline. All these must be found in the Church, since it continues the mission of the Savior forever. The Church alone offers to the human race that religion, that state of absolute perfection, which he wished, as it were, to be incorporated in it and it alone supplies those means of salvation which accord with the ordinary counsels of providence. But as this heavenly doctrine was never left to the arbitrary judgment of private individuals, what in the beginning, delivered by Jesus Christ, was afterwards committed by him exclusively to the magisterium already named, so the power of performing and administering the divine mysteries, together with the authority of ruling and governing, was not bestowed by God on all Christians indiscriminately, but on certain chosen persons. For to the apostles and their legitimate successors alone these words have reference. Going into the whole world, preach the gospel, baptizing them. Do this in commemoration of me. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And in like manner he ordered the apostles only, and those who should lawfully succeed them, to feed, that is, to govern with authority, all Christian souls. Whence it also follows that it is necessarily the duty of Christians to be subject and to obey. And these duties of the apostolic office are, in general, all included in the words of St. Paul. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Wherefore, Jesus Christ bade all men, present and future, follow him as their leader and savior, and this not merely as individuals, but as forming a society, organized and united in mind. In this way, a duly constituted society should exist, formed out of the divided multitude of peoples, one in faith, one in end, one in the participation of the means adapted to the attainment of the end, and one as subject to one in the same authority. To this end, he established in the church all those principles which necessarily tend to make organized human societies, and through which they attain the perfection proper to each. That is, in it, the Church, all who wish to be the sons of God by adoption, might attain to the perfection demanded by their high calling, and might obtain salvation. The Church, therefore, as we have said, is man's guide to whatever pertains to heaven. This is the office appointed unto it by God that it may watch over and may order all that concerns religion, and may, without let or hindrance, exercise, according to its judgment, its charge over Christianity. Wherefore, they who pretend that the Church has any wish to interfere in civil matters, or to infringe upon the rights of the State, know it not, or wickedly calumniate it. God, indeed, even made the Church a society far more perfect than any other, for the end for which the church exists is as much higher than the end of other societies, as divine grace is above nature, as immortal blessings are above the transitory things on the earth. Therefore the church is a society divine in its origin, supernatural in its end, and in the means proximately adapted to the attainment of that end. 
but it is a human community inasmuch as it is composed of men. For this reason we find it called in holy writ by names indicating a perfect society. It is spoken of as the house of God, the city placed upon the mountain to which all nations must come. But it is also the fold presided over by one shepherd, and into which all Christ's sheep must betake themselves. Yes, it is called the kingdom which God has raised up, and which will stand for ever. Finally, it is the body of Christ, that is, of course, his mystical body, but a body living and duly organized and composed of many members, members indeed which have not all the same functions, but which, united one to the other, are kept bound together by the guidance and authority of the head. Indeed, no true and perfect human society can be conceived which is not governed by some supreme authority. Christ, therefore, must have given to his church a supreme authority to which all Christians must render obedience. For this reason, as the unity of the faith is of necessity required for the unity of the church, inasmuch as it is the body of the faithful, so also for this same unity, inasmuch as the church is the divinely constituted society, Unity of government, which affects and involves unity of communion, is necessary jure divino. The unity of the church is manifested in the mutual connection or communication of its members, and likewise in the relation of all the members of the church to one head. From this it is easy to see that men can fall away from the unity of the church by schism, as well as by heresy. We think that this difference exists between heresy and schism, writes St. Jerome, Heresy has no perfect dogmatic teaching, whereas schism, through some episcopal dissent, also separates from the church. In which judgment St. John Chrysostom concurs. I say and protest, he writes, that it is as wrong to divide the church as to fall into heresy. Wherefore, as no heresy can ever be justifiable, so in like manner there can be no justification for schism. There is nothing more grievous than the sacrilegious schism. There can be no just necessity for destroying the unity of the church. The nature of this supreme authority, which all Christians are bound to obey, can be ascertained only by finding out what was the evident and positive will of Christ. Certainly Christ is a king forever, and though invisible, he continues unto the end of time to govern and guard his church from heaven. But since he willed that his kingdom should be visible, he was obliged, when he ascended into heaven, to designate a vicegerent on earth. Should any one say that Christ is the one head and the one shepherd, the one spouse of the one church, he does not give an adequate reply. It is clear, indeed, that Christ is the author of grace in the sacraments of the church. It is Christ himself who baptizes. It is he who forgives sins. It is he who is the true priest, who hath offered himself upon the altar of the cross. And it is by his power that his body is daily consecrated upon the altar, and still, because he was not to be visibly present to all faithful, he made choice of ministers, through whom the aforesaid sacraments should be dispensed, to the faithful, as said above. For the same reason, therefore, because he was about to withdraw his visible presence from the church, it was necessary that he should appoint someone in his place, to have the charge of the universal church. Hence, before his ascension, he said to Peter, Feed my sheep. Jesus Christ, therefore, appointed Peter to be the head of the church, and he also determined that the authority instituted in perpetuity for the salvation of all should be inherited by his successors, in whom the same permanent authority of Peter himself should continue. And so he made that remarkable promise to Peter, and to no one else. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. To Peter the Lord spoke, to one, therefore, that he might establish unity upon one. Without any prelude, he mentions St. Peter's name and that of his father. Blessed art thou, Simon, son of John. And he does not wish him to be called any more Simon, claiming him for himself, according to his divine authority. He aptly names him Peter, from the Petra, the rock, since upon him he was about to found his church. From this text it is clear that by the will and command of God the church rests upon St. Peter, just as the building rests on its foundation. Now the proper nature of a foundation is to be a principle of cohesion for the various parts of the building. It must be the necessary conditions of stability and strength. Remove it and the whole building falls. 
it is consequently the office of st peter to support the church and to guard it in all its strength and indestructible unity how could he fulfil this office without the power of commanding forbidding and judging which is properly called jurisdiction it is only by this power of jurisdiction that nations and commonwealths are held together a primacy of honor and the shadowy right of giving advice and admonition which is called direction could never secure to any society of men unity or strength the words and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it proclaim and establish the authority of which we speak what is the it writes origen is it the rock upon which christ builds the church or the church the expression indeed is ambiguous as if the rock and the church were one and the same i indeed think that this is so and that neither against the rock upon which christ builds his church nor against the church shall the gates of hell prevail the meaning of this divine utterance is that notwithstanding the wiles and intrigues which they bring to bear against the church it can never be that the church committed to the care of peter shall succumb or in any wise fail for the church as the edifice of christ who has wisely built his house upon a rock cannot be conquered by the gates of hell which may prevail over any man who shall be off the rock and outside the church but shall be powerless against it therefore god confided his church to peter so that he might safely guard it with his unconquerable power he invested him therefore with the needful authority since the right to rule is absolutely required by him who has to guard human society really and effectively this furthermore christ gave to thee will i give the keys of the kingdom of heaven and he is clearly still speaking of the church which a short time before he had called his own and which he declared he wished to build on peter as on a foundation the church is typified not only as an edifice but as a kingdom and every one knows that the keys constitute the usual sign of governing authority wherefore when christ promised to give to peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven he promised to give him power and authority over the church the son committed to peter the office of spreading the knowledge of his father and himself over the whole world he who increased the church in all the earth and proclaimed it to be stronger than the heavens gave to a mortal man all power in heaven when he handed him the keys in this same sense he says whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth it shall be bound also in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth it shall be loosed also in heaven this metaphorical expression of binding and loosing indicates the power of making laws of judging and of punishing and the power is said to be of such amplitude and force that god will ratify whatever is decreed by it thus it is supreme and absolutely independent so that having no other power on earth as its superior it embraces the whole church and all things committed to the church the promises carried out when christ the lord after his resurrection having thrice asked peter whether he loved him more than the rest lays on him the injunction feed my lambs feed my sheep that is he confides to him without exception all those who were to belong to his fold the lord does not hesitate he interrogates not to learn but to teach when he was about to ascend into heaven he left us as it were the vicegerent of his love and so because peter alone of all others professes his love he is preferred to all that being the most perfect he should govern the more perfect these then are the duties of a shepherd to place himself as leader at the head of his flock to provide proper food for it to ward off dangers to guard against insidious foes to defend it against violence in a word to rule and govern it since therefore peter has been placed the shepherd of the christian flock he has received the power of governing all men for whose salvation jesus christ shed his blood why has he shed his blood to buy the sheep which he handed over to peter and his successors and since all christians must be closely united in the communion of one immutable faith christ the lord in virtue of his prayers obtained for peter that in the fulfilment of his office he should never fall away from the faith but i have asked for thee that thy faith fail not and he furthermore commanded him to impart light and strength to his brethren as often as a need should arise confirm thy brethren he willed then that he whom he had designated as the foundation of the church should be the defense of its faith 
Could not Christ, who confided to him the kingdom by his own authority, have strengthened the faith of one whom he designated a rock to show the foundation of the church? For this reason, Jesus Christ willed that Peter should participate in certain names, signs of great things which properly belong to him alone, in order that identity of titles should show identity of power. So he who is himself the chief cornerstone in whom all the building being framed together, groweth up in a holy temple in the Lord. Place Peter as it were a stone to support the church. When he heard, Thou art a rock, he was ennobled by the announcement, although he is a rock, not as Christ is a rock, but as Peter is a rock. For Christ is by his very being an immovable rock, Peter only through this rock. Christ imparts his gifts and is not exhausted. He is a priest and makes priests. He is a rock and constitutes a rock. He who is the king of his church, who hath the key of David, who openeth and no man shutteth, who shutteth and no man openeth, having delivered the keys to Peter, declared him prince of the Christian commonwealth. So, too, he, the great shepherd, who calls himself the good shepherd, constituted Peter the pastor of his lambs and sheep. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Wherefore, Chrysostom says, He was preeminent among the apostles. He was the mouthpiece of the apostles and the head of the apostolic college. At the same time, showing him that henceforth he ought to have confidence, and as it were, blotting out his denial. He commits to him the government of his brethren. He saith to him, If thou lovest me, be over my brethren. Finally, he who confirms in every good work and word, commands Peter to confirm his brethren. Rightly, therefore, does St. Leo the Great say, From the whole world, Peter alone is chosen to take the lead in calling all nations, to be the head of all the apostles and of all the fathers of the church. So that, although in the people of God there are many priests and many pastors, Peter should by right rule all of those over whom Christ himself is the chief ruler. And so St. Gregory the Great, writing to the Emperor Maurice Augustus, says, it is evident to all who know the gospel that the charge of the whole church was committed to St. Peter, the apostle, and prince of all the apostles, by the word of the Lord. Behold, he hath received the keys of the heavenly kingdom. The power of binding and loosing is conferred upon him. The care of the whole government of the church is confided to him. It was necessary that a government of this kind, since it belongs to the constitution and formation of the church as its principal element, that is, as the principle of unity and the foundation of lasting stability, should in no wise come to an end with St. Peter, but should pass to his successors from one to another. There remains, therefore, the ordinance of truth, and St. Peter, persevering in the strength of the rock which he had received, hath not abandoned the government of the church, which had been confided to him. For this reason, the pontiffs who succeeded Peter in the Roman episcopate received the supreme power in the church, Jure de Vino. We define, declares the fathers of the Council of Florence, that the Holy and Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy of the Church throughout the whole world, and that the same Roman Pontiff is the successor of St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, and the true Vicar of Christ, the head of the whole Church, and the Father and Teacher of all Christians. And that full power was given to him, in blessed Peter, by our Lord Jesus Christ, to feed, to rule, and to govern the universal Church, as is also contained in the Acts of Ecumenical Councils and in the Sacred Canons. Similarly, the Fourth Council of Lateran declares, The Roman Church, as the mother and mistress of all the faithful, by the will of Christ, obtains primacy of jurisdiction over all other churches. These declarations were preceded by the consent of antiquity, which ever acknowledged, without the slightest doubt or hesitation, the bishops of Rome, and revered them as the legitimate successors of St. Peter. Who is unaware of the many and evident testimonies of the Holy Fathers which exist to this effect? Most remarkable is that of St. Irenaeus, who, referring to the Roman Church, says, With this Church, on account of its preeminent authority, it is necessary that every Church should be in concord. And St. Cyprian also says of the Roman Church that, It is the root and mother of the Catholic Church, the chair of Peter, and the principal Church, when sacerdotal unity has its source. He calls it the chair of Peter, because it is occupied by the successor of Peter. He calls it the principal church, on account of the primacy conferred on Peter himself and his legitimate successors, and the source of unity, 
because the Roman Church is the efficient cause of unity in the Christian commonwealth. For this reason, Jerome addresses Damasus thus, My words are spoken to the successor of the fisherman, to the disciple of the cross. I communicate with none, save your blessedness, that is, with the chair of Peter. For this I know is the rock on which the church is built. Union with the Roman See of Peter is to him always the public criterion of a Catholic. I acknowledge every one who is united with the See of Peter. And for a like reason, St. Augustine publicly attests that the primacy of the apostolic chair always existed in the Roman Church. And he denies that any one who dissents from the Roman faith can be a Catholic. You are not to be looked upon as holding the true Catholic faith if you do not teach that the faith of Rome is to be held. So too, St. Cyprian. To be in communion with Cornelius is to be in communion with the Catholic Church. In the same way, Maximus the abbot teaches that obedience to the Roman pontiff is the proof of the true faith and of legitimate communion. Therefore, if a man does not want to be or to be called a heretic, let him not strive to please this or that man, but let him hasten before all things to be in communion with the Roman see. If he be in communion with it, he should be acknowledged by all and everywhere as faithful and orthodox. He speaks in vain who tries to persuade me of the orthodoxy of those who, like himself, refuse obedience to his holiness, the Pope of the Most Holy Church of Rome, that is, to the Apostolic See. The reason and motive of this, he explains, to be that the Apostolic See has received in half government authority and power of binding and loosing from the Incarnate Word himself, and, according to all holy synods, sacred canons and decrees, in all things and through all things, in respect of all the holy churches of God throughout the whole world, since the Word in heaven who rules the heavenly powers, binds and loosens there. Wherefore, what was acknowledged and observed as Christian faith, not by one nation only, nor in one age, but by the East and by the West, and through all ages, this Philip, the priest, the pontifical legate at the council of Ephesus, no voice being raised in dissent, recalls, No one can doubt, yes, it is known unto all ages, that St. Peter, the prince of the apostles, the pillar of the faith, and the ground of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, the power of forgiving and retaining sins was given to him who, up to the present time, lives and exercises judgment in the persons of his successors. The pronouncements of the Council of Chalcedon on the same matter is present to the minds of all. Peter has spoken through Leo, to which the voice of the Third Council of Constantinople responds as an echo. The chief prince of the apostles was fighting on our side, for we have had as our ally his follower and the successor to his see. And the paper and the ink were seen, and Peter spoke through Agatho. In the formula of Catholic faith drawn up and proposed by Hormerstaz, which was subscribed at the beginning of the sixth century in the great Eighth Council by the Emperor Justinian, by Epiphanius, John, and Mena, the patriarchs, this same is declared with great weight and solemnity. For the pronouncement of our Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, etc., cannot be passed over. What is said is proved by the result, because Catholic faith has always been preserved without stain in the apostolic see. We have no wish to quote every available declaration, but it is well to recall the formula of faith which Michael Paleologus professed in the Second Council of Lyons. The same Holy Roman Church possesses the sovereign and plenary primacy and authority over the whole Catholic Church, which, truly and humbly, it acknowledges to have received, together with the plenitude of power from the Lord himself, in the person of St. Peter, the prince or head of the apostles, of whom the Roman pontiff is the successor. And as it is bound to defend the truth of faith beyond all others, so also, if any question should arise concerning the faith, it must be determined by its judgment. But if the authority of Peter and his successors is plenary and supreme, it is not to be regarded as the sole authority, for he who made Peter the foundation of the church also chose twelve whom he called apostles. And just as it is necessary that the authority of Peter should be perpetuated in the Roman pontiff, so, by the fact that the bishops succeed the apostles, they inherit their ordinary power, and thus the episcopal order necessarily belongs to the essential constitution of the church. Although they do not receive plenary or universal or supreme authority, they are not to be looked upon as vicars of the Roman pontiffs, because they exercise a power really their own, and are most truly called the ordinary pastors of the peoples over whom they rule. 
but since the successor of peter is one and those of the apostles are many it is necessary to examine into the relations which exist between him and them according to the divine constitution of the church above all things the need of union between the bishops and the successors of peter is clear and undeniable this bond once broken christians would be separated and scattered and would in no wise form one body and one flock the safety of the church depends on the dignity of the chief priest to whom if an extraordinary and supreme power is not given there are as many schisms to be expected in the church as there are priests it is necessary therefore to bear this in mind viz that nothing was conferred on the apostles apart from peter but that several things were conferred upon peter apart from the apostles st john chrysostom in explaining the words of christ asks why passing over the others does he speak to peter about these things and he replies unhesitatingly and at once because he was preeminent among the apostles the mouthpiece of the disciples and the head of the college he alone was designated as the foundation of the church to him he gave the power of binding and loosing to him alone was given the power of feeding on the other hand whatever authority and office the apostles received they received it in conjunction with peter if the divine benignity willed anything to be in common between him and the other princes whatever he did not deny to the others he gave only through him so that whereas peter alone received many things he conferred nothing on any of the rest without peter participating in it from this it must be clearly understood that bishops are deprived of the right and power of ruling if they deliberately secede from peter and his successors because by this secession they are separated from the foundation on which the whole edifice must rest they are therefore outside the edifice itself and for this very reason they are separated from the fold whose leader is the chief pastor they are exiled from the kingdom the keys of which were given by christ to peter alone these things enable us to see the heavenly ideal and the divine exemplar of the constitution of the christian commonwealth namely when the divine founder decreed that the church should be one in faith in government and in communion he chose peter and his successors as the principal and centre as it were of this unity wherefore st cyprian says the following is a short and easy proof of the faith the lord saith to peter i say to thee thou art peter on him alone he buildeth his church and although after his resurrection he gives a similar power to all the apostles and says as the father has sent me etc still in order to make the need of unity clear by his own authority he laid down the source of that unity as beginning from one and optatus of molivus says you cannot deny that you know that in the city of rome the episcopal chair was first conferred on peter in this peter the head of all the apostles hence his name cephas has sat in which chair alone unity was to be preserved for all lest any of the other apostles should claim anything as exclusively his own so much so that he who would place another chair against that one chair will be a schismatic and a sinner hence the teaching of cyprian that heresy and schism arise and are begotten from the fact that due obedience is refused to the supreme authority heresies and schisms have no other origin than that obedience is refused to the priest of god and that men lose sight of the fact that there is one judge in the place of christ in this world no one therefore unless in communion with peter can share in his authority since it is observed to imagine that he who is outside can command in the church wherefore optatus of molivus blames the donatus for this reason against which gate of hell we read that peter received the saving keys that is to say our prince to whom it was said by christ to thee will i give the keys of the kingdom of heaven and the gates of hell shall not conquer them whence is it therefore that you strive to obtain for yourselves the keys of the kingdom of heaven you who fight against the chair of peter but the episcopal order is rightly judged to be in communion with peter as christ commanded if it be subject to and obeys peter otherwise it necessarily becomes a lawless and disorderly crowd it is not sufficient for the due preservation of the unity of the faith that the head should have merely been charged with the office of superintendent or should have been invested solely with the power of direction but it is absolutely necessary that he should have received real and sovereign authority which the whole community is bound to obey 
What had the Son of God in view when he promised the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter alone? Biblical usage and the unanimous teaching of the fathers clearly show that supreme authority is designated in the passage by the word keys. Nor is it lawful to interpret in a different sense what was given to Peter alone and what was given to the other apostles conjointly with him. If the power of binding, loosening, and feeding confers upon each and every one of the bishops, the successors of the apostles, a real authority to rule the people committed to him, certainly the same power must have the same effect in his case to whom the duty of feeding the lambs and sheep has been assigned by God. Christ constituted Peter not only pastor, but pastor of pastors. Peter therefore feeds the lambs and feeds the sheep, feeds the children and feeds the mothers, governs the subjects and rules the prelates, because the lambs and sheep form the whole of the church. Hence those remarkable expressions of the ancients concerning St. Peter, which most clearly set forth the fact that he was placed in the highest degree of dignity and authority. They frequently call him the Prince of the College of the Disciples, the Prince of the Holy Apostles, the Leader of that Choir, the Mouthpiece of all the Apostles, the Head of that Family, the Ruler of the whole world, the First of the Apostles, the Safeguard of the Church. In this sense, St. Bernard writes as follows to Pope Eugenius, who art thou, the great priest, the high priest? Thou art the prince of bishops and the heir of the apostles. Thou art he to whom the keys were given. There are, it is true, other gatekeepers of heaven and other pastors of flocks, but thou art so much the more glorious as thou hast inherited a different and more glorious name than all the rest. They have flocks consigned to them, one to each. To thee all the flocks are confided as one flock to one shepherd, and not alone the sheep, but the shepherds. You ask how I prove this? From the words of the Lord. To which, I do not say, of the bishops, but even of the apostles, have all the sheep been so absolutely and unreservedly committed? If thou lovest me, Peter, feed my sheep. Which sheep? Of this or that people, of this city or country or kingdom? My sheep, he says. To whom, therefore, is it not evident? that he does not designate some, but all. We can make no exception where no distinction is made. But it is opposed to the truth and an evident contradiction with the divine constitution of the Church to hold that while each bishop is individually bound to obey the authority of the Roman Pontus, taken collectively, the bishops are not so bound. For it is the nature and object of a foundation to support the unity of the whole edifice and to give stability to it, rather than to each component part. And in the present case, this is much more applicable, since Christ the Lord wished that by the strength and solidity of the foundation the gates of hell should be prevented from prevailing against the church. All are agreed that the divine promise must be understood of the church as a whole, and not of any certain portions of it. These can indeed be overcome by the assaults of the powers of hell, as in point of fact has befallen some of them. Moreover, he who is set over the whole flock must have authority, not only over the sheep dispersed throughout the church, but also when they are assembled together. Do the sheep, when they are all assembled together, rule and guide the shepherd? Do the successors of the apostles, assembled together, constitute the foundation on which the successor of St. Peter rests in order to derive therefrom strength and stability? Surely jurisdiction and authority belong to him in whose power have been placed the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not alone in all provinces, taken singly, but in all taken collectively. And as the bishops, each in his own district, command with real power not only individuals but the whole community, so the Roman pontiffs, whose jurisdiction extends to the whole Christian commonwealth, must have all its parts even taken collectively, subject and obedient to their authority. Christ the Lord, as we have quite sufficiently shown, made Peter and his successors his vicars, to exercise forever in the church the power which he exercised during his mortal life. Can the apostolic college be said to have been above its master in authority? This power over the Episcopal college, to which we refer, and which is clearly set forth in holy writ, has ever been acknowledged and attested by the church, as is clear from the teaching of general councils. We read that the Roman pontiff has pronounced judgments on the prelates of all the churches. We do not read that anybody has pronounced sentence on him. The reason for which is stated thus, 
there is no authority greater than that of the apostolic see footnote nicholas an epistle eighty six ad michael and perot it is evident that the judgment of the apostolic see than which there is no authority greater may be rejected by no one nor is it lawful for any one to pass judgment on its judgment End of footnote wherefore glacius on the decrees of the councils says that which the first see has not approved of cannot stand but what it has thought well to decree has been received by the whole church it has ever been unquestionably the office of the roman pontiffs to ratify or to reject the decrees of the councils leo the great rescinded the acts of the conciliabulum of ephesus damasus rejected those of Ermini, and hadrian i those of constantinople the twenty-eighth canon of the Council of Chalcedon, by the very fact that it lacks the assent and approval of the Apostolic See, is admitted by all to be worthless. Rightly, therefore, has Leo X laid down in the Fifth Council of Lateran, that the Roman Pontiff alone, as having authority over all councils, has full jurisdiction and power to summon, to transfer, to dissolve councils, as is clear not only from the testimony of Holy Writ, from the teaching of the fathers and of the roman pontiffs and from the decrees of the sacred canons but from the teaching of the very councils themselves indeed holy writ attests that the keys of the kingdom of heaven were given to peter alone and that the power of binding and loosening was granted to the apostles and to peter but there is nothing to show that the apostles received supreme power without peter and against peter such power they certainly did not receive from jesus christ Wherefore, in the decree of the Vatican Council as to the nature and authority of the primacy of the Roman Pontiff, no newly conceived opinion is set forth, but the venerable and constant belief of every age. Nor does it beget any confusion in an administration that Christians are bound to obey a twofold authority. We are prohibited in the first place by divine wisdom from entertaining any such thought, since this form of government was constituted by the Council of God Himself. In the second place, we must know that the due order of things and their mutual relations are disturbed if there be a twofold magistracy of the same rank set over a people, neither of which is amendable to the other. But the authority of the Roman Pontiff is supreme, universal, independent, that of the bishops limited and dependent. It is not congruous that two superiors with equal authority should be placed over the same flock, but that two, one of whom is higher than the other, should be placed over the same people is not incongruous. Thus the parish priest, the bishop, and the pope are placed immediately over the same people. So the Roman pontiffs, mindful of their duty, wish above all things that the divine constitution of the church should be preserved. Therefore, as they defend with all necessary care and vigilance their own authority, so they have always labored, and will continue to labor, that the authority of the bishops may be upheld. Yes, they look upon whatever honor or obedience is given to the bishops as paid to themselves. My honor is the honor of the universal church. My honor is the strength and stability of my brethren. Then am I honored when due honor is given to every one. In what has been said, we have faithfully described the exemplar and form of the church as divinely constituted. We have treated at length of its unity. We have explained sufficiently its nature and pointed out the way in which the divine founder of the church willed that it should be preserved there is no reason to doubt that all those who by divine grace and mercy have had the happiness to have been born as it were in the bosom of the catholic church and to have lived in it will listen to our apostolic voice my sheep hear my voice and that they will derive from our words fuller instruction and a more perfect disposition to keep united with their respective pastors and through them with the supreme pastor so that they may remain more securely within the one fold and may derive therefrom a greater abundance of solitary fruit but we who notwithstanding our unfitness for this great dignity and office governed by virtue of the authority conferred on us by jesus christ as we look on jesus the author and finisher of our faith feel our heart fired by his charity what christ has said of himself we may truly repeat of ourselves other sheep i have that are not of this fold them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Let all those, therefore, who detest the widespread irreligion of our times, and acknowledge and confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and the Saviour of the human race, but who have wandered away from the Spouse, 
listen to our voice let them not refuse to obey our paternal charity those who acknowledge christ must acknowledge him wholly and entirely the head and the body are christ wholly and entirely the head is the only begotten son of god the body is his church the bridegroom and the bride two in one flesh all who dissent from the scriptures concerning christ although they may be found in all places in which the church is found are not in the church and again all those who agree with the scriptures concerning the head and do not communicate in the unity of the church are not in the church and with the same yearning our soul goes out to those whom the foul breath of your religion has not entirely corrupted and who at least seek to have the true god the creator of heaven and earth as their father let such as these take counsel with themselves and realize that they can in no wise be counted among the children of god unless they take christ jesus as their brother and at the same time the church as their mother we lovingly address to all the words of st augustine let us love the lord our god let us love his church the lord as our father the church as our mother let no one say i go indeed to idols i consult fortune tellers and soothsayers but i leave not the church of god i am a catholic clinging to thy mother thou offendest thy father another too says far be it from me i do not consult fortune telling i seek not soothsaying i seek not profane divinations i go not to the worship of devils i serve not stones but i am on the side of donatus what doth it profit thee not to offend the father who avenges an offence against the mother what does it profit to confess the lord to honour god to preach him to acknowledge his son and to confess that he sits on the right hand of the father if you blaspheme his church if you had a beneficent friend whom you honour daily and even once calumniated his spouse would you ever enter his house hold fast therefore o dearly beloved hold fast altogether god as your father and the church as your mother above all things trusting in the mercy of god who is able to move the hearts of men and to incline them as and when he pleases we must earnestly commend to his loving kindness all those of whom we have spoken as a pledge of divine grace and as a token of our affection we lovingly impart to you in the Lord, venerable brethren, to your clergy and people, our apostolic blessing. End of section 18。section 19 of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anglican orders. Apostolic Letter, Apostolic Curie, September 13, 1896 We have dedicated to the welfare of the noble English nation no small portion of the apostolic care and charity by which, helped by His grace, we endeavor to fulfill the office and follow in the footsteps of the Great Shepherd of the Sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ. The letter which last year we sent to the English seeking the kingdom of Christ and the unity of the faith is a special witness of our good will towards England. In it we recall the memory of the ancient union of her people with Mother Church, and we strove to hasten the day of a happy reconciliation by stirring up men's hearts to offer diligent prayer to God. And, again, more recently, when it seemed good to us to treat more fully the unity of the Church in a general letter, England had not the last place in our mind, in the hope that our teaching might both strengthen Catholics and bring the saving light to those divided from us. It is pleasing to acknowledge the generous way in which our zeal and plainness of speech, and inspired by no mere human motives, have met the approval of the English people and this testifies not less to their courtesy than to the solicitude of many for their eternal salvation. With the same mind and intention, we have now determined to turn our consideration to a matter of no less importance, which is closely connected with the same subject and with our desires. For an opinion already prevalent, confirmed more than once by the action and constant practice of the Church, maintain that when in England, shortly after it was rent from the center of Christian unity, a new rite for conferring holy orders was publicly introduced under Edward the Sixth. The true sacrament of orders, as instituted by Christ, lapsed, and with it the hierarchical succession. For some time, however, and in these last years especially, a controversy has sprung up as to whether the sacred orders, conferred according to the Edwardine Ordinal, 
possess the nature and effect of a sacrament. Those in favor of the absolute validity, or of a doubtful validity, being not only certain Anglican writers, but some few Catholics, chiefly non-English. The consideration of the excellency of the Christian priesthood moved Anglican writers in this matter, desirous as they were, that their own people should not lack the twofold power over the body of Christ. Catholic writers were impelled by a wish to smooth the way for the return of Anglicans to holy unity. Both, indeed, thought that in view of studies brought up to the level of recent research, and of new documents rescued from oblivion, it was not inopportune to re-examine the question by our authority. And we, not disregarding such desires and opinions, and, above all, obeying the dictates of apostolic charity, have considered that nothing should be left untried that might in any way tend to preserve souls from injury or procure their advantage. It has, therefore, pleased us to graciously permit the cause to be re-examined, so that through the extreme care taken in the new examination, all doubt, or even shadow of doubt, should be removed for the future. To this end we commissioned a certain number of men noted for their learning and ability, whose opinions in this matter were known to be divergent, to state the grounds of their judgments in writing. We then, having summoned them to our person, directed them to interchange writings, and further to investigate and discuss all that was necessary for a full knowledge of the matter. We were careful also that they should be able to re-examine all documents bearing on this question, which were known to exist in the Vatican archives, to search for new ones, and even to have at their disposal all acts relating to this subject, which are preserved by the Holy Office, or as it is called, the Supreme Council, and to consider whatever had up to this time been adduced by learned men on both sides. We ordered them, when prepared in this way, to meet together in special sessions. These to the number of twelve were held under the presidency of one of the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, appointed by ourselves, and all were invited to free discussion. Finally, we directed that the acts of these meetings, together with all other documents, should be submitted to our venerable brethren, the cardinals of the same council, so that when all had studied the whole subject and discussed it in our presence, each might give his opinion. This order for discussing the matter having been determined upon, it was necessary, with a view to forming a true estimate of the real state of the question, to enter upon it, after careful inquiry, as to how the matter stood in relation to the prescription and settled custom of the apostolic see the origin and force of which custom it was undoubtedly of great importance to determine for this reason in the first place the principal documents in which our predecessors at the request of queen mary exercised their special care for the reconciliation of the english church were considered thus julius the third sent cardinal reginald pole an englishman and illustrious in many ways to be his legate Alatere, for the purpose, as his angel of peace and love, and gave him extraordinary and unusual mandates or faculties and directions for his guidance. These Paul the Fourth confirmed and explained. And here, to interpret rightly the force of these documents, it is necessary to lay it down as a fundamental principle that they were certainly not intended to deal with an abstract state of things, but with a specific and concrete issue. For since the faculties given by those pontiffs to the apostolic legate had reference to England only, and to the state of religion therein, and since the rules of action were laid down by them at the request of the said legate, they could not have been mere directions for determining the necessary conditions for the validity of ordinations in general. They must pertain directly to providing for holy orders in the said kingdom, as the recognized condition of the circumstances and times demanded. This, besides being clear from the nature and form of the said documents, is also obvious from the fact that it would have been altogether irrelevant to thus instruct the legate, one whose learning had been conspicuous in the Council of Trent, as to the conditions necessary for the bestowal of the Sacrament of Orders. To all rightly estimating these matters, it will not be difficult to understand why, in the letters of Julius the Third issued to the Apostolic Legate on March 8, 1554, there is a distinct mention, first, of those who, rightfully and lawfully promoted, might be maintained in their orders, and then of others who, not promoted to sacred orders, might be promoted if they were found to be worthy and fitting subjects. For it is clearly and definitely noted, as indeed was the case, that there were two classes of men. The first, those who had really received sacred orders, either before the secession of Henry the Eighth, or, if after it, and by ministers infected by air and schism, 
still according to the accustomed Catholic rite. The second, those who were initiated according to the Edwardine ordinal, who on that account could be promoted, since they had received an ordination which was null. And that the mind of the Pope was this and nothing else is clearly confirmed by the letter of the said legate, January ninth, 1555, subdelegating his faculties to the Bishop of Norwich. Moreover, what the letters of Julius III themselves say about freely using the pontifical faculties, even in behalf of those who had received their consecration, minus right and not according to the accustomed form of the Church, is to be especially noted. By this expression, those only could be meant who had been consecrated according to the Edwardine rite, since, besides it and the Catholic form, there was no other in England. This becomes even still clearer when we consider the legation which, on the advice of Cardinal Pole, the sovereign princes, Philip and Mary, sent to the Pope in Rome in the month of February 1555. The royal ambassadors, three men, most illustrious and endowed with every virtue, of whom one was Thomas Thurlby, Bishop of Ely, were charged to inform the Pope more fully as to the religious condition of the country, and especially to beg that he would ratify and confirm what the legate had been at pains to effect, and had succeeded in effecting, towards the reconciliation of the kingdom with the Church. For this purpose all the necessary written evidence and the pertinent parts of the new ordinal were submitted to the Pope. The legation having been splendidly received, and their evidence having been diligently discussed by several of the cardinals, after mature deliberation, Paul V issued his bull, Placar Carissimi, on June twentieth of the same year. In this, whilst giving full force and approbation to what Pole had done, it is ordered in the matter of the ordinations as follows. Those who have been promoted to ecclesiastical orders, by any one but by a bishop validly and lawfully ordained, are bound to receive these orders again. But who those bishops not validly and lawfully ordained were, have been made sufficiently clear by the foregoing documents, and the faculties used in the said manner by the legate. Those, namely, who have been promoted to the episcopate, as others to other orders, not according to the custom form of the church, or, as the legate himself wrote to the bishop of Norwick, the form and intention of the church not having been observed. These were certainly those promoted according to the new form of right, to the examination of which the cardinals, specially deputed, had given their careful attention. Neither should the passage much to the point in the same pontifical letter be overlooked, where, together with others needing dispensation, are enumerated those who had obtained as well orders as benefices nulliter de facto. For to obtain orders nulliter means the same as by an act null and void, that is, invalid, as the very meaning of the word and as common parlance require. This is especially clear when the word is used in the same way about orders as about ecclesiastical benefices. These, by the undoubted teaching of the sacred canons, were clearly null, if given with any vitiating defect. Moreover, when some doubted as to who, according to the mind of the pontiff, could be called and considered bishops, foully and lawfully ordained, the said Pope shortly after, on October 30th, issued further letters in the form of a brief, and said, we, wishing to remove the doubt, and to opportunely provide for the peace of conscience of those who during the schism were promoted to orders, by expressing more clearly the mind and intention which we had in the aforesaid letters, declare that only those bishops and archbishops who were not ordained and consecrated in the form of the Church cannot be said to have been validly and lawfully ordained. Unless this declaration had applied to the actual case in England, that is to say, to the Edwardine ordinal, the Pope would certainly have done nothing by these last letters for the removal of doubt and the restoration of peace and conscience. Further, it was in this sense that the legate understood the documents and commands of the Apostolic See and duly and conscientiously obeyed them, and the same was done by Queen Mary and the rest who helped to restore Catholicism to its former state. The authority of Julius III and the Paul IV, which we have quoted, clearly shows the origin of that practice which has been observed without interruption for more than three centuries, that ordinations conferred, according to the award on right, should be considered null and void. This practice is fully proved by the numerous cases of absolute reordination, according to the Catholic right, even in Rome. In the observance of this practice, we have a proof directly affecting the matter in hand. 
for if by any chance doubt should remain as to the true sense in which these pontifical documents are to be understood the principle holds good that custom is the best interpreter of law since in the church it has ever been a constant and established rule that it is sacrilegious to repeat the sacrament of order it never could have come to pass that the apostolic see should have silently acquiesced and tolerated such a custom but not only did the apostolic see tolerate this practice but approved and sanctioned it as often as any particular case arose which called for its judgment in the matter we adduce two facts of this kind out of many which have from time to time been submitted to the supreme council of the holy office the first was in sixteen eighty four of a certain french calvinist and the other in seventeen o four of john clement gordon both of whom had received their orders according to the edwardine ritual in the first case after a searching investigation the consultors not a few in number gave in writing their answers or as they call it their vota and the rest unanimously agreed with their conclusion for the invalidity of the ordination and only on account of reasons of opportuneness did the cardinals deem it well to answer by a dilata viz not to formulate the conclusion at the moment the same documents were called into use and considered again in the examination of the second case and additional written statements of opinion were also obtained from consultors and the most eminent doctors of the sorbonne and of douay were likewise asked for their opinion no safeguard which wisdom and prudence could suggest to ensure the thorough sifting of the question was neglected and here it is important to observe that although gordon himself whose case it was and some of the consultors had adduced amongst the reasons which went to prove the invalidity the ordination of parker according to their own ideas about it and the delivery of the decision this reason was altogether set aside as documents of incontestable authenticity prove nor in pronouncing the decision was weight given to any other reason than the defect of form and intention and in order that the judgment concerning this form might be more certain and complete precaution was taken that a copy of the anglican ordinal should be submitted to examination and that with it should be collated the ordination forms gathered together from the various eastern and western rites then clement the eleventh himself with the unanimous vote of the cardinals concerned on the ferry of five footnote the term theory of five here used as a technical value ordinary meetings of the supreme council for the ratification of decrees usually take place on the wednesdays and are marked feria four but the special and solemn sessions which in matters of grave import are held in the presence and under the presidency of the pope himself who thus in a special way makes the decisions his own takes place on thursdays and are marked feria five translator's note in footnote april seventeenth seventeen o four decreed john clement gordon shall be ordained from the beginning and unconditionally to all the orders even sacred orders and chiefly of priesthood and in case he has not been confirmed he shall first receive the sacrament of confirmation it is important to bear in mind that this judgment was in no wise determined by the omission of the tradition of instruments or in such a case according to the established custom the direction would have been to repeat the ordination conditionally and still more important it is to note that the judgment of the pontiff applies universally to all anglican ordinations because although it refers to a particular case it is not based upon any reason special to that case but upon the defect of form which defect equally affects all these ordinations so much so that when similar cases subsequently came up for decision the same decree of clement the eleventh was quoted as the norma hence it must be clear to every one that the controversy lately revived had been already definitely settled by the apostolic see and that it is to the insufficient knowledge of these documents that we must perhaps attribute the fact that any catholic writer should have considered it still an open question but as we stated at the beginning there is nothing we so deeply and ardently desire as to be of help to men of good will by showing them the greatest consideration and charity wherefore we ordered that the anglican ordinal which is the essential point of the whole matter should be once more most carefully examined in the examination of any rite for the effecting and administering of a sacrament distinction is rightly made between the part which is ceremonial and that which is essential usually called the matter and form all know that the sacraments of the new law as sensible and efficient signs of invisible grace ought both to signify the grace which they effect and effect the grace which they signify although the signification ought to be found in the whole essential rite 
that is to say, in the matter and form, it still pertains chiefly to the form, since the matter is the part which is not determined by itself, but which is determined by the form. And this appears still more clearly in the sacrament of orders, the matter of which, in so far as we have to consider it in this case, is the imposition of hands, which indeed by itself signifies nothing definite, and is equally used for several orders and for confirmation. But the words which until recently were commonly held by Anglicans to constitute the proper form of priestly ordination, namely, receive the Holy Ghost, certainly do not in the least definitely express the sacred order of priesthood or its grace and power, which is chiefly the power of consecrating and of offering the true body and blood of the Lord, and that sacrifice which is no new commemoration of the sacrifice offered on the cross. This form had indeed afterwards added to it the words for the office and work of a priest, etc., but this rather shows that the Anglicans themselves perceived that the first form was defective and inadequate. But this rather shows that the Anglicans themselves perceived that the first form was defective and inadequate. But even if this addition could give to the form its due signification, it was introduced too late, as a century had already elapsed since the adoption of the Edwardine Ordinal. For, as the hierarchy had become extinct, there remained no power of ordaining. In vain has help been recently sought for the plea of the validity of orders from the other prayers of the same ordinal. For, to put aside other reasons, which show this to be insufficient, for the purpose in the Anglican rite, let this argument suffice for all. From them has been deliberately removed whatever sets forth the dignity and office of the priesthood in the Catholic rite. That form, consequently, cannot be considered apt or sufficient for the sacrament which omits what it ought essentially to signify. The same holds good of Episcopal consecration, for, to the formula, receive the Holy Ghost, not only were the words, for the office and work of a bishop, etc., added at a later period, but even these, as we shall presently state, must be understood in a sense different to that which they bear in the Catholic rite. Nor is anything gained by quoting the prayer of the preface, Almighty God, since it in like manner has been stripped of the words which denote the summum sacerdotium. It is not here relevant to examine whether the episcopate be a completion of the priesthood or an order distinct from it, or whether, when bestowed, as they say, per saltum, on one who is not a priest, it has or has not its effect. But the episcopate undoubtedly, by the institution of Christ, most truly belongs to the sacrament of orders, and constitutes the sacerdotium in the highest degree, namely, that which by the teaching of the Holy Fathers and our liturgical customs is called the summum sacerdotium, sacramentisteri summa. So it comes to pass that, as the sacrament of orders and the true sacerdotium of Christ were utterly eliminated from the Anglican rite, and hence the sacerdotium is in no wise conferred truly and validly in the Episcopal consecration of the same rite, for the like reason. Therefore, the Episcopate can in no wise be truly and validly conferred by it, and this the more so, because among the first duties of the Episcopate is that of ordaining ministers for the Holy Eucharist and sacrifice. For the full and accurate understanding of the Anglican ordinal, besides what we have noted as to some of its parts, there is nothing more pertinent than to consider carefully the circumstances under which it was composed and publicly authorized. It would be tedious to enter into details, nor is it necessary to do so, as the history of that time is sufficiently eloquent as to the animus of the authors of the ordinal against the Catholic Church as to the abettors whom they associated with themselves from the heterodox sects, and as to the end they had in view. Being fully cognizant of the necessary connection between faith and worship, between the law of believing and the law of praying, under a pretext of returning to the primitive form, they corrupted the liturgical order in many ways to suit the errors of the reformers. For this reason, in the whole ordinal, not only is there no clear mention of the sacrifice, of consecration of the sacerdotium, and of the power of consecrating and offering sacrifice, but as we have just stated, every trace of these things, which had been in such prayers of the Catholic rite, as they had not entirely rejected, was deliberately removed and struck out. In this way the native character, or spirit as it is called, of the ordinal clearly manifests itself. Hence, if vitiated in its origin, it was wholly insufficient to confer orders. It was impossible that in the course of time it could become sufficient, since no change had taken place. 
in vain those who from the time of charles i have attempted to hold some kind of sacrifice or of priesthood have made some additions to the ordinal in vain also has been the contention of that small section of the anglican body formed in recent times that the said ordinal can be understood and interpreted in a sound and orthodox sense such efforts we affirm have been and are made in vain and for this reason that any words in the anglican ordinal as it now is which lend themselves to ambiguity cannot be taken in the same sense as they possess in the catholic rite for once a new rite has been initiated in which as we have seen the sacrament of orders is adulterated or denied and from which all idea of consecration and sacrifice has been rejected the formula receive the holy ghost no longer holds good because the spirit is infused into the soul with the grace of the sacrament and the words for the office and work of a priest or bishop and the like no longer hold good but remain as words without the reality which christ instituted several of the more shrewd anglican interpreters of the ordinal have perceived the force of this argument and they openly urge it against those who take the ordinal in a new sense and vainly attach to the orders conferred thereby a value and efficacy which they do not possess by this same argument is refuted the contention of those who think that the prayer almighty god giver of all good things which is found at the beginning of the ritual action might suffice as a legitimate form of orders even in the hypothesis that it might be held to be sufficient in a catholic rite approved by the church with this inherent defect of form is joined the defect of intention which is equally essential to the sacrament the church does not judge about the mind and intention in so far as it is something by its nature internal but in so far as it is manifested externally she is bound to judge concerning it when any one has rightly and seriously made use of the due form and the matter requisite for effecting or conferring the sacrament he is considered by the very fact to do what the church does on this principle rests the doctrine that a sacrament is truly conferred by the ministry of one who is a heretic or unbaptized provided the catholic rite be employed on the other hand if the rite be changed with the manifest intention of introducing another rite not approved by the church and of rejecting what the church does and what by the institution of christ belongs to the nature of the sacrament then it is clear that not only is the necessary intention wanting to the sacrament but that the intention is adverse to and destructive of the sacrament all these matters have been long and carefully considered by ourselves and by our venerable brethren the judges of the supreme council of whom it has pleased us to call a special meeting on the feria five the sixteenth day of july last upon the solemnity of our lady of mount carmel they with one accord agreed that the question laid before them had already been educated upon with full knowledge of the apostolic see and that this renewed discussion and examination of the issues had only served to bring out more clearly the wisdom and accuracy with which that decision had been made nevertheless we deemed it well to postpone a decision in order to afford time both to consider whether it would be fitting or expedient that we should make a fresh authoritative declaration upon the matter and to humbly pray for a fuller measure of divine guidance then considering that this matter of practice although already decided had been by certain persons for whatever reason recalled into discussion and that thence it might follow that a pernicious air would be fostered in the minds of many who might suppose that they possess the sacrament and effects of orders where these are no wise to be found it has seemed good to us in the lord to pronounce our judgment wherefore strictly adhering in this matter to the decrees of the pontiffs our predecessors and conferring them most fully and as it were renewing them by our authority of our own motion and certain knowledge we pronounce and declare that ordinations carried out according to the anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly void it remains for us to say that even as we have entered upon the elucidation of this grave question in the name and in the love of the great shepherd in the same we appeal to those who desire and seek with a sincere heart the possession of a hierarchy and of orders perhaps until now aiming at the greater perfection of christian virtue and searching more devoutly the divine scriptures and redoubling the fervor of their prayers they have nevertheless hesitated in doubt and anxiety to follow the voice of christ which so long has interiorly admonished them now they see clearly whither he in his greatness invites them and wills them to come in returning to his one only fold they will obtain the blessings which they seek 
and the consequent helps to salvation of which she has made the church the dispenser and as it were the constant guardian and promoter of his redemption amongst the nations then indeed they shall draw waters in joy from the fountains of the saviour his wondrous sacraments whereby his faithful souls have their sins truly remitted and are restored to the friendship of god are nourished and strengthened by the heavenly bread and abound with the most powerful aids for their eternal salvation may the god of peace the god of all consolation in his infinite tenderness enrich and fill with all these blessings those who truly yearn for them we wish to direct our exhortations and our desires in a special way to those who are ministers of religion in their respective communities they are men who from their very office take precedence in learning and authority and who have at heart the glory of god and the salvation of souls let them be the first in joyfully submitting to the divine call and obey it and furnish a glorious example to others assuredly with an exceeding great joy their mother the church will welcome them and will cherish with all her love and care those whom the strength of their generous souls has amidst many trials and difficulties led back to her bosom nor could words express the recognition which this devoted courage will win for them from the assemblies of the brethren throughout the catholic world or what hope or confidence it will merit for them before christ is their judge or what reward it will obtain from him in the heavenly kingdom and we ourselves in every lawful way shall continue to promote their reconciliation with the church in which individuals and masses as we ardently desire may find so much for their imitation in the meantime by the tender mercy of the lord our god we ask and beseech all to strive faithfully to follow in the open path of divine grace and truth we decree that these letters and all things contained therein shall not be liable at any time to be impugned or objected to by reason of faith or any other defect whatever of subrussion or abrussion or of our intention but are and shall be always valid and in force and shall be inviolably observed both judiciously and otherwise by all of whatsoever degree and preeminence declaring null and void anything which in these matters may happen to be contrariwise attempted whether wittingly or unwittingly by any person whatsoever by whatsoever authority or pretext all things to the contrary notwithstanding we will that there shall be given to copies of these letters even printed provided that they be signed by a notary and sealed by a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity the same credence that would be given to the expression of our will by the showing of these presents end of section nineteen Section twenty of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prohibition and Censorship of Books. Apostolic Constitution Officiorum Ac Munerum. January twenty fifth, eighteen ninety seven. Of all the official duties which we are bound most carefully and most diligently to fulfill in the supreme position of the apostolate the chief and principal duty is to watch assiduously and earnestly to strive that the integrity of christian faith and morals may suffer no diminution and this more than at any other time is especially necessary in these days when men's minds and characters are so unrestrained that almost every doctrine which jesus christ the saviour of mankind has committed to the custody of his church for the welfare of the human race is daily called into question and doubt in this warfare many and varied are the stratagems and hurtful devices of the enemy but most perilous of all is the uncurbed freedom of writing and publishing noxious literature nothing can be conceived more pernicious more apt to defile souls through its contempt of religion and its manifold allurements to sin wherefore the church who is the custodian and vindicator of the integrity of faith and morals fearful of so great an evil has from an early date realized that remedies must be applied against this plague and for this reason she has ever striven as far as lay in her power to restrain men from the reading of bad books as from a deadly poison the early days of the church were witnesses to the earnest zeal of st paul in this respect and every subsequent age has witnessed the vigilance of the fathers the commands of the bishops and the decrees of councils in a similar direction 
the historical documents bear special witness to the care and diligence with which the roman pontiffs have vigilantly endeavoured to prevent the unchecked spread of heretical writings detrimental to the public history is full of examples anastasius i solemnly condemned the more dangerous writings of origin innocent the first those of pelagius leo the great all the works of the manichaeans the decretal letters opportunely issued by galatius concerning books to be received and rejected are well known and so in the course of centuries the holy see condemned the pestilent writings of the monothelites of abelard marsilius Petavinus, wycliffe and huss in the fifteenth century after the invention of the art of printing not only were bad publications which had already appeared condemned but precautions began to be taken against the publication of similar works in the future these prudent measures were called for by no slight cause but rather by the need of protecting the public morals and welfare of the time for too many had rapidly perverted into a mighty engine of destruction an art excellent in itself productive of immense advantages and naturally destined for the advancement of christian culture owing to the rapid process of publication the great evil of bad books had been multiplied and accelerated wherefore our predecessors alexander the sixth and leo the tenth most widely promulgated certain definite laws well suited to the character of the times in order to restrain printers and publishers within the limits of their duty the tempest soon became more violent and it was necessary to check the contagion of heresy with still more vigilance and severity hence leo x and afterwards clement the seventh severely prohibited the reading or retaining of the books of luther but as owing to the unhappy circumstances of that epoch the foul flood of pernicious books had increased beyond measure and spread in all directions there appeared to be need of a more complete and efficacious remedy this remedy our predecessor paul the fourth was the first to employ by opportunely publishing a list of books and other writings against which the faithful should be warned a little later the council of trent took steps to restrain the ever-growing license of writing and reading by a new measure at its command and desire certain chosen prelates and theologians not only applied themselves to increasing and perfecting the index which paul the fourth had published but also drew up certain rules to be observed in the publishing reading and use of books to which rules Pius the fourth added the sanction of his apostolic authority the interests of the public welfare which had given rise to the tridentine rules necessitated in the course of time certain alterations for which reason the roman pontiffs especially clement the eighth alexander the seventh and benedict the fourteenth mindful of the circumstances of the period and the dictates of prudence issued several decrees calculated to elucidate these rules and to accommodate them to the times the above facts clearly prove that the chief care of the roman pontiffs has always been to protect civil society from erroneous beliefs and corrupt morals the twin causes of the decline and ruin of states which commonly owes its origin and its progress to bad books their labors were not unfruitful so long as the divine law regulated the commands and prohibitions of civil governments and the rulers of states acted in unison with the ecclesiastical authority every one is aware of the subsequent course of events as circumstances and men's minds gradually altered the church with her wonted prudence observing the character of the period took these steps which appeared most expedient and best calculated to promote the salvation of men several prescription of the rules of the index which appear to have lost the original opportuneness she either abolished by decree or with equal gentleness and wisdom permitted them to grow obsolete in recent times pius the ninth in a letter to the archbishops and bishops of the states of the church considerably mitigated rule ten moreover on the eve of the vatican council he instructed the learned men of the preparatory commission to examine and revise all the rules of the index and to advise how they should be dealt with they unanimously decided that the rules required alteration and several of the fathers of the council openly professed their agreement with this opinion and desire a letter of the french bishops exists urging the necessity of immediate action in republishing the rules and the whole scheme of the index in an entirely new form better suited to our times and easier to observe a similar opinion was expressed at the same time by the bishops of germany who definitely petitioned that the rules of the index might be submitted to a fresh revision and rearrangement with these bishops many bishops of italy and other countries have agreed 
taking into account the circumstances of our times the conditions of society and popular customs all these requests are certainly justified and in accordance with the maternal affection of holy church in the rapid race of intellect there is no field of knowledge in which literature has not run riot hence the daily inundation of most pernicious books worst of all the civil laws not only connive at this serious evil but allow it the widest license thus on the one hand many minds are in a state of anxiety while on the other there is unlimited opportunity for every kind of reading believing that some remedy ought to be applied to these evils we have thought well to take two steps which will supply a certain and clear rule of action in this matter first to diligently revise the index of books forbidden to be read and we have ordered this revised edition to be published when complete secondly we have turned our attention to the rules themselves and have determined without altering their nature to make them somewhat milder so that it cannot be difficult or irksome for any person of good will to obey them in this we have not only followed the example of our predecessors but imitated the maternal affection of the church who desires nothing more earnestly than to show herself indulgent and in the present as in the past ever cares for her children in such a manner as gently and lovingly to have regard to their weakness wherefore after mature deliberation and having consulted the cardinals of the sacred congregation of the index we have decided to issue the following general decrees appended to this constitution and the aforesaid sacred congregation shall in the future follow these exclusively and all catholics throughout the world shall strictly obey them we will that they alone shall have the force of law abrogating the rules published by order of the sacred council of trent and the observations instructions decrees monita and all other statutes and commands whatsoever of our predecessors with the sole exception of the constitution solicita et provida of benedict the fourteenth which we will to retain in the future the full force which it has hitherto had General Decrees Concerning the Prohibition and Censorship of Books Article 1 Of the Prohibition of Books Chapter 1 Of the Prohibited Books of Apostates, Heretics, Schismatics, and Other Writers All books condemned before the year 1600 by the Sovereign Pontiffs, or by Ecumenical Councils, and which are not recorded in the New Index, must be considered as condemned in the same manner as formerly, with the exception of such as are permitted by the present General Decrees the books of apostates heretics schismatics and all writers whatsoever defending heresy or schism or in any way attacking the foundations of religion are altogether prohibited three moreover the books of non-catholics ex professo treating of religion are prohibited unless they clearly contain nothing contrary to catholic faith four the books of the above-mentioned writers not treating ex professo of religion but only touching incidentally upon the truths of faith, are not to be considered as prohibited by ecclesiastical law, unless prescribed by special decree. Chapter 2 Of Editions of the Original Text of Holy Scripture and of Versions Not in the Vernacular 5. Editions of the Original Text and of the Ancient Catholic Versions of Holy Scripture, as well as those of the Eastern Church, if published by non-Catholics, even though apparently edited in a faithful and complete manner, are allowed only to those engaged in theological and biblical studies, provided also that the dogmas of Catholic faith are not impugned in the prolegomena or annotations. 6. In the same manner, and under the same conditions, other versions of the Holy Bible, whether in Latin or in any other dead language, published by non-Catholics, are permitted. Chapter 3. Of Vernacular Versions of Holy Scripture. 7. As it has been clearly shown by experience that, if the Holy Bible in the vernacular is generally permitted without any distinction, more harm than utility is thereby caused, owing to human temerity. All versions of the vernacular, even by Catholics, are altogether prohibited, unless approved by the Holy See, are published under the vigilant care of the bishops, with annotations taken from the fathers of the Church, and learned Catholic writers. 8. All versions of the Holy Bible, in any vernacular language, made by non-Catholics, are prohibited, and especially those published by the Bible societies, which have been more than once condemned by the Roman pontiffs, because in them the wise laws of the Church concerning the publication of the sacred books are entirely disregarded. Nevertheless, these versions are permitted to students of theological or biblical science, under the conditions laid down above. Number 5. 
Chapter 4 of Obscene Books 9. Books which professedly treat of, narrate, or teach lewd or obscene subjects are entirely prohibited, since care must be taken not only of faith but also of morals, which are easily corrupted by the reading of such books. 10. The books of classical authors, whether ancient or modern, if disfigured with the same stain of indecency, are, on account of the elegance and beauty of their diction, permitted only to those who are justified on account of their duty or the function of teaching, but on no account may they be placed in the hands of, or taught to, boys or youths, unless carefully expurgated. Chapter 5. Of Certain Special Kinds of Books 11. Those books are condemned which are derogatory to Almighty God or to the Blessed Virgin Mary, or the saints, or to the Catholic Church and her worship, or to the sacraments, or to the Holy See. To the same condemnation are subject those works in which the idea of the inspiration of Holy Scripture is perverted, or its extension too narrowly limited. Those books, moreover, are prohibited which professedly revile the ecclesiastical hierarchy or the clerical or religious state. 12. It is forbidden to publish, read, or keep books in which sorcery, divination, magic, the evocation of spirits, and other superstitions of this kind are taught or commended. 13. The books or other writings which narrate new apparitions, revelations, visions, prophecies, miracles, or which introduce new devotions, even under the pretext of being private ones, if published without the legitimate permission of ecclesiastics superiors, are prohibited. 14. Those books, moreover, are prohibited, which defend as lawful dueling, suicide, or divorce, which treat of Freemasonry, or other societies of the kind, teaching them to be useful and not injurious to the church and to society, and those which defend errors prescribed by the apostolic see. Chapter 6. Of Sacred Pictures and Indulgences. 15. Pictures, in any style of printing, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and saints, or other servants of God, which are not conformable to the sense and decrees of the church, are entirely forbidden. New pictures, whether produced with or without prayers annexed, may not be published without permission of ecclesiastical authority. 16. It is forbidden to all to give publicly in any way to apocryphal indulgences, and such as have been prescribed or revoked by the apostolic see. Those which have already been published must be withdrawn from the hands of the faithful. 17. No books of indulgences or compendiums, pamphlets, leaflets, etc., containing grants of indulgences, may be published without permission of competent authority. Chapter 7. Of Liturgical Books and Prayer Books. 18. In authentic editions of the Missal, Breviary, Ritual, Ceremonial of Bishops, Roman Pontifical, and other liturgical books approved by the Holy Apostolic See, no one shall presume to make any changes whatsoever, otherwise such new editions are prohibited. 19. No litanies, except the ancient and common litanies, contained in the breviaries, missals, pontificals, and rituals, as well as the litany of Loretto and the litany of the Most Holy Name of Jesus, already approved by the Holy See, may be published without the examination and approbation of the ordinary. 20. No one, without license of legitimate authority, may publish books or pamphlets of prayers, devotions, or religious, moral, ascetic, or mystic doctrine and instruction, or others of like nature, even though apparently conducive to the fostering of piety among Christian people. Otherwise, they are to be considered as prohibited. Chapter 8 Of Newspapers and Periodicals 21 Newspapers and periodicals which designedly attack religion or morality are to be held as prohibited not only by the natural but also by the ecclesiastical law. Ordinaries shall take care, whenever it be necessary, that the faithful shall be warned against the danger and injury of reading of this kind. 22. No Catholics, particularly ecclesiastics, shall publish anything in newspapers or periodicals of this character, unless for some just and reasonable cause. Chapter 9. Of Permission to Read and Keep Prohibited Books 23. Those only shall be allowed to read and keep books prohibited, either by special decrees or by these general decrees, who shall have obtained the necessary permission, either from the Apostolic See or from its delegates. 24. The Roman Pontiffs have placed the power of granting licenses for the reading and keeping of prohibited books in the hands of the Sacred Congregation of the Index. 
Nevertheless, the same power is enjoyed both by the Supreme Congregation of the Holy Office and by the Sacred Congregation of Propaganda for the regions subject to its administration. For the city of Rome, this power belongs also to the master of the Sacred Apostolic Palace. 25. Bishops and other prelates, with quasi-episcopal jurisdiction, may grant such license for individual books, and in urgent cases only. But if they have obtained from the Apostolic See a general faculty to grant permission to the faithful to read and keep prohibited books, they must grant this only with discretion and for a just and reasonable cause. 26. Those who have obtained apostolic faculties to read and keep prohibited books may not on this account read and keep any books whatsoever or periodicals condemned by the local ordinaries unless in the apostolic indult express permission be given to read and keep books by whomsoever prohibited and those who have obtained permission to read prohibited books must remember that they are bound by grave precept to keep books of this kind in such a manner that they may not fall into the hands of others chapter ten of the denunciation of bad books twenty seven although all catholics especially the more learned ought to denounce pernicious books either to the bishops or to the holy see this duty belongs more especially to apostolic nuncios and delegates local ordinaries and rectors of universities twenty eight it is expedient in denouncing bad books that not only the title of the book be expressed but also as far as possible the reasons be explained why the book is considered worthy of censure those to whom the denunciation is made will remember that it is their duty to keep secret the names of the denouncers. 29. Ordinaries, even as delegates of the Apostolic See, must be careful to prohibit evil books or other writings published or circulated in their dioceses, and to withdraw them from the hands of the faithful. Such works and writings should be referred by them to the judgment of the Apostolic See as appear to require a more careful examination or concerning which a decision of the supreme authority may seem desirable in order to procure a more salutary effect article two of the censorship of books chapter one of the prelates entrusted with the censorship of books thirty from what has been laid down above number seven it is sufficiently clear what persons have authority to approve or permit editions and translations of the holy bible thirty one no one shall venture to republish books condemned by the apostolic see if for a grave and reasonable cause any particular exception appears desirable in this respect this can only be allowed by obtaining beforehand a license from the sacred congregation of the index and observing the conditions prescribed by it thirty two whatsoever pertains in any way to causes of beatification and canonization of the servants of god may not be published without the approval of the congregation of sacred rites thirty three the same must be said of collections of decrees of the various roman congregations such collections may not be published without first obtaining the license of the authorities of each congregation and observing the conditions by them prescribed thirty four vicars apostolic and missionaries apostolic shall faithfully observe the decrees of the sacred congregation of propaganda concerning the publication of books thirty five the approbation of books of which the censorship is not reserved by the present decrees either to the holy see or to the roman congregations belongs to the ordinary of the place where they are published thirty six regulars must remember that in addition to the license of the bishop they are bound by a decree of the sacred council of trent to obtain leave for publishing any work from their own superior both permissions must be printed either at the beginning or at the end of the book thirty seven if an author living in rome desires to print a book not in the city of rome but elsewhere no other approbation is required beyond that of the cardinal vicar and the master of the apostolic palace chapter two of the duty of censures and the preliminary examination of books thirty eight bishops whose duty it is to grant permission for the printing of books shall take care to employ in the examination of them men of acknowledged piety and learning concerning whose faith and honesty they may feel sure that they will show neither favour nor ill-will but putting aside all human affections will look only to the glory of god and the welfare of the people thirty nine censors must understand that in the matter of various opinions and systems they are bound to judge with a mind free from all prejudice according to the precept of benedict the fourteenth 
therefore they should put away all attachment to their particular country family school or institute and lay aside all partisan spirit they must keep before their eyes nothing but the dogmas of holy church and the common catholic doctrine as contained in the decrees of general councils the constitutions of the roman pontiffs and the unanimous teaching of the doctors of the church forty if after this examination no objection appears to the publication of the book the ordinary shall grant to the author in writing and without any fee whatsoever a license to publish which shall be printed either at the beginning or at the end of the work chapter three of the books to be submitted to censorship forty one all the faithful are bound to submit to preliminary ecclesiastical censorship at least those books which treat of holy scripture sacred theology ecclesiastical history canon law natural theology ethics and other religious or moral subjects of this character and in general all writings specially concerned with religion and morality forty two the secular clergy in order to give an example of respect towards their ordinaries ought not to publish books even when treating of merely natural arts and sciences without their knowledge they are also prohibited from undertaking the management of newspapers or periodicals without the previous permission of their ordinaries. Chapter 4. Of Printers and Publishers of Books 43. No book liable to ecclesiastical censorship may be printed unless it bear at the beginning the name and surname of both the author and the publisher, together with the place and year of printing and publishing. If, in any particular case, owing to a just reason, it appears desirable to suppress the name of the author. This may be permitted by the ordinary. 44. Printers and publishers should remember that new editions of an approved work require a new approbation, and that an approbation granted to the original text does not suffice for a translation into another language. 45. Books condemned by the apostolic see are to be considered as prohibited all over the world, and into whatever language they may be translated. 46. Booksellers, especially Catholics, should neither sell, lend, nor keep books professedly treating above seen subjects. They should not keep for sale other prohibited books, unless they have obtained leave through the ordinary from the sacred congregation of the index, nor sell such books to any person whom they do not prudently judge to have the right to buy them. Chapter 5. Of Penalties Against Transgressors of the General Decrees. 47. All and every one knowingly reading, without authority of the Holy See, the books of apostates and heretics defending heresy, or books of any author which are by name prohibited by apostolic letters, also those keeping, printing, and in any way defending such works, incur ipso facto excommunication reserved in a special manner to the Roman Pontiff. 48. Those who, without the approbation of the ordinary, print or cause to be printed books of holy scripture, or notes or commentaries on the same, incur ipso facto excommunication, but not reserved. 49. Those who transgress the other prescriptions of these general decrees shall, according to the gravity of their offense, be seriously warned by the bishop, and if it seem expedient, may also be punished by canonical penalties. We decree that these presents, and whatever they contain, shall at no time be questioned or impugned for any fault of subversion, or obression, or of our intention, or for any other defect whatsoever, but are, and shall be ever, valid and efficacious, and to be inviolably observed, both judicially and extrajudicially, by all of whatever rank and preeminence. And we declare to be invalid, and of no avail, whatsoever may be attempted, knowingly or unknowingly, contrary to these, by any one, under any authority or pretext whatsoever, all to the contrary notwithstanding. And we will that the same authority be attributed to copies of these letters, even if printed, provided they be signed by the hand of a notary, and confirmed by the seal of some one in ecclesiastical dignity, as to the indication of our will by the exhibition of these presents. No man, therefore, may infringe or temerariously venture to contravene this document of our constitution, ordination, limitation, derogation, and will. If any one shall so presume, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God, and of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul. End of section 20
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Holy Spirit Encyclical Letter Divinum Elude May 4th, 1897 That divine office which Jesus Christ received from his Father for the welfare of mankind, and most perfectly fulfilled, had for its final object to put men in possession of the eternal life of glory, and proximately during the course of ages to secure to them the life of divine grace, which is destined eventually to blossom into the life of heaven. Wherefore our Saviour never ceases to invite with infinite affection all men of every race and tongue into the bosom of his church. Come ye all to me, I am the life, I am the good shepherd. Nevertheless, according to his inscrutable counsels, he did not will to entirely complete and finish this office himself on earth, but as he had received it from the Father, so he transmitted it for its completion to the Holy Ghost. It is consoling to recall those assurances which Christ gave to the body of his disciples a little before he left the earth. It is expedient to you that I go, for if I go not, the paraclete will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. In these words he gave us the chief reason of his departure, and his return to the Father, the advantage which would most certainly accrue to his followers from the coming of the Holy Ghost. And at the same time he made it clear that the Holy Ghost is equally sent by, and therefore proceeds from, himself and the Father, that he would complete, in his office of intercessor, consoler, and teacher, the work which Christ himself had begun in his mortal life. For, in the redemption of the world, the completion of the work was by divine providence reserved to the manifold power of that Spirit, who, in the creation, adorned the heavens and filled the whole world. Now we have earnestly striven, by the help of His grace, to follow the example of Christ our Savior, the Prince of Pastors, and the Bishop of our souls, by diligently carrying on His office, entrusted by Him to the Apostles, and chiefly to Peter whose dignity faileth not, even in his unworthy successor. In pursuance of this object, we have endeavored to direct all that we have attempted and persistently carried out during the long pontificate towards two chief ends. In the first place, towards the restoration, both in rulers and peoples, of the principles of the Christian life in civil and domestic society, since there is no true life for men except from Christ, and, secondly, to promote the reunion of those who have fallen away from the Catholic Church, either by heresy or by schism, since it is most undoubtedly the will of Christ that all should be united in one flock under one shepherd. But now that we are looking forward to the approach of the closing days of our life, our soul is deeply moved to dedicate to the Holy Ghost, who is the life-giving love, all the work we have done during our pontificate, that he may bring it to maturity and fruitfulness. In order better and more fully to carry out this our intention, we have resolved to address you at the approaching sacred season of Pentecost, concerning the indwelling and miraculous power of the Holy Ghost, and the extent and efficiency of his action, both in the whole body of the Church and in the individual souls of its members, through the glorious abundance of his divine graces. We earnestly desire that, as a result, faith may be aroused in your minds concerning the mystery of the Adorable Trinity and especially that piety may increase and be inflamed towards the Holy Ghost, to whom especially all of us owe the grace of following the paths of truth and virtue. For, as St. Basil said, who denieth that the dispensations concerning man, which have been made by the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, according to the goodness of God, have been fulfilled through the grace of the Spirit? Before we enter upon this subject, it will be both desirable and useful to say a few words about the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. This dogma is called by the doctors of the Church the substance of the New Testament. That is to say, the greatest of all mysteries, since it is the fountain and origin of them all. In order to know and contemplate this mystery, the angels were created in heaven and men upon earth. In order to teach more fully this mystery which was but foreshadowed in the Old Testament, God himself came down from the angels unto men. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Whosoever then writes or speaks of the Trinity must keep before his eyes the prudent warning of the angelic doctor. When we speak of the Trinity, we must do so with caution and modesty, 
for, as St. Augustine saith, nowhere else are more dangerous errors made, or is research more difficult, or discovery more fruitful. The danger that arises is lest the divine persons be confounded one with the other in faith or worship, or lest the one nature in them be separated, for, this is the Catholic faith, that we should adore one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity. Therefore, our predecessor, in its sent the twelfth, absolutely refused the petition of those who desired a special festival in honor of God the Father. For, although the separate mysteries connected with the incarnate word are celebrated on certain fixed days, yet there is no special feast on which the word is honored according to his divine nature alone. And even the feast of Pentecost was instituted in the earliest times, not simply to honor the Holy Ghost in himself, but to commemorate his coming or his external mission. For all this has been wisely ordained, lest from distinguishing the persons men should be led to distinguish the divine essence. Moreover, the Church, in order to preserve to her children the purity of faith, instituted the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, which John the Twenty Second afterwards extended to the Universal Church. He also permitted altars and churches to be dedicated to the Blessed Trinity, and with the divine approval sanctioned the order for the ransom of captives, which is specially devoted to the Blessed Trinity and bears its name. Many facts confirm its truths. The worship paid to the saints and angels, to the Mother of God, and to Christ himself, finally redounds to the honor of the Blessed Trinity. In prayers addressed to one person, there is also mention of the others. In the litanies, after the individual persons have been separately invoked, a common invocation of all is added. All psalms and hymns conclude with a doxology to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Blessings, sacred rites, and sacraments are either accompanied or concluded by the invocation of the Blessed Trinity. This is already foreshadowed by the Apostle in those words, For of him, and by him, and in him are all things. In him be glory for ever thereby signifying both the trinity of persons and the unity of nature. For as this is one and the same in each of the persons, so to each is equally owing supreme glory, as to one and the same God. St. Augustine, commenting upon this testimony, writes, The words of the Apostle, of him, and by him, and in him, are not to be taken indiscriminately. Of him refers to the Father, by him to the Son, in him to the Holy Ghost. The Church is accustomed most fittingly to attribute to the Father those works of the divinity in which power excels, to the Son those in which wisdom excels, and those in which love excels to the Holy Ghost. Not that all perfection and external operations are not common to the divine persons, for the operations of the Trinity are indivisible, even as the essence of the Trinity is indivisible because as the three divine persons are inseparable, so do they act inseparably. But by a certain comparison and a kind of affinity between the operations and the properties of the persons, these operations are attributed, or, as it is said, appropriated to one person rather than to the others. Just as we make use of the traces of similarity or likeness which we find in creatures for the manifestation of the divine persons, so do we use their essential attributes, and this manifestation of the persons by their essential attributes is called appropriation. In this manner, the Father, who is the principle of the whole Godhead, is also the efficient cause of all things, of the incarnation of the Word, and the sanctification of souls. Of Him are all things, of Him referring to the Father. But the Son, the Word, the image of God, is also the exemplary cause, whence all creatures borrow their form and beauty, their order and harmony. He is for us the way, the truth, and the life, the reconciler of man with God. By him are all things, by him referring to the Son. The Holy Ghost is the ultimate cause of all things, since, as the will and all other things finally rest in their end, so he, who is the divine goodness and the mutual love of the Father and Son, completes and perfects, by his strong yet gentle power, the secret work of man's eternal salvation. In him are all things and him referring to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost and the Incarnation Having thus paid the due tribute of faith and worship owing to the Blessed Trinity, and which ought to be more and more inculcated upon the Christian people, 
we now turn to the exposition of the power of the Holy Ghost. And, first of all, we must look to Christ, the founder of the Church and Redeemer of our race. Among the external operations of God, the highest of all is the mystery of the Incarnation of the Word, in which the splendor of the divine perfections shines forth so brightly that nothing more sublime can even be imagined. Nothing else could have been more solitary to the human race. Now this work, although belonging to the whole Trinity, is still appropriated, especially to the Holy Ghost, so that the Gospels thus speak of the Blessed Virgin, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, and that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And this is rightly attributed to him who is the love of the Father and the Son, since the great mystery of piety proceeds from the infinite love of God towards man. As St. John tells us, God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son. Moreover, human nature was thereby elevated to a personal union with the Word, and this dignity is given not on account of any merits, but entirely and absolutely through grace, and therefore, as it were, through the special gift of the Holy Ghost. On this point, St. Augustine writes, The manner in which Christ was born of the Holy Ghost indicates to us the grace of God, by which humanity, with no antecedent, merits at the first moment of its existence, was united with the word of God by so intimate a personal union that he who was the Son of Man was also the Son of God, and he who was the Son of God was also the Son of Man. By the operation of the Holy Spirit, not only was the conception of Christ accomplished, but also the sanctification of his soul, which in Holy Scripture is called his anointing. Wherefore, all his actions were performed in the Holy Ghost, and especially the sacrifice of himself. Christ, through the Holy Ghost, offered himself without spot to God. Considering this, no one can be surprised that all the gifts of the Holy Ghost inundated the soul of Christ. In him resided the absolute fullness of grace, in the greatest and most efficacious manner possible. In him were all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, graces, gratis date, virtues, and all other gifts foretold in the prophecies of Isaiah, and also signified in that miraculous dove which appeared at the Jordan when Christ, by his baptism, consecrated its waters for a new sacrament. On this the words of St. Augustine may appropriately be quoted. It would be observed to say that Christ received the Holy Ghost when he was already thirty years of age, for he came to his baptism without sin and therefore not without the Holy Ghost. At this time, then, that is, at his baptism, he was pleased to prefigure his church, in which those especially who are baptized receive the Holy Ghost. Therefore, by the conspicuous apparition of the Holy Ghost over Christ, and by his invisible power in his soul, the twofold mission of the Spirit is foreshadowed, namely, his outward invisible mission in the church, and his secret indwelling in the souls of the just. The Holy Ghost in the Church the church which, already conceived, came forth from the side of the second Adam in his sleep on the cross, first showed herself before the eyes of men on the great day of Pentecost. On that day the Holy Ghost began to manifest his gifts in the mystic body of Christ, by that miraculous outpouring already foreseen by the prophet Joel, for the paraclete sat upon the apostles as though new spiritual crowns were placed upon their heads in tongues of fire. Then the apostles descended from the mountain, as St. John Chrysostom writes, not bearing in their hands tables of stone like Moses, but carrying the Spirit in their mind, and pouring forth the treasure and the fountain of doctrines and graces. Thus was fully accomplished that last promise of Christ and his apostles ascending the Holy Ghost, who was to complete and, as it were, to seal the deposit of doctrine committed to them under his inspiration. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, shall come, he will teach you all truth. For he who is the Spirit of truth, inasmuch as he proceedeth both from the Father, who is the eternally true, and from the Son, who is the substantial truth, receiveth from each both his essence and the fullness of all truth. This truth he communicates to his church, guarding her by his all-powerful help from ever falling into error, and aiding her to foster daily more and more the germs of divine doctrine, and to make them fruitful for the welfare of the peoples. And since the welfare of the peoples, for which the church was established, absolutely requires that this office should be continued for all time, the Holy Ghost perpetually supplies life and strength to preserve and increase the church. 
I will ask the Father, and he will give you another paraclete, that he may abide with you for ever, the Spirit of Truth. By him the bishops are constituted, and by their ministry are multiplied not only the children, but also the fathers, that is to say, the priests, to rule and feed the church, by that blood wherewith Christ has redeemed her. The Holy Ghost hath placed you bishops to rule the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And both bishops and priests, by the miraculous gift of the Spirit, have the power of absolving sin, according to those words of Christ to the apostles, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose you shall retain, they are retained. That the church is a divine institution is most clearly proved by the splendor and glory of those gifts and graces with which she is adorned, and whose author and giver is the Holy Ghost. Let it suffice to state that, as Christ is the head of the church, so is the Holy Ghost her soul. What the soul is in our body, that is the Holy Ghost, in Christ's body, the church. This being so, no further and fuller manifestation and revelation of the Divine Spirit may be imagined or expected, for that which now takes place in the Church is the most perfect possible, and will last until that day when the Church herself, having passed through her militant career, shall be taken up into the joy of the saints triumphing in heaven. The Holy Ghost in the Souls of the Just The manner and extent of the action of the Holy Ghost in individual souls, is no less wonderful, although somewhat more difficult to understand, inasmuch as it is entirely invisible. This outpouring of the Spirit is so abundant that Christ himself, from whose grace it proceeds, compares it to an overflowing river, according to those words of St. John, He that believeth in me, as the Scripture saith, out of his midst shall flow rivers of living grace to which testimony the evangelist adds the explanation, Now this he said of the Spirit, which they should receive who believed in him. It is indeed true that in those of the just who lived before Christ, the Holy Ghost resided by grace, as we read in the scriptures concerning the prophets Zachary, John the Baptist, Simeon, and Anna, so that on Pentecost the Holy Ghost did not communicate himself in such a way as then for the first time to begin to dwell in the saints, but by pouring himself forth more abundantly, crowning, not beginning his gifts, not commencing a new work, but giving more abundantly. But, if they also were numbered among the children of God, they were in a state like that of servants, for, as long as the heir is a child, he differeth nothing from a servant, but is under tutors and governors. Moreover, not only was their justice derived from the merits of Christ, who was to come, but the communication of the Holy Ghost, after Christ, was much more abundant, just as the price surpasses in value the earnest, and the reality excels the image. Wherefore, St. John declares, As yet the Spirit was not given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So soon, therefore, as Christ, ascending on high, entered into the possession of the glory of his kingdom, which he had won with so much labor, he munificently opened out the treasures of the Holy Ghost. He gave gifts to men, for that giving or sending forth of the Holy Ghost after Christ's glorification was to be such as had never been before. Not that there had been none before, but it had not been of the same kind. Human nature is by necessity the servant of God. The creature is a servant. We are the servants of God by nature. On account, however, of original sin, our whole nature had fallen into such guilt and dishonor that we had become enemies to God. We were by nature the children of wrath. There was no power which could raise us and deliver us from this ruin and eternal destruction. But God, the creator of mankind, and infinitely merciful, did this through his only begotten Son, by whose benefit it was brought about that man was restored to that rank and dignity whence he had fallen and was adorned with still more abundant graces. No one can express the greatness of this work of divine grace in the souls of men. Wherefore, both in holy scriptures and in the writings of the fathers, men are styled regenerated new creatures, partakers of the divine nature, children of God, godlike, and similar epithets. Now these great blessings are justly attributed as especially belonging to the Holy Ghost. 
he is the spirit of adoption of sons whereby we cry abba father he fills our hearts with the sweetness of paternal love the spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of god this truth accords with the similitude observed by the angelic doctor between both operations of the holy ghost for through him christ was conceived in holiness to be by nature the son of god and others are sanctified to be the sons of god by adoption this spiritual generation proceeds from love in a much more noble manner than the natural namely from the uncreated love the beginnings of this regeneration and renovation of man are by baptism in the sacrament when the unclean spirit has been expelled from the soul the holy ghost enters in and makes it like to himself that which is born of the spirit is spirit the same spirit gives himself more abundantly in confirmation strengthening and confirming christian life from which proceedeth the victory of the martyrs and the triumph of the virgins over temptations and corruptions we have said that the holy ghost gives himself the charity of god is poured out into our hearts by the holy ghost who is given to us for he not only brings to us his divine gifts but is the author of them and is himself the supreme gift who proceeding from the mutual love of the father and the son is justly believed to be and is called gift of god most high to show the nature and efficacy of this gift it is well to recall the explanation given by the doctors of the church of the words of holy scripture they say that god is present and exists in all things by his power in so far as all things are subject to his power by his presence inasmuch as all things are naked and open to his eyes by his essence inasmuch as he is present to all as the cause of their being but god is in man not only as in inanimate things but because he is more fully known and loved by him since even by nature we spontaneously love desire and seek after the good moreover god by grace resides in the just soul as in a temple in a most intimate and peculiar manner from this proceeds that union of affection by which the soul adheres most closely to god more so than the friend is united to his most loving and beloved friend and enjoys god in all fullness and sweetness now this wonderful union which is properly called indwelling differing only in degree or state from that with which god beatifies the saints in heaven although it is most certainly produced by the presence of the whole blessed trinity we will come to him and make our abode with him nevertheless is attributed in a peculiar manner to the holy ghost for whilst traces of divine power and wisdom appear even in the wicked man charity which as it were is the special mark of the holy ghost is shared in only by the just in harmony with this the same spirit is called holy for he the first and supreme love moves souls and leads them to sanctity which ultimately consists in the love of god wherefore the apostle when calling us the temple of god does not expressly mention the father or the son or the holy ghost know ye not that your members are the temple of the holy ghost who is in you whom you have from god the fullness of divine gifts is in many ways a consequence of the indwelling of the holy ghost in the souls of the just for as saint thomas teaches when the holy ghost proceedeth as love he proceedeth in the character of the first gift whence augustine saith that through the gift which is the holy ghost many other special gifts are distributed among the members of christ among these gifts are those secret warnings and invitations which from time to time are excited in our minds and hearts by the inspiration of the holy ghost without these there is no beginning of a good life no progress no arriving at eternal salvation and since these words and admonitions are uttered in the soul in an exceedingly secret manner they are sometimes aptly compared in holy writ to the breathing of a coming breeze and the angelic doctor likens them to the movements of the heart which are wholly hidden in the living body thy heart has a certain hidden power and therefore the holy ghost who invisibly vivifies and unites the church is compared to the heart more than this the just man that is to say he who lives the life of divine grace and acts by the fitting virtues as by means of faculties has need of those seven gifts which are properly attributed to the holy ghost by means of them the soul is furnished and strengthened 
so as to be able to obey more easily and promptly his voice and impulse. Wherefore these gifts are of such efficacy that they lead the just man to the highest degree of sanctity, and of such excellence that they continue to exist even in heaven, though in a more perfect way. By means of these gifts the soul is excited and encouraged to seek after and attain the evangelical beatitudes, which, like the flowers that come forth in the springtime, are the signs and harbingers of eternal beatitude. Lastly, there are those blessed fruits, enumerated by the Apostle, which the Spirit, even in this mortal life, produces and shows forth in the just. Fruits filled with all sweetness and joy, inasmuch as they proceed from the Spirit, who is in the Trinity the sweetness of both Father and Son, filling all creatures with infinite fullness and profusion. The Divine Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Word is eternal light of sanctity, himself both love and gift, after having manifested himself through the veils of figures in the Old Testament, poured forth all his fullness upon Christ and upon his mystic body, the Church, and called back by his presence and grace men who were going away in wickedness and corruption, which such solitary effect of being no longer of the earth earthy, they relished and desired quite other things becoming of heaven heavenly. These sublime truths, which so clearly show forth the infinite goodness of the Holy Ghost towards us, certainly demand that we should direct towards him the highest homage of our love and devotion. Christians may do this most effectually if they will daily strive to know him, to love him, and to implore him more earnestly. For which reason may this our exhortation, flowing spontaneously from a paternal heart, reach among them, even nowadays, some who, if asked, as were those of old by St. Paul the Apostle, whether they have received the Holy Ghost, might answer in like manner, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. At least there are certainly many who are very deficient in their knowledge of Him. They frequently use His name in their religious practices, but their faith is involved in much darkness. Wherefore all preachers, and those having care of souls, should remember that it is their duty to instruct their people more diligently and more fully about the Holy Ghost, avoiding, however, difficult and subtle controversies, and eschewing the dangerous folly of those who rashly endeavor to pry into divine mysteries. What should be chiefly dwelt upon and clearly explained is the multitude and greatness of the benefits which have been bestowed, and are constantly bestowed, upon us by this divine giver, so that errors and ignorance concerning matters of such moment may be entirely dispelled as unworthy of the children of light. We urge this not only because it affects the mystery by which we are directly guided to eternal life, and which must therefore be firmly believed, but also because the more clearly and fully the good is known, the more earnestly it is loved. Now we owe to the Holy Ghost, as we mentioned in the second place, love, because he is God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole strength. He is also to be loved because he is the substantial, eternal, primal love, and nothing is more lovable than love. And this all the more, because he has overwhelmed us with the greatest benefits, which both testify to the benevolence of the giver, and claim the gratitude of the receiver. This love has a twofold and most conspicuous utility. In the first place, it will excite us to acquire daily a clearer knowledge about the Holy Ghost, for, as the angelic doctor says, the lover is not content with the superficial knowledge of the Beloved, but striveth to inquire intimately into all that appertains to the Beloved, and thus to penetrate into the interior, as is said of the Holy Ghost, who is the love of God, that he searcheth even the profound things of God. In the second place, it will obtain for us a still more abundant supply of heavenly gifts, for whilst a narrow heart contracteth the hand of the giver, a grateful and mindful heart causeth it to expand. Yet we must strive that this love should be of such a nature as not to consist merely in dry speculations or external observances, but rather to run forward towards action, and especially to fly from sin, which is in a more special manner offensive to the Holy Spirit. For whatever we are, that we are by the divine goodness, and this goodness is specially attributed to the Holy Ghost. The sinner offends this as benefactor, abusing his gifts and taking advantage of his goodness, becomes more hardened in sin day by day. Again, since he is the spirit of truth, 
whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before almighty god but he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the holy ghost in our days this sin has become so frequent that those dark times seem to have come which were foretold by st paul in which men blinded by the just judgment of god should take falsehood for truth and should believe in the prince of this world who is a liar and the father thereof as a teacher of truth god shall send them the operation of error to believe lying in the last times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to the spirits of error and the doctrines of devils but since the holy ghost as we have said dwells in us as in his temple we must repeat the warning of the apostle grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby you are sealed nor is it enough to fly from sin every christian ought to shine with the splendor of virtue so as to be pleasing to so great and so beneficent a guest and first of all with chastity and holiness for chaste and holy things befit the temple hence the words of the apostle know you not that you are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwelleth in you but if any man violate the temple of god him shall god destroy for the temple of god is holy which you are a terrible indeed but a just warning lastly we ought to pray to and invoke the holy spirit for each one of us greatly needs his protection and his help the more a man is deficient in wisdom weak in strength borne down with trouble prone to sin so ought he the more to fly to him who is the never-ending fount of light strength consolation and holiness and chiefly that first requisite of man the forgiveness of sins must be sought for from him it is the special character of the holy ghost that he is the gift of the father and the son now the remission of sins is given by the holy ghost as by the gift of god concerning the spirit the words of the liturgy are very explicit for he is the remission of all sins how should he be invoked is clearly taught by the church who addresses him in humble supplication calling upon him by the sweetest of names come father of the poor come giver of gifts come light of our hearts o best of consolers sweet guest of the soul our refreshment she earnestly implores him to wash heal water our minds and hearts and to give us who trust in him the merit of virtue and acquirement of salvation and joy everlasting nor can it be in any way doubted that he will listen to such prayer since we read the words written by his own inspiration the spirit himself asketh for us with unspeakable groanings lastly we ought confidently and continually to beg of him to illuminate us daily more and more with his light and inflame us with his charity for thus inspired with faith and love we may press onward earnestly towards our eternal reward since he is the pledge of our inheritance such venerable brethren are the teachings and exhortations which we have seen good to utter in order to stimulate devotion to the holy ghost we have no doubt that chiefly by means of your zeal and earnestness they will bear abundant fruit among christian peoples we ourselves shall never in the future fail to labor towards so important an end and it is even our intention in whatever ways may appear suitable to further cultivate and extend this admirable work of piety meanwhile as two years ago in our letter provida matris we recommended to catholics special prayers at the feast of pentecost for the reunion of christendom so now we desire to make certain further decrees on the same subject wherefore we decree and command that throughout the whole catholic church this year and in every subsequent year a novena shall take place before whit sunday in all parish churches and also if the local ordinaries think fit in other churches and oratories to all who take part in this novena and duly pray for our intention we grant for each day an indulgence of seven years and seven quarantines moreover a plenary indulgence on any of the days of the novena or on whit sunday itself or on any day during the octave provided they shall have received the sacraments of penance in the holy eucharist and devoutly prayed for our intention we will that those who are legitimately prevented from attending the novena or who are in places where the devotions cannot in the judgment of the ordinary be conveniently carried out in church shall equally enjoy the same benefits provided they make the novena privately and observe the other conditions 
Moreover, we are pleased to grant, in perpetuity, from the treasury of the Church, that whosoever, daily during the octave of Pentecost, up to Trinity Sunday inclusive, offer again publicly or privately any prayers according to their devotion to the Holy Ghost, and satisfy the above conditions, shall a second time gain each of the same indulgences. All these indulgences we also permit to be applied as suffrages for the souls in purgatory. And now our mind and heart turn back to those hopes with which we began, and for the accomplishment of which we earnestly pray, and will continue to pray, to the Holy Ghost. Unite, then, venerable brethren, your prayers with our own, and at your exhortation let all Christian peoples add their prayers also, invoking the powerful and ever-acceptable intercession of the Blessed Virgin. You know well the intimate and wonderful relations existing between her and the Holy Ghost, so that she is justly called his spouse. The intercession of the Blessed Virgin was of great avail both in the mystery of the Incarnation and in the coming of the Holy Ghost upon the Apostles. May she continue to strengthen our prayers with her suffrages, that, in the midst of all the stress and trouble of the nations, those divine prodigies may be happily received by the Holy Ghost, which were foretold in the words of David, Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. As a pledge of divine favor and a testimony of our affection, venerable brethren, to you, to our clergy and people, we gladly impart in the Lord the apostolic benediction. End of section 21section twenty two of the great encyclical letters of pope leo the thirteenth this librivox recording is in the public domain true and false americanism in religion apostolical letter testum benevolentiae january twenty second eighteen ninety nine addressed to his eminence cardinal gibbons archbishop of baltimore we send you this letter as a testimony of that devoted affection in your regard which, during the long course of our pontificate, we have never ceased to profess for you, for your colleagues in the episcopate, and for the whole American people, willingly availing ourselves at every occasion to do so, whether it was the happy increase of your church, or the works which you have done so wisely and well in furthering and protecting the interests of Catholicity. The opportunity also often presented itself of regarding with admiration that exceptional disposition of your nation, so eager for what is great, and so ready to pursue whatever might be conducive to social progress and the splendor of the state. But although the object of this letter is not to repeat the praise so often accorded, but rather to point out certain things which are to be avoided and corrected, yet because it is written with that same apostolic charity which we have always shown you, and in which we have often addressed you, we trust that you will regard it likewise as a proof of our love, and all the more so as it is conceived and intended to put an end to certain contentions which have arisen lately among you, and which disturb the minds, if not of all, at least of many, to the no slight detriment of peace. You are aware, beloved son, that the book entitled The Life of Isaac Thomas Hecker, chiefly through the action of those who have undertaken to publish and interpret it in a foreign language, has excited no small controversy on account of certain opinions which are introduced concerning the manner of leading a Christian life. We, therefore, on account of our apostolic office, in order to provide for the integrity of the faith and to guard the security of the faithful, desire to write to you more at length upon the whole matter. The principles on which the new opinions we have mentioned are based may be reduced to this, that, in order the more easily to bring over to Catholic doctrine those who dissent from it, the Church ought to adapt herself somewhat to our advanced civilization, and relaxing her ancient rigor, show some indulgence to modern popular theories and methods. Many think that this is to be understood not only with regard to the rule of life, but also to the doctrines in which the deposit of faith is contained. For they contend that it is opportune in order to work in a more attractive way upon the wills of those who are not in accord with us to pass over certain heads of doctrines, as if of lesser moment, or to soften them that they may not have the same meaning which the church is invariably held. Now, beloved son, few words are needed to show how reprehensible is the plan that is thus conceived, if we but consider the character and origin of the doctrine which the Church hands down to us. On that point the Vatican Council says, 
the doctrine of faith which god has revealed is not proposed like a theory of philosophy which is to be elaborated by the human understanding but as a divine deposit delivered to the spouse of christ to be faithfully guarded and infallibly declared that sense of the sacred dogmas is to be faithfully kept which holy mother church has once declared and is not to be departed from under the specious pretext of a more profound understanding nor is the suppression to be considered altogether free from blame which designedly omits certain principles of catholic doctrine and buries them as it were in oblivion for there is the one and the same author and master of all the truths that christian teaching comprises the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father that they are adapted to all ages and nations is plainly deduced from the words which christ addressed to his apostles going therefore teach ye all nations teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and behold i am with you all days even to the consummation of the world wherefore the same vatican council says by the divine and catholic faith those things are to be believed which are contained in the word of god either written or handed down and are proposed by the church whether in solemn decision or by the ordinary universal magisterium to be believed as having been divinely revealed far be it then for any one to diminish or for any reason whatever to pass over anything of this divinely delivered doctrine whosoever would do so would rather wish to alienate catholics from the church than to bring over to the church those who dissent from it let them return indeed nothing is nearer to our hearts let all those who are wandering far from the sheepfold of christ return but let it not be by any other road than that which christ has pointed out the rule of life which is laid down for catholics is not of such a nature as not to admit modifications according to the diversity of time and place the church indeed possesses what her author has bestowed on her a kind and merciful disposition for which reason from the very beginning she willingly showed herself to be what paul proclaimed in his own regard i became all things to all men that i might save all the history of all past ages is witness that the apostolic see to which not only the office of teaching but also the supreme government of the whole church was committed has constantly adhered to the same doctrine in the same sense and in the same mind but it has always been accustomed to so modify the rule of life that while keeping the divine right and violet it has never disregarded the manners and customs of the various nations which it embraces if required for the salvation of souls who will doubt that it is ready to do so at the present time but this is not to be determined by the will of private individuals who are mostly deceived by the appearance of right but ought to be left to the judgment of the church in this almost acquiesce who wish to avoid the censure of our predecessor pius the sixth who proclaimed the eighteenth proposition of the synod of pistoia to be injurious to the church and to the spirit of god which governs her inasmuch as it subjects to scrutiny the discipline established and approved by the church as if the church could establish a useless discipline or one which would be too onerous for christian liberty to bear but in the matter of which we are now speaking beloved son the project involves a greater danger and is more hostile to catholic doctrine and discipline inasmuch as the followers of these novelties judge that a certain liberty ought to be introduced into the church so that limiting the exercise and vigilance of its powers each one of the faithful may act more freely in pursuance of his own natural bent and capacity they affirm namely that this is called for in order to imitate that liberty which though quite recently introduced is now the law and foundation of almost every civil community on that point we have spoken very much at length in the letter written to all the bishops about the constitution of states where we have also shown the difference between the church which is of divine right and all other associations which subsist by the free will of men it is of importance therefore to note particularly an opinion which is adduced as a sort of argument to urge the granting of such liberty to catholics for they say in speaking of the infallible teaching of the roman pontiff that after the solemn decision formulated in the vatican council there is no more need of solicitude in that regard and because of its being now out of dispute a wider field of thought and action is thrown open to individuals a preposterous method of arguing surely for if anything is suggested by the infallible teaching of the church 
it is certainly that no one should wish to withdraw from it, nay, that all should strive to be thoroughly imbued with and be guided by its spirit, so as to be the more easily preserved from any private error whatsoever. To this we may add that those who argue in that wise quite set aside the wisdom and providence of God, who when he desired in that very solemn decision to affirm the authority and teaching office of the apostolic see, desired it especially in order the more efficaciously to guard the minds of Catholics from the dangers of the present times. The license which is commonly confounded with liberty, the passion for saying and reviling everything, the habit of thinking and of expressing everything in print, have cast such deep shadows on men's minds that there is now greater utility and necessity for this office of teaching than ever before, lest men should be drawn away from conscience and duty. It is far, indeed, from our intention to repudiate all that the genius of the time begets. Nay, rather, whatever the search for truth attains, or the effort after good achieves, will always be welcomed by us, for it increases the patrimony of doctrine and enlarges the limits of public prosperity. But all this, to possess real utility, should thrive without setting aside the authority and wisdom of the Church. We come now in due course to what are adduced as consequences from the opinions which we have touched upon, in which, if the intentions seem not wrong, as we believe, the things themselves assuredly will not appear by any means free from suspicion. For in the first place, all external guidance is rejected as superfluous, nay, even as somewhat of a disadvantage, for those who desire to devote themselves to the acquisition of Christian perfection. For the Holy Ghost, they say, pours greater and richer gifts into the hearts of the faithful now than in times past, and by a certain hidden instinct teaches and moves them with no one as an intermediary. It is indeed not a little rash to wish to determine the degree in which God communicates with men for that depends solely on his will, and he himself is the absolutely free giver of his own gifts. The Spirit breatheth where he will. But to every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the giving of Christ. For who, when going over the history of the apostles, the faith of the rising church, the struggles and slaughter of the valiant martyrs, and finally most of the ages past so abundantly rich in holy men, will presume to compare the past with the present times, and to assert that they received a lesser outpouring of the Holy Ghost? But, aside from that, no one doubts that the Holy Ghost, by his secret incoming into the souls of the just, influences and arouses them by admonition and impulse. If it were otherwise, any external help and guidance would be useless. If anyone positively affirms that he can consent to the saving preaching of the gospel without the illumination of the Holy Ghost, who imparts sweetness to all to consent to and accept the truth, he is misled by a heretical spirit. But as we know by experience, these promptings and impulses of the Holy Ghost, for the most part, are not discerned without the help and, as it were, without the preparation of an external guidance. In this matter, Augustine says, It is he who in good trees cooperates in their fruiting, who both waters and cultivates them by any servant whatever from without, and who by himself gives increase within. That is to say, the whole matter is according to the common law, by which God in his infinite providence has decreed that men, for the most part, should be saved by men. Hence he has appointed that those whom he calls to a loftier degree of holiness should be led thereto by men, in order that, as Chrysostom says, we should be taught by God through men. We have an illustrious example of this put before us in the very beginning of the church, for although Saul, who was breathing threatenings and slaughter, heard the voice of Christ himself, and asked from him, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He was nevertheless sent to Ananias at Damascus. Arise, and go into the city, and there it shall be told thee what thou must do. It must also be kept in mind that those who follow what is more perfect are by the very fact entering upon a way of life which for most men is untried and more exposed to error, and therefore they, more than others, stand in need of a teacher and a guide. This manner of acting has invariably obtained in the church, all without exception who in the course of ages have been remarkable for science and holiness have taught this doctrine. Those who reject it assuredly do so rashly and at their peril. For one who examines the matter thoroughly, it is hard to see, if we do away with all external guidance, as those innovators propose, 
what purpose the more abundant influence of the holy ghost which they make so much of is to serve in point of fact it is especially in the cultivation of virtue that the assistance of the holy spirit is indispensable but those who affect these novelties extol beyond measure the natural virtues as more in accordance with the ways and requirements of the present day and consider it an advantage to be richly endowed with them because they make a man more ready and more strenuous in action it is hard to understand how those who are imbued with christian principles can place the natural ahead of the supernatural virtues and attribute to them greater power and fecundity is nature then with grace added to it weaker than when left to its own strength and have the eminently holy men whom the church reveres and pays homage to shown themselves weak and incompetent in the natural order because they have excelled in christian virtue even if we admire the sometimes splendid acts of the natural virtues how rare is the man who really possesses the habit of these natural virtues who is there who is not disturbed by passions sometimes of a violent nature for the persevering conquest of which just as for the observance of the whole natural law man must need have some divine help if we scrutinize more closely the particular acts we have above referred to we shall discover that oftentimes they have more the appearance than the reality of virtue but let us grant that these are real if we do not wish to run in vain if we do not wish to lose sight of the eternal blessedness to which god in his goodness has destined us of what use are the natural virtues unless the gift and strength of divine grace be added aptly does st augustine say great power and a rapid pace but out of the course for as the nature of man because of our common misfortune fell into vice and dishonour yet by the assistance of grace is lifted up and borne onward with new honour and strength so also the virtues which are exercised not by the unaided powers of nature but by the help of the same grace are made productive of a supernatural beatitude and become solid and enduring with this opinion about natural virtue another is intimately connected according to which all christian virtues are divided as it were into two classes passive as they say and active and they add the former were better suited for the past times but the latter are more in keeping with the present it is plain what is to be thought of such division of the virtues there is not and cannot be a virtue which is really passive virtue says st thomas denotes a certain perfection of a power but the object of a power is an act and an act of virtue is nothing else than the good use of our free will the divine grace of course helping if the act of virtue is supernatural the one who would have christian virtues to be adapted some to one age and others to another has forgotten the words of the apostle whom he foreknew he also predestinated to be made conformable to the image of his son the master and exemplar of all sanctity is christ to whose rule all must conform who wish to attain to the thrones of the blessed now then christ does not at all change with the progress of the ages but is yesterday and to-day and the same for ever to the men of all ages the phrase is to be applied learn of me because i am meek and humble of heart and at all times christ shows himself to us as becoming obedient unto death and in every age also the word of the apostle holds and they that are christ's have crucified their flesh with the vices and concupiscences would that more would cultivate those virtues in our days as did the holy men of bygone times those who by humbleness of spirit by obedience and abstinence were powerful in word and work were of the greatest help not only to religion but to the state and society from this species of contempt of the evangelical virtues which are wrongly called passive it naturally follows that the mind is imbued little by little with a feeling of disdain for the religious life and that this is common to the advocates of these new opinions we gather from certain expressions of theirs about the vows which religious orders pronounce for say they such vows are altogether out of keeping with the spirit of our age inasmuch as they narrow the limits of human liberty are better adapted to weak minds than to strong ones avail little for christian perfection and the good of human society and rather obstruct and interfere with it but how false these assertions are is evident from the usage and doctrine of the church which has always given the highest approval to religious life 
and surely not undeservedly for those who not content with the common duties of the precepts enter of their own accord upon the evangelical counsels in obedience to a divine vocation present themselves to christ as his prompt and valiant soldiers are we to consider this a mark of weak minds in the more perfect manner of life is it unprofitable or hurtful those who bind themselves by the vows of religion are so far from throwing away their liberty that they enjoy a nobler and fuller one that namely by which christ has set us free what they add to this namely that religious life helps the church not at all or very little apart from being injurious to religious orders will be admitted by no one who has read the history of the church do not your own united states receive from the members of religious orders the beginning of its faith in civilization for one of them recently and it redounds to your credit you have decreed that a statute should be publicly erected and at this very time with what alacrity and success are these religious orders doing their work wherever we find them how many of them hasten to impart to new lands the life of the gospel and to extend the boundaries of civilization with the greatest earnestness of soul and amid the greatest dangers from them no less than from the rest of the clergy the christian people obtain preachers of the word of god directors of conscience instructors of youth and the entire church examples of holy lives nor is there any distinction of praise between those who lead an active life and those who attracted by seclusion give themselves up to prayer and mortification of the body how gloriously they have merited from human society and do still merit they should be aware who are not ignorant of how the continual prayer of a just man especially when joined to affliction of the body avails to propitiate and conciliate the majesty of god if there are any therefore who prefer to unite together in one society without the obligation of vows let them do as they desire that is not a new institution in the church nor is it to be disapproved but let them beware of setting such associations above religious orders nay rather since mankind is more prone now than heretofore to the enjoyment of pleasure much greater esteem is to be accorded to those who have left all things and have followed christ lastly not to delay too long it is also maintained that the way and the method which catholics have followed thus far for recalling those who differ from us is to be abandoned and another resorted to in that matter it suffices to avert that it is not prudent beloved son to neglect what antiquity with its long experience guided as it is by apostolic teaching has stamped with its approval from the word of god we have it that it is the office of all to labor in helping the salvation of our neighbor in the order and degree in which each one is the faithful indeed will most usefully fulfill their duty by integrity of life by the works of christian charity by instant and assiduous prayer to god but the clergy should do so by a wise preaching of the gospel by the decorum and splendor of the sacred ceremonies but especially by expressing in themselves the form of doctrine which the apostles delivered to titus and timothy so that if among the different methods of preaching the word of god that sometimes seem preferable by which those who dissent from us are spoken to not in the church but in any private and proper place not in disputation but in amicable conference such method is indeed not to be reprehended provided however that those who are devoted to that work by the authority of the bishop be men who have first given proof of science and virtue for we think that there are very many among you who differ from catholics rather through ignorance than because of any disposition of the will who perchance if the truth is put before them in a familiar and friendly manner may more easily be led to the one sheepfold of christ hence from all that we have hitherto said it is clear beloved son that we cannot approve the opinions which some comprise under the head of americanism if indeed by that name be designated the characteristic qualities which reflect honor on the people of america just as other nations have what is special to them or if it implies the condition of your commonwealths or the laws and customs which prevail in them there is surely no reason why we should deem that it ought to be discarded but it is to be used not only to signify but even to commend the above doctrines there can be no doubt but that our venerable brethren the bishops of america will be the first to repudiate and condemn it as being especially unjust to them and to the entire nation as well 
for it raises a suspicion that there are some among you who conceive of and desire a church in america different from which is in the rest of the world one in the unity of doctrine as in the unity of government such as the catholic church and since god has established its centre and foundation in the chair of peter one which is rightly called roman for where peter is there is the church wherefore he who wishes to be called by the name of catholic ought to employ in truth the words of jerome to pope damasus i followed none as the first except christ am associated in communion with your beatitude that is with the chair of peter upon that rock i know is built the church whosoever gathereth not with thee scattereth what we write beloved son to you in particular by reason of our office we shall take care to have communicated to the rest of the bishops of the united states expressing again that love in which we include your whole nation which as in times past has done much for religion and bids fair with god's good grace to do still more in the future to you and all the faithful of america we give most lovingly as an augury of divine assistance our apostolical benediction end of section twenty two Section twenty three of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Pleo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Consecration of Mankind to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Encyclical Letter Anum Sacrum, May twenty fifth, eighteen ninety nine. But a short time ago, as you well know, we, by letters apostolic and following the custom and ordinances of our predecessors, commanded the celebration in this city at no distant date of a holy year and now to-day in the hope and with the object that this religious celebration shall be more devoutly performed we have traced and recommended a striking design from which if all shall follow it out with hearty good will we not unreasonably expect our extraordinary and lasting benefits for christendom in the first place and also for the whole human race already more than once we have endeavoured after the example of our predecessors innocent the twelfth benedict the thirteenth clement the thirteenth pius the sixth pius the seventh and pius the ninth devoutly to foster and bring out into fuller light that most excellent form of devotion which has for its object the veneration of the sacred heart of jesus this we did especially by the decree given on june twenty eighth eighteen eighty nine by which we raised the feast under that name to the dignity of the first class. But now we have in mind a more signal form of devotion, which shall be, in a manner, the crowning perfection of all the honors that people have been accustomed to pay to the Sacred Heart, and which we confidently trust will be most pleasing to Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. This is not the first time, however, that the design of which we speak has been mooted. Twenty-five years ago, on the approach of the solemnities of the second centenary of the Blessed Margaret Mary Alacoque's reception of the divine command to propagate the worship of the Sacred Heart, many letters from all parts, not merely from private persons, but from bishops also, were sent to Pius IX, begging that he would consent to consecrate the whole human race to the most sacred heart of Jesus. It was thought best at the time to postpone the matter in order that a well-considered decision might be arrived at. Meanwhile, permission was granted to individual cities which desired it thus to consecrate themselves, and a form of consecration was drawn up. Now, for certain new and additional reasons, we consider that the plan is ripe for fulfillment. This worldwide and solemn testimony of allegiance and piety is especially appropriate to Jesus Christ, who is the head and supreme lord of the race. His empire extends not only over Catholic nations, and those who, having been duly washed in the waters of holy baptism, belong of right to the Church, although erroneous opinions keep them astray, or dissent from her teaching cuts them off from her care. It comprises also all those who are deprived of the Christian faith, so that the whole human race is most truly under the power of Jesus Christ. For he who is the only begotten Son of God the Father having the same substance with him and being the brightness of his glory and the figure of his substance necessarily has everything in common with the father and therefore sovereign power over all things this is why the son of god thus speaks of himself through the prophet but i am appointed king by him over sion his holy mountain the lord said to me thou art my son this day have i begotten thee 
Ask of me, and I will give thee the Gentiles for thy inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. By these words he declares that he has power from God over the whole church, which is signified by Mount Sion, and also over the rest of the world to its uttermost ends. On what foundation the sovereign power rests is made sufficiently plain by the words, Thou art my son. For by the very fact that he is the son of the king of all, he is also the heir of all his father's power. Hence the words, I will give thee the Gentiles for thy inheritance, which are similar to those used by Paul the Apostle, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. But we should now give most special consideration to the declarations made by Jesus Christ, not through the apostles or the prophets, but by his own words. To the Roman governor who asked him, Art thou a king then? He answered unhesitatingly, Thou sayest that I am a king. And the greatness of this power and the boundlessness of his kingdom is still more clearly declared in these words to the apostles. All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. If, then, all power has been given to Christ, it follows of necessity that his empire must be supreme, absolute, and independent of the will of any other, so that none is either equal or like unto it. And since it has been given in heaven and on earth, it ought to have heaven and earth obedient to it. And verily he has acted on this extraordinary and peculiar right, when he commanded his apostles to preach his doctrine over the earth, to gather all men together into the one body of the church by the baptism of salvation, and to bind them by laws which no one could reject without risking his eternal salvation. But this is not all. Christ reigns not only by natural right as the Son of God, but also by a right that he has acquired. For he it was who snatched us from the powers of darkness, and gave himself for the redemption of all. Therefore not only Catholics, and those who have duly received Christian baptism, but also all men, individually and collectively, have become to him a purchased people. St. Augustine's words are therefore to the point when he says, You ask what price he paid. See what he gave, and you will understand how much he paid. The price was the blood of Christ. What could cost so much but the whole world and all its people? The great price he paid was paid for all. How it comes about that infidels themselves are subject to the power and dominion of Jesus Christ is clearly shown by St. Thomas, who gives us the reason and its explanation. For having put the question whether his judicial power extends to all men, and having stated that judicial authority flows naturally from royal authority, he concludes decisively as follows. All things are subject to Christ as far as his power is concerned, although they are not all subject to him in the exercise of that power. This sovereign power of Christ over men is exercised by truth, justice, and, above all, by charity. To this twofold ground of his power and domination, he graciously allows us, if we think fit, to have voluntary consecration. Jesus Christ, our God and our Redeemer, is rich in the fullest and perfect possession of all things. We, on the other hand, are so poor and needy that we have nothing of our own to offer him as a gift. But yet, in his infinite goodness and love, he in no way objects to our giving and consecrating to him what is already his, as if it were really our own. Nay, far from refusing such an offering, he positively desires it and asks for it. My son, give me thy heart. We are, therefore, able to be pleasing to him by the good will and the affection of our soul. For by consecrating ourselves to him, we not only declare our open and free acknowledgement and acceptance of his authority over us, but we also testify that if what we offer as a gift were really our own, we would still offer it with our whole heart. We also beg of him that he would vouchsafe to receive it from us, though clearly his own. Such is the efficacy of the act of which we speak, such is the meaning underlying our words. And since there is in the sacred heart a symbol and a sensible image of the infinite love of Jesus Christ, which moves us to love one another, therefore is it fit and proper that we should consecrate ourselves to his most sacred heart, an act which is nothing else than an offering and a binding of oneself to Jesus Christ, seeing that whatever honor, veneration, and love is given to this divine heart is really and truly given to Christ himself. 
For these reasons we urge and exhort all who know and love this divine heart willingly to undertake this act of piety, and it is our earnest desire that all should make it on the same day, that so the aspirations of so many thousands who are performing this act of consecration may be borne to the temple of heaven on the same day. But shall we allow to slip from our remembrance those innumerable others upon which the light of Christian truth has not yet shined? We hold the place of him who came to save that which was lost, and who shed his blood for the salvation of the whole human race. And so we greatly desire to bring to the true life those who sit in the shadow of death. As we have already sent messengers of Christ over the earth to instruct them, so now, in pity for their lot, with all our soul, we commend them, and as far in us lies, we consecrate them to the sacred heart of Jesus. In this way, this act of devotion, which we recommend, will be a blessing to all. For having performed it, those in whose heart are the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ will feel that faith and love increased. Those who, knowing Christ, yet neglect his law and its precepts, may still gain from his sacred heart the flame of charity. And lastly, for those still more unfortunate, who are struggling in the darkness of superstition, we shall all with one mind implore the assistance of heaven, that Jesus Christ, to whose power they are subject, may also one day render them submissive to its exercise, and that not only in the life to come, when he will fulfill his will upon all men, by saving some and punishing others, St. Thomas, but also in this mortal life by giving them faith and holiness. May they, by these virtues, strive to honor God as they ought, and to win everlasting happiness in heaven. Such an act of consecration, since it can establish or draw tighter the bonds which naturally connect public affairs with God, gives to states a hope for better things. In these latter times especially, a policy has been followed which has resulted in a sort of wall being raised between the church and civil society. In the constitution and administration of states, the authority of sacred and divine law is utterly disregarded, with a view to the exclusion of religion from having any constant part in public life. This policy almost tends to the removal of the Christian faith from our midst, and, if that were possible, of the banishment of God himself from the earth. When men's minds are raised to such a height of insolent pride, what wonder is it that the greater part of the human race should have fallen into such disquiet of mind, and be buffeted by waves so rough that no one is suffered to be free from anxiety and peril? When religion is once discarded, it follows of necessity that the surest foundations of the public welfare must give way, whilst God, to inflict on his enemies the punishment they so richly deserve, has left them the prey of their own evil desires, so that they give themselves up to their passions, and finally wear themselves out by excess of liberty. Hence that abundance of evils which have now, for a long time, settled upon the world, and which pressingly call upon us to seek for help from him, by whose strength alone they can be driven away. Who can he be but Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God? for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. We must have recourse to him who is the way, the truth, and the life. We have gone astray, and we must return to the right path. Darkness has overshadowed our minds, and the gloom must be dispelled by the light of truth. Death has seized upon us, and we must lay hold of life. It will at length be possible that our many wounds be healed, and all justice spring forth again with the hope of restored authority, that the splendors of peace be renewed, and swords and arms drop from the hand, when all men shall acknowledge the empire of Christ, and willingly obey his word. And every tongue shall confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father." When the church, in the days immediately succeeding her institution, was oppressed beneath the yoke of the Caesars, a young emperor saw in the heavens a cross, which became at once the happy omen and cause of the glorious victory that soon followed. And now, today, behold, another blessed and heavenly token is offered to our sight, the most sacred heart of Jesus, with a cross rising from it and shining forth with dazzling splendor amidst flames of love. In that sacred heart, all our hopes should be placed, and from it the salvation of men is to be confidently besought. Finally, there is one motive which we are unwilling to pass over in silence, 
personal to ourselves, it is true, but still good and weighty, which moves us to undertake this celebration. God, the author of every good, not long ago preserved our life by curing us of a dangerous disease. We now wish, by this increase of the honor paid to the Sacred Heart, that the memory of this great mercy should be brought prominently forward and our gratitude be publicly acknowledged. For these reasons, we ordain that on the ninth, tenth, and eleventh of the coming month of June, in the principal church of every town and village, certain appointed prayers be said, and on each of these days there be added to the other prayers the litany of the Sacred Heart approved by our authority. On the last day the form of consecration shall be recited, which, venerable brethren, we send to you with these letters. As the pledge of divine benefits and in token of our paternal benevolence to you and to the clergy and people committed to your care, we lovingly grant in the Lord the apostolic benediction. End of section 23《And yet, the end of the century does seem, by the divine mercy, to bring some hope and consolation. No one can doubt that the reawakened attention to spiritual things and the revival of piety and faith are helping to avert disaster. That there is a very general growth in these virtues at the present time, we have ample assurance. In the midst of the allurements of the world, and in spite of many obstacles in the path of piety, great multitudes, at the mere suggestion of the pontiff, flock from all sides to the threshold of the holy apostles, coming from far and near to show their devotion to their religion, and confiding in the preferred indulgences of the church to seek with eagerness the means of attaining their eternal salvation. Nor could any one fail to be moved by the extraordinary outburst of piety which has been displayed towards the Savior of mankind. The ardor with which so many thousands from all parts of the world have united in confessing the name of Jesus Christ and celebrating his praises is not unworthy of the best ages of the Christian faith. Would that this fire of the faith of our forefathers might leap into a conflagration. Would that the excellent example of so many might arouse the rest of the world. For the age needs more than anything else the restoration among the nations of the Christian spirit and the virtues of former days. It is a calamity that so many turn a deaf ear and hear not the admonition conveyed by such a reawakening of piety. If they knew the gift of God, if they considered that nothing more miserable could happen to them than to have revolted against the liberator of the world and to have abandoned the law and the life of Christianity, they would surely rouse themselves and hasten of their own accord to turn and flee from the destruction most certainly impending over them. To uphold on earth and to extend the empire of the Son of God, and to promote the salvation of men by the dissension of divine benefits, is so greatly and so peculiarly the office of the Church, that her authority and power rest mainly on the performance of this task. To this end, we trust we have labored to the best of our ability in the difficult and anxious administration of our pontificate. While it is your ordinary and, indeed, daily practice, venerable brethren, to give a special thought and care in the same work, but both you and we ought, in these times, to make still greater efforts, and in particular on the occasion of the Jubilee, to endeavor to spread more widely the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, by teaching, persuading, and exhorting, if perchance our voice may be heard, not only by those who are accustomed to hear Christian doctrine attentively, but also by the unhappy remainder, who, while nominally Christian, pass their lives without either faith in Christ or love for Him. For these especially we grieve, and these, in particular, we would fain have consider both what they are doing and whither they are sure to go, unless they repent in time. Never to have known Jesus Christ, in any way, is the greatest of misfortunes, but it involves no perversity or ingratitude. But, after having known, to reject or forget him is such a horrible and mad crime as to be scarcely credible, for he is the origin and source of all good. And just as mankind cannot be free from slavery, 
but by the sacrifice of Christ, so neither can it be preserved but by his power. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. What the life of men is from which Jesus has been expelled, Jesus, the power of God and the wisdom of God, what is its morality and its end, may be learned from the example of nations which have not the light of Christianity. Any one who recalls for a moment the mental blindness which St. Paul alludes to, the depravity of their nature, the abominable character of their vices and superstitions, must feel penetrated with horror, and, at the same time, with pity for them. What we here speak of is a matter of common knowledge, but not usually dwelt upon or thought of. There would not be so many alienated by pride or buried in sloth if they recollected what benefits they had received from God, what Christ has rescued them from, and to what he has brought them. Disinherited and exiled, the human race for ages was hurrying to destruction, enthralled by those dreadful evils which the sin of our first parents had begotten, and by other woes beyond the power of man to remedy, when Christ our Lord came down from heaven and appeared as our Redeemer. In the first dawn of the world's history, God himself had promised him to us, as the victor and conqueror of the serpent. Succeeding ages looked forward to his advent with eager longing. Holy prophets had long and plainly foretold that on him all our hopes depended. Nay, the various fortunes of the chosen people, their history and their institutions, their laws, their sacrifices and ceremonies, had clearly and distinctly prefigured that the salvation of humanity would be wrought and completed in him, who, it was declared, should be at once the high priest and propitiatory victim, the restorer of human liberty, the prince of peace, the teacher of all nations, founding a kingdom which should endure for ever. By these titles and under these images and prophetic utterances, various in kind, but agreeing in sense, he was designated as the one who, for the exceeding love wherewith he loved us, should one day give his life for our salvation. Accordingly, when the time of the divine counsel was ripe, the only begotten Son of God, being made man, offered an abundant and complete satisfaction for men to his offended father, and by so great a price redeemed and made the human race his own. You are not redeemed with corruptible things as gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb unspotted and undefiled. Accordingly, although all men, without exception, were already subject to his power and sway, because he is the creator and preserver of all, he made them his a second time, by redeeming them in the truest and most literal sense. You are not your own, for you are bought with a great price. Hence all things are re-established in Christ by God. The mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in him, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, to re-establish all things in Christ. So that when Jesus had blotted out the handwriting which was contrary to us, and fastened it to the cross, the wrath of heaven was immediately appeased. The disordered and erring race of man had the bonds of their ancient slavery loosened. The will of God was reconciled to them, grace restored, the way to eternal happiness opened, and the title to possess and the means of attaining it both given back. Then, as though awakened from a long-lingering and deadly lethargy, man beheld the light of truth no longer desired, but for generations sought in vain. He recognized in particular that he was born for much higher and more splendid things than the frail and fleeting objects of sense, to which he had formerly confined his thoughts and pursuits, and that this was in fine the constitution and supreme law of human life, and the end to which all must tend, that as we came from God, so we should one day return to him. From this beginning, and on this foundation, consciousness of human dignity was restored and lived again. The sense of a common brotherhood took possession of men's hearts. Their rights and duties in consequence were perfected or established anew, and virtues beyond the imagination or conception of ancient philosophy were revived. So men's purposes, tenor of life, and characters were changed. And the knowledge of the Redeemer, having spread far and wide, and his power having penetrated into the very lifeblood of nations, expelling their ignorance and their ancient vices, a marvelous transformation took place, which originating in Christian civilization utterly changed the face of the earth. In recalling these things, venerable brethren, there is an infinite sweetness experienced, but at the same time a serious warning is conveyed. 
namely to return thanks with our whole heart and soul and to see that others so far as in us lies return thanks to our divine saviour we live in an age remote from the inception and beginning of our redemption but what matters it since the power of redemption is perpetual and the benefits thereof are abiding and everlasting he who once restored our fallen nature preserves and will continue to reserve it he gave himself a redemption for all in christ all shall be made alive and of his kingdom there shall be no end thus according to the eternal counsel of god the salvation of all and each wholly depends on christ jesus those who forsake him in their blind fury seek by that very act their own personal destruction and at the same time as far as they can make society in general fall back into the very abyss of evils and disasters from which the redeemer out of his love had delivered mankind men wander very far in aimless air from the goal once they have entered upon devious paths likewise if the pure and unsullied light of truth be rejected men's minds must needs be buried in darkness and deceived by the depraved fancies that meet them at every step what hope can there be of health for those who forsake the fountain and source of life christ is alone the way the truth and the life and if we despise him we lose these three indispensable requisites of salvation there is no need to dilate upon what experience continually teaches and in his heart every one feels even when abounding in earthly goods that only in god can the heart of man find absolute and complete repose in very truth the end of man is god and the time we spend on earth is more truly likened and compared to a pilgrimage christ then is for us the way because from this mortal journeying of ours which is so especially toilsome and so beset with danger we can only attain to god our chief and final good with christ to guide and direct us no man cometh to the father but by me but by me that is to say first and chiefly by his grace yet if his precepts and laws are despised his grace is void as it behooves him to do when he has wrought our salvation jesus christ left us his law as the custodian and director of the human race so that under its guidance men might turn from evil ways and safely attain to god go teach ye all nations teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you keep my commandments by this we ought to understand that it is the chief and absolutely essential thing for those who confess christ to be docile to the precepts of jesus christ and to hold our will submissive and devoted to him as our lord and supreme ruler a great undertaking and frequently entailing a hard struggle and demanding much labor and steadiness of purpose for albeit human nature has been restored by the sacrifice of our redeemer yet there remains in every one a certain debility weakness and corruption various appetites drag a man hither and thither and the allurements of external things impel the soul to follow its own pleasure in place of christ's command but yet we must struggle and fight against our desires unto the obedience of christ and unless they are subservient to reason they become our masters and separating us from christ make us body and soul their slaves men corrupt in mind reprobate concerning the faith do not deliver themselves from slavery for they are slaves to three sorts of desires that of pleasure or pride of place or display of worldly pomp in this contest every one ought to be so disposed as to feel bound to take upon himself trouble and inconvenience for the sake of christ it is difficult to refuse things which so strongly attract and charm it is hard to despise qualities of body and earthly possessions in submission to the will and command of christ our lord but a christian must be always brave and strong to endure if he would pass his time of life like a christian have we forgotten what is the body of which we are members and who is our head he having joy set before him endured the cross and he has given us his precept to deny ourselves the very dignity of human nature depends on this disposition of mind of which we speak for as even the ancient philosophy often perceived it is not at all meanness of spirit to rule oneself and to make the lower part of nature obey the higher but it is rather a noble kind of virtue 
and is marvelously consistent with reason and human dignity. Besides, to suffer and to bear is the lot of humanity. Man can no more construct for himself a life free from pain and replete with every happiness than he can annul the counsels of his divine Creator, who has willed that the consequences of our fault should not remain in perpetuity. It is proper, therefore, not to look for an end of pain upon the earth, but to strengthen our mind to bear pain, which, in fact, educates us to the attainment of the greatest of all good things for which we hope. For it is not to wealth and luxury, nor to worldly honors and powers, that Christ has promised eternal happiness in heaven, but to patient suffering and tears, to the desire of justice and to cleanness of heart. Hence, it is easy to see what ought ultimately to be expected from the air and pride of those who, despising the supremacy of the Redeemer, give man the highest place, and hold that human nature should bear rule everywhere and in every case, although they can neither attain such control nor even define its nature. The kingdom of Jesus Christ obtains its form and virtue from divine charity. Holy and pure affection is its foundation and completion. The punctual observance of our duties necessarily follows, viz., not to wrong our neighbor, to esteem the earthly less than the heavenly, to set the love of God before all else. But the reign of man, either openly rejecting Christ or neglecting him, consists entirely in the love of self. Charity there is none, and self-immolation is ignored. Rule, indeed, man may but in Jesus Christ, and only on the condition that first of all he serves God, and religiously finds in his law the rule and discipline of life. By the law of Christ we mean not merely the natural precepts of morality, or what supernatural knowledge the ancient world acquired, all of which Jesus Christ perfected and raised to the highest plane by his explanation, interpretation, and ratification. But we mean, besides, all the doctrine, and in particular the institutions he has left us, of these the church is the chief indeed what institution of christ is there that she does not fully embrace and include by the ministry of the church so gloriously founded by him he willed to perpetuate the office assigned to him by his father and having on the one hand conferred upon her all effectual aids for human salvation he ordained with the utmost emphasis on the other that men should be subject to her as to himself and zealously follow her guidance in every department of life. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me. So the law of Christ is always to be sought from the church, and therefore as Christ is for man the way, so likewise the church is the way. He in himself, and by his proper nature, she by his commission, and by a share in his power. On this account, those who would strive for salvation apart from the church wander from the way and are struggling in vain. The case of governments is much the same as that of the individual. They also must run into fatal issues if they depart from the way. The creator and redeemer of human nature, the Son of God, is king and lord of the world and holds absolute sovereignty over men, both as individuals and as members of society. He hath given to him power and honor and dominion, and all peoples, tribes, and languages shall serve him. Yet am I established king by him. I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the ends of the earth for thy possession. Therefore the law of Christ ought to hold sway in human society, and in communities so far as to be the teacher and guide of public, no less than private life. This being divinely appointed and provided, no one may resist with impunity, and it fares ill with any commonwealth in which Christian institutions are not allowed their proper place. Let Jesus be excluded, and human reason is left without its greatest protection and illumination. The very notion is easily lost of the end for which God created human society, to wit, that by help of their civil union, the citizens should attain their natural good but nevertheless in a way not in conflict with that highest and most perfect and enduring good which is above nature. Their minds, busy with a hundred confused projects, rulers and subjects alike, travel a devious road, bereft as they are of safe guidance and fixed principles. Just as it is pitiable and calamitous to wander out of the way, so it is to desert the truth. But the first absolute and essential truth is Christ, the Word of God, 
consubstantial and co-eternal with the father who with the father is one i am the way and the truth accordingly if truth is sought let human reason first of all obey jesus christ and rest secure in his authoritative teaching because by christ's voice the truth itself speaks human intelligence has a wide field of its own in which to employ itself freely with investigation and experiment nature not only allows this but evidently requires it but it is a wicked thing and against nature for the mind to refuse to be confined within its own limitations to have no proper modesty and to scorn the authority of christ's teaching the doctrine on which our salvation altogether depends regards god and divine things that was not created by any man's wisdom but the son of god received it in its entirety from his father the words which thou gavest me i have given them accordingly it necessarily includes much that without being contrary to reason for that cannot possibly be is still beyond the reach of our mind as much as is the comprehension of god in his essential being but if there are so many things in nature itself which are mysterious and obscure and which no human intelligence can explain and yet which no one in his senses would presume to doubt it will be a perverse freedom of thought not to allow for things existing outside the domain of nature altogether which are above nature and beyond our minds to fathom to refuse to accept dogmas evidently means to do away with the whole christian religion the mind must be subjected humbly and submissively to the obedience of christ so as to be held as it were captive to his will and sovereignty bringing into captivity every understanding unto the obedience of christ such is the obedience which christ wills and rightfully to have offered to him inasmuch as he is god and has therefore supreme sovereignty over the understanding as well as over the will of man there is nothing servile in serving christ our lord with the understanding but it is especially consonant to reason and to our personal dignity for a man does not thus submit his will to the sovereignty of any fellow man but to that of god the creator and first cause of all to whom he is made subject by the law of nature nor does a man allow himself to be coerced by the imagination of any human teacher but by the eternal and immutable truth he attains at once the natural good of the mind and mental freedom for truth as proceeding from the authoritative teaching of christ sets in a clear light the intrinsic character and relative importance of things whatever they may be and thus instructed and obedient to the truth which he sees he will not subject himself to creatures but creatures to himself he will not let passion rule reason but will make reason rule passion casting off the pernicious slavery of sin and error he will be made free with the best kind of freedom you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free it is plain therefore that those whose minds refuse to acknowledge christ are obstinately striving against god having escaped from the divine subjection they will not thereby gain greater freedom but will come under some human authority they will choose indeed as men do someone to listen to to obey and to follow as their master besides this debarring themselves from theological studies and confining the exercise of their minds within a more circumscribed sphere they will come less efficiently trained to the consideration of subjects with which reason properly deals there are many things in nature on the investigation or explanation of which theology sheds considerable light and often to punish men's pride god suffers them to miss the truth so as to chastise them in the very thing in which they have sinned for one or other of these reasons very many men who seem endowed with great intellectual capacity and a profound erudition have nevertheless in their investigations of nature fallen into the most absurd and egregious mistakes it is certain therefore that in christianity the understanding should be wholly and unreservedly resigned to the divine authority if when reason thus submits our spiritual pride which is so strong in us suffers repression and feels pain that proves all the more that in a christian there ought to be patient endurance not merely of the will but of the mind as well and this we wish especially to note for those who dream of and openly prefer some discipline of thought and action in christianity with precepts less rigorous and more indulgent to human nature 
that would demand of us to put up with little or nothing. They have no notion of the spirit of faith and of Christian institutions. They do not see that the cross meets us everywhere as the standard of life and the banner under which we must always fight if we would follow Christ, not in name only, but in deed and in truth. God alone is life. All other beings partake of, but are not life. Moreover, from all eternity, and by his proper nature, Christ is the life equally as he is the truth, being God of God. From him, as from its ultimate and most august beginning, all life has flowed down upon the world, and will forever flow. All that is, has its being from him. All that lives, lives by him. For by the word, all things were made, and without him was nothing made that was made. So much for the natural life. But above we alluded to a much better and much more desirable life, won for us by the sacrifice of Christ, viz. the life of grace, the most blessed end of which is the life of glory, to which all our thoughts and actions should be referred. The whole meaning of Christian doctrine and precepts is that we being dead to sin should live to justice. That is to say, to virtue and holiness, in which the moral life of the soul consists with a well-founded hope of everlasting happiness. But justice, in its true and proper sense, the justice which attains to salvation, is fed by Christian faith, and by that alone. The just man liveth by faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God. It follows that Jesus Christ, who is the author and parent and upholder of faith, maintains and supports our moral life chiefly by the ministry of the Church. To her administration, in keeping with his benign and most provident purpose, he has committed the appropriate means of generating and preserving the virtue of which we speak, and of reviving it when dead. The force, then, which generates and conserves the virtues necessary to salvation, disappears when morality is divorced from divine faith. And truly, those who would have morals directed in the path of virtue, by the sole authority of reason, rob man of his highest dignity, and most perniciously deprive him of his supernatural life, and throw him back on the merely natural. Not that man is unable to recognize and observe many natural precepts by the light of reason, but even if he recognize and observe them all without stumbling for the whole of his life, which without the grace of our Redeemer helping him, he could not do, Yet vain would be his confidence of obtaining eternal salvation, if destitute of faith. If any one abide not in me, he shall cast forth as a branch, and shall wither, and they shall gather him up, and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. He that believeth not shall be condemned. How little that kind of virtue which despises faith avails in the end, and what sort of fruit it brings forth, we see only too plainly. Why is it that with so much zeal displayed for establishing and augmenting the commonwealth, nations still have to labor, and yet in so many and such important matters, fare worse and worse every day? They say indeed that civil society is self-dependent, that it can go on happily without the protection of Christian institutions, that by its own unaided energies it can reach its goal. Hence they prefer to have public affairs conducted on a secular basis, so that in civil discipline and public life there are always fewer and fewer traces discernible of the old religious spirit. They do not see what they are doing. Take away the supremacy of God, who judges right and wrong, and law necessarily loses its paramount authority, while at the same time justice is undermined, these two being the strongest and most essential bonds of social union. In the same way, when the hope and expectation of immortality are gone, it is only human to seek greedily after perishable things, and every one will try, in proportion to his power, to clutch a larger share of them. Hence spring jealousies, envies, hatreds, the most iniquitous plots to overthrow all power, and mad schemes of universal ruin are formed. There is no peace abroad, nor security at home, and social life is made hideous by crime. In such strife of passions, in such impending perils, we must either look for utter ruin, or some effective remedy must be found without delay. To restrain evildoers, to soften the manners of our populations, to deter them from committing crimes of legislative intervention, is right and necessary, but that is by no means all. The healing of the nations goes deeper, a mightier influence must be invoked than human endeavor, 
one that may touch the conscience and reawaken the sense of duty, the same influence that has once already delivered from destruction a world overwhelmed with far greater evils. Do away with the obstacles to the spirit of Christianity, revive and make it strong in the state, and the state will be recreated. The strife between high and low will at once be appeased, and each will observe with mutual respect the rights of the other. If they listen to Christ, the prosperous and the unfortunate will both alike remember their duty. The one will feel that they must keep justice and charity, if they would be saved, the other that they must show temperance and moderation. Domestic society will have been solidly established under a solitary fear of the divine commands and prohibitions, and so likewise in society at large, the precepts of the natural law will prevail, which tells us that it is right to respect lawful authority and to obey the laws, to do no seditious act, nor contrive anything by unlawful association. Thus, when Christian law exerts its power without being thwarted in any way, naturally and without effort the order of society is maintained as constituted by divine providence, and prosperity and public safety are secured. The security of the state demands that we should be brought back to him from whom we ought never to have departed, to whom who is the way, the truth, and the life, not as individuals merely, but as human society through all its extent. Christ our Lord must be reinstated as the ruler of human society. It belongs to him as to all its members. All the elements of the commonwealth, legal commands and prohibitions, popular institutions, schools, marriage, home life, the workshop, and the palace, all must be made to come to that fountain and imbibe the life that comes from him. No one should fail to see that on this largely depends the civilization of nations, which is so eagerly sought, but which is nourished and augmented not so much by bodily comforts and conveniences as by what belongs to the soul, viz. commendable lives and the cultivation of virtue. Many are estranged from Jesus Christ, rather through ignorance than perversity. Many study man and the universe around him with all earnestness, but very few study the Son of God. Let it be the first endeavor, then, to dispel ignorance by knowledge, so that he may not be despised or rejected as unknown. We call upon Christians everywhere to labor diligently to the utmost of their power to know their Redeemer. Any one who regards them with a sincere and candid mind will clearly perceive that nothing can be more salutary than his law, or more divine than his doctrine. In this, your authority and cooperation, venerable brethren, will marvelously assist, as will also the zeal and assiduity of the clergy at large. Think it the chief part of your duty to engrave in the hearts of your people the true knowledge, and, we might also say, the image of Jesus Christ, and to illustrate in your letters, your discourses, your schools and colleges, your public assemblies, whenever occasion serves, his charity, his benefits and institutions. About the rights of man, as they are called, the multitude has heard enough. It is time they should hear of the rights of God. That the present is a suitable time is shown by the good impulses of many which have already, as we have said, been awakened, and in particular by the many evidences which have been given of piety towards the Redeemer, a piety which, if it please God, we shall hand down to the next century with the promise of a better age. But as the matter in hand is one in which success can only be looked for through divine grace, let us with a common impulse and with earnest prayers invoke the mercy of Almighty God, that he would not suffer those to perish whom he has freed by shedding his blood, that he would graciously regard this age, which has, indeed, been grievously remiss, but has suffered much and bitterly, too, in expiation of its sins, and that he would, benignantly embracing all peoples and classes of men, remember the word which he spoke. If I be lifted up from the earth... I will draw all things to myself. In promise of divine gifts, and in witness of our paternal benevolence, venerable brethren, we impart to your clergy and people, most lovingly in the Lord, our apostolic benediction. End of section 24《Section 25 of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian Democracy Apostolic Letter Graves de Communi 
january eighteenth nineteen o one the grave discussions on economical questions which for some time past have disturbed the peace of several countries of the world are growing in frequency and intensity to such a degree that the minds of thoughtful men are filled and rightly so with worry and alarm these discussions take their rise in the bad philosophical and ethical teaching which is now widespread among the people the changes also which the mechanical inventions of the age have introduced the rapidity of communication between places and the devices of every kind for diminishing labor and increasing gain all add bitterness to the strife and lastly matter have been brought to such a pass by the struggle between capital and labor fomented as it is by professional agitators that the countries where these disturbances most frequently occur find themselves confronted with ruin and disaster at the very beginning of our pontificate we clearly pointed out what the peril was which confronted society on this head and we deemed it our duty to warn catholics in unmistakable language how great the error was which was lurking in the utterances of socialism and how great the danger was that threatened not only their temporal possessions but also their morality and religion that was the purpose of our encyclical letter quod apostolici muneres which we published on the twenty eighth of december in the year eighteen seventy eight but as these dangers day by day threaten still greater disaster both to individuals and the commonwealth we strove with all the more energy to avert them this was the object of our encyclical rerum novarum of the fifteenth may eighteen ninety one in which we dwelt at length on the rights and duties which both classes of society those namely who control capital and those who contribute labor are bound in relation to each other and at the same time we made it evident that the remedies which are most useful to protect the cause of religion and to terminate the contest between the different classes of society were to be found in the precepts of the gospel nor with god's grace were our hopes entirely frustrated even those who are not catholics moved by the power of truth avow that the church must be credited with a watchful eye over all classes of society and especially those whom fortune has least favored catholics of course profited abundantly by these letters for they not only received encouragement and strength for the admirable enterprises in which they were engaged but also obtained the light which they desired by the help of which they were able with greater safety and with more plentiful blessings to continue the efforts which they had been making in the matter of which we are now speaking hence it happened that the differences of opinion which prevailed among them were either removed or their acrimony diminished and the discussion laid aside in the work which they had undertaken this was effected viz that in their efforts for the elevation of the poorer classes especially in those places where the trouble is greatest many new enterprises were set on foot those which were already established were increased and all reaped the blessing of a greater stability imparted to them some of these works were called bureaus of the people their object being to supply information rural savings banks had been established and various associations some for mutual aid others of relief were organized there were working men's societies and other enterprises for work or beneficence thus under the auspices of the church united action of catholics was secured as well as wise discrimination exercised in the distribution of help for the poor who were often as badly dealt with by chicanery and exploitation of their necessities as they were oppressed by indigence and toil these schemes of popular benevolence were at first distinguished by no particular appellation the name of christian socialism with its derivatives which was adopted by some was very properly allowed to fall into this use afterwards some asked to have it called the popular christian movement in the countries most concerned with this matter there are some who are known as christian socialists elsewhere the movement is described as christian democracy and its partisans christian democrats in contradistinction to those who are designated as socialists and whose system is known as social democracy not much exception is taken to the former i e christian socialism but many excellent men find the term christian democracy objectionable they hold it to be very ambiguous and for this reason open to two objections it seems by implication to convertly favor popular government and to disparage other methods of political administration 
secondly it appears to belittle religion by restricting its scope to the care of the poor as if the other sections of society were not of its concern more than that under the shadow of its name there might easily lurk a design to attack all legitimate power either civil or sacred wherefore since this discussion is now so widespread so exaggerated and so bitter the consciousness of duty warns us to put a check on this controversy and to define what catholics are to think on this matter we also propose to describe how the movement may extend its scope and be made more useful to the commonwealth what social democracy is and what christian democracy ought to be assuredly no one can doubt the first with due consideration to the greater or less intemperance of its utterance is carried to such an excess by many as to maintain that there is really nothing existing above the natural order of things and that the acquirement and enjoyment of corporal and external goods constitutes man's happiness it aims at putting all government in the hands of the people reducing all ranks to the same level abolishing all distinction of class and finally introducing community of goods hence the right of ownership is to be abrogated and whatever property a man possesses or whatever means of livelihood he has is to be common to all as against this christian democracy by the fact that it is christian is built and necessarily so on the basic principles of divine faith and provides for the betterment of the masses with the ulterior motive of availing itself of the occasion to fashion their minds for things which are everlasting hence for christian democracy justice is sacred it must maintain that the right of acquiring and possessing property cannot be impugned and it must safeguard the various distinctions and degrees which are indispensable in every well-ordered commonwealth finally it must endeavor to preserve in every human society the form and the character which god ever impresses on it it is clear therefore that there is nothing in common between social and christian democracy they differ from each other as much as the sect of socialism differs from the profession of christianity moreover it would be a crime to distort this name of christian democracy to politics for although democracy both in its philological and philosophical significations implies popular government yet in its present application it is so to be employed that removing from it all political significance it is to mean nothing else than a benevolent and christian movement in behalf of the people for the laws of nature and of the gospel which by right are superior to all human contingencies are necessarily independent of all modifications of civil government while at the same time they are in concord with everything that is not repugnant to morality and justice they are therefore and they must remain absolutely free from political parties and have nothing to do with the various changes of administration which may occur in a nation so that catholics may and ought to be citizens according to the constitution of any state guided as they are by those laws which command them to love god above all things and their neighbors as themselves this has always been the discipline of the church the roman pontiffs acted upon this principle whenever they dealt with different countries no matter what might be the character of their governments hence the mind and the action of catholics who are devoted to the amelioration of the working classes can never be actuated with the purpose of favoring and introducing one government in place of another in the same manner from christian democracy we must remove another possible subject of reproach namely that while looking after the advantage of the working people they should act in such a manner as to forget the upper classes of society for they also are of the greatest use in preserving and perfecting the commonwealth as we have explained the christian law of charity will prevent us from so doing for it extends to all classes of society and all should be treated as members of the same family as children of the same heavenly father as redeemed by the same saviour and called to the same eternal heritage hence the doctrine of the apostle who warns us that we are one body and one spirit called to the one hope in our vocation one lord one faith and one baptism one god and the father of all who is above all and through all and in us all wherefore on account of the nature of the union which exists between the different classes of society and which christian brotherhood makes still closer it follows that no matter how great our devotion may be in helping the people we should all the more keep our hold upon the upper classes because association with them is proper and necessary as we shall explain later on for the happy issue of the work in which we are engaged let there be no question of fostering under this name of christian democracy any intention of diminishing the spirit of obedience 
or of withdrawing people from their lawful rulers both the natural and the christian law command us to revere those who in their various grades are above us in the state and to submit ourselves to their just commands it is quite in keeping with our dignity as men and christians to obey not only exteriorly but from the heart as the apostle expresses it for conscience sake when he commands us to keep our souls subject to the higher powers it is abhorrent to the profession of a christian for any one to be unwilling to be subject and obedient to those who rule in the church and first of all to the bishops whom without prejudice to the universal power of the roman pontiff the holy ghost has placed to rule the church of god which christ has purchased by his blood he who thinks or acts otherwise is guilty of ignoring the grave precept of the apostle who bids us to obey our rulers and to be subject to them for they watch having to give an account of our souls let the faithful everywhere implant these principles deep in their souls and put them in practice in their daily life and let the ministers of the gospel meditate them profoundly and incessantly labor not merely by exhortation but especially by example to make them enter into the souls of others we have recalled these matters which on other occasions we have made the subject of our instructions in the hope that all dissension about the name of christian democracy will cease and that all suspicion of any danger coming from what the name signifies will be put at rest and with reason we do hope so for neglecting the opinions of certain men with regard to the power and the efficacy of this kind of christian democracy which at times are exaggerated and are not free from error let no one however condemn that zeal which according to the natural and divine law has this for its object viz to make the condition of those who toil more tolerable to enable them to obtain little by little those means by which they may provide for the future to help them to practice in public and in private the duties which morality and religion inculcate to aid them to feel that they are not animals but men not heathens but christians and so to enable them to strive more zealously and more eagerly for the one thing which is necessary viz that ultimate good for which we are all born into this world this is the intention this is the work of those who wish that the people should be animated by christian sentiments and should be protected from the contamination of socialism which threatens them we have designedly made mention here of virtue and religion for it is the opinion of some and the air is already very common that the social question is merely an economic one whereas in point of fact it is above all a moral and religious matter and for that reason must be settled by the principles of morality and according to the dictates of religion for even though wages are doubled and the hours of labor are shortened and food is cheapened yet if the working man hearkens to the doctrines that are taught on this subject as he is prone to do and is prompted by the examples set before him to throw off respect for god and to enter upon a life of immorality his labors and his gain will avail him not trial and experience have made it abundantly clear that many a workman lives in cramped and miserable quarters in spite of his shorter hours and larger wages simply because he has cast aside the restraints of morality and religion take away the instinct which christian virtue has planted and nurtured in men's hearts take away prudence temperance frugality patience and other correct natural habits no matter how much he may strive he will never achieve prosperity that is the reason why we have incessantly exhorted catholics to enter these associations for bettering the condition of the laboring classes and to organize other undertakings with the same object in view but we have likewise warned them that all this should be done under the auspices of religion with its help and under its guidance the zeal of catholics on behalf of the masses is especially noteworthy by the fact that it is engaged in the very field in which under the benign inspiration of the church the active industry of charity has always labored adapting itself in all cases to the varying exigencies of the times for the law of mutual charity perfects as it were the law of justice not merely by giving each man his due and in not impeding him in the exercise of his rights but also by befriending him in case of need not with the word alone or the lips but in deed and in truth being mindful of what christ so lovingly said to his own a new commandment i give unto you 
that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you love also one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for the other. This zeal in coming to the rescue of our fellow men should, of course, be solicitous, first for the imperishable good of the soul, but it must not neglect what is necessary and helpful for the body. We should remember what Christ said to the disciples of the Baptists who asked him, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? He invoked, as the proof of the mission given to him among men, his exercise of charity, quoting for them the text of Isaiah, The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise again, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And speaking also of the last judgment and of the rewards and punishments he will assign, he declared that he would take special account of the charity men exercised towards each other. And in that discourse there is one thing that especially excites our surprise, viz., that Christ omits those works of mercy which comfort the soul, and refers only to external works, which, although done in behalf of men, he regards as being done to himself. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you covered me. Sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. To the teachings which enjoin the twofold charity of spiritual and corporal works, Christ adds his own example, so that no one may fail to recognize the importance which he attaches to it. In the present instance, we recall the sweet words that came from his paternal heart, I have pity on the multitude, as well as the desire he had to assist them, even if it were necessary to invoke his miraculous power. Of his tender compassion we have the proclamation made in holy writ, viz., that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil. This law of charity, which he imposed upon his apostles, they in the most holy and zealous way put into practice. And after them, those who embraced Christianity originated that wonderful variety of institutions for alleviating all the miseries by which mankind is afflicted. And these institutions carried on and continually increased their powers of relief and were the especial glories of Christianity, and of the civilization of which it was the source, so that right-minded men never fail to admire these foundations, aware as they are of the proneness of men to concern themselves about their own, and neglect the needs of others. Nor are we to eliminate from the list of good works the giving of money for charity, in pursuance of what Christ has said, but yet that which remaineth give alms. Against this, the socialist cries out and demands this abolition as injurious to the native dignity of man. But if it is done in the manner which the scripture enjoins, and in conformity with the true Christian spirit, it neither connotes pride in the giver, nor inflicts shame upon the one who receives. Far from being dishonorable for the man, it draws closer the bonds of human society by augmenting the force of the obligation of the duties which men are under with regard to each other. No one is so rich that he does not need another's help, no one so poor as not to be useful in some way to his fellow man, and the disposition to ask assistance from others with confidence and to grant it with kindness is part of our very nature. Thus justice and charity are so linked with each other under the equable and sweet law of Christ as to form an admirable cohesive power in human society and to lead all of its members to exercise a sort of providence in looking after their own, and in seeking the common good as well. As regards not merely the temporary aid given to the laboring classes, but the establishment of permanent institutions in their behalf, it is most commendable for charity to undertake them. It will thus see that more certain and more reliable means of assistance will be afforded to the necessitous. That kind of help is especially worthy of recognition, which forms the minds of mechanics and laborers to thrift and foresight, so that in course of time they may be able, in part at least, to look out for themselves. To aim at that is not only to dignify the duty of the rich towards the poor, but to elevate the poor themselves. For while it urges them to work for a better degree of comfort in their manner of living, it preserves them, meantime, from danger by checking extravagances in their desires, and acts as a spur in the practice of the virtues proper to their state. 
since therefore this is of such great avail and so much in keeping with the spirit of the times it is a worthy object for charity to undertake with all prudence and zeal let it be understood therefore that this devotion of catholics to comfort and elevate the mass of the people is in keeping with the spirit of the church and is most conformable to the examples which the church has always held up for imitation it matters very little whether it goes under the name of the popular christian movement or christian democracy if the instructions that have been given by us be fully carried out with the submission that is due but it is of the greatest importance that catholics should be one in mind will and action in a matter of such great moment and it is also of importance that the influence of these undertakings should be extended by the multiplication of men and means devoted to the same object especially must there be appeals to the kindly assistance of those whose rank worldly wealth and culture give them importance in the community if their help is excluded scarcely anything can be done which will be of any assistance for the wants which now clamour for satisfaction in this matter of the well-being of the people assuredly the more earnestly many of those who are prominent in the state conspire effectively to attain that object the quicker and surer will the end be reached we wish them to understand that they are not at all free to look after or neglect those who happen to be beneath them but that it is a strict duty which binds them for no one lives only for his personal advantage in a community he lives for the common good as well so that when others cannot contribute their share for the general object those who can do so are obliged to make up the deficiency the very extent of the benefits they have received increases the burden of their responsibility and a stricter account will have to be rendered to god who bestowed those blessings upon them what should also urge all to the fulfillment of their duty in this regard is the widespread disaster which will eventually fall upon all classes of society if this assistance does not arrive in time and therefore is it that he who neglects the cause of the distressed poor is not doing his duty to himself or to the state if this social movement extends its scope far and wide in a true christian fashion and grows in its proper and genuine spirit there will be no danger as is feared that those other institutions which the piety of our ancestors have established and which are now flourishing will decline or be absorbed by new foundations both of them spring from the same root of charity and religion and not only do not conflict with each other but can be made to coalesce and combine so perfectly as to provide by a union of their benevolent resources in a more efficacious manner against the graver perils and necessities of the people which confront us to-day the condition of things at present proclaims and proclaims vehemently that there is need for a union of brave minds with all the resources they can command the harvest of misery is before our eyes and the dreadful projects of the most disastrous national upheavals are threatening us from the growing power of the socialistic movement they have insidiously worked their way into the very heart of the state and in the darkness of their secret gatherings and in the open light of day in their writings and their harangues they are urging the masses onward to sedition they fling aside religious discipline they scorn duties and clamour only for rights they are working incessantly on the multitudes of the needy which daily grow greater and which because of their poverty are easily deluded and hurried off into ways that are evil it is equally the concern of the state and the religion and all good men esteem it a sacred honour to preserve and guard both in the honour which is their due that this most desirable agreement of wills should be maintained it is essential that all refrain from giving any causes of dissension and in hurting and alienating the minds of others hence in newspapers and in speeches to the people let them avoid subtle and useless questions which are neither easy to solve nor to understand except by minds of unusual ability and only after the most serious study it is quite natural for people to think differently in doubtful questions but those who address themselves to these subjects in a proper spirit will preserve their mental calm and not forget the respect which is due to those who differ from them if minds see thing in another light it is not necessary to become alienated forthwith to whatever opinion a man's judgment may incline if the matter is yet open to discussion 
let him keep it, provided his mental attitude is such that he is ready to yield if the Holy See should otherwise decide. This Catholic action, of whatever description it may be, will work with greater effect if all of the various associations, while preserving their individual rights, move together under one primary and directive force. In Italy, we desire that this directive force should emanate from the Catholic Congresses and reunions so often praised by us, to further which our predecessor and we ourselves have ordered that these meetings should be controlled and guided by the bishops of the country. So let it be for other nations, in case there be any leading organization of this description to which this matter has been legitimately entrusted. Now, in all questions of this sort, where the interests of the Church and the Christian people are so closely allied, it is evident what they who are in the sacred ministry should do, and it is clear how industrious they should be in inculcating right doctrine and in teaching the duties of prudence and charity. To go out and move among the people, to exert a healthy influence on them by adapting themselves to the present condition of things, is what more than once, in addressing the clergy, we have advised. More frequently also in writing to the bishops and other dignitaries of the Church, and especially of late, to the Minister General of the Minorites, November twenty fifth, 1898, we have lauded this affectionate solicitude for the people, and declared it to be the especial duty of both the secular and regular clergy. But in the fulfillment of this obligation, let there be the greatest caution and prudence exerted, and let it be done after the fashion of the saints. Francis, who was poor and humble, Vincent of Paul, the father of the afflicted classes, and very many others whom the church keeps ever in her memory, will want to lavish their care upon the people, but in such wise as not to be engrossed overmuch, or to be unmindful of themselves, or to let it prevent them from laboring with the same assiduity in the perfection of their own soul and the cultivation of virtues. There remains one thing upon which we desire to insist very strongly, in which not only the ministers of the gospel, but also all those who are devoting themselves to the cause of the people, can with very little difficulty bring about a most commendable result. That is to inculcate in the minds of the people, in a brotherly way, and whenever the opportunity presents itself, the following principles, viz. to keep aloof on all occasions from seditious acts and seditious men, to guard and violate the rights of others, to show a proper respect to superiors, to willingly perform the work in which they are employed, not to grow weary of the restraint of family life, which in many ways is so advantageous, to keep to their religious practices above all, and in their hardships and trials to have recourse to the church for consolation. In the furtherance of all this, it is very efficacious to propose the splendid example of the Holy Family of Nazareth, and to advise the invocation of its protection and it also helps to remind the people of the examples of sanctity which have shown in the midst of poverty, and to hold up before them the reward that awaits them in the better life to come. Finally, we recur again to what we have already declared, and we insist upon it most solemnly, viz., that whatever projects individuals or associations form, in this matter should be done with due regard to Episcopal authority, and absolutely under Episcopal guidance. Let them not be led astray by any excessive zeal in the cause of charity. If it leaves them to be wanting in proper submission, it is not a sincere zeal. It will not have any useful result, and cannot be acceptable to God. God delights in the souls of those who put aside their own designs and obey the rulers of his church as if they were obeying him. He assists them even when they attempt difficult things, and benignly leads them to their desired end. Let them show also examples of virtue, so as to prove that a Christian is a hater of idleness and indulgence, that he gives willingly from his goods for the help of others, and that he stands firm and unconquered in the midst of adversity. Examples of that kind have a power of moving people to dispositions of soul that make for salvation, and have all the greater force as the condition of those who give them is higher in the social scale. We exhort you, venerable brethren, to provide for all this, as the necessities of men and of places may require, according to your prudence and your zeal, meeting as usual in council to combine with each other in your plans for the furtherance of these projects. 
let your solicitude watch and let your authority be effective in controlling compelling and also in preventing lest any one under the pretext of good should cause the vigor of sacred discipline to be relaxed or the order which christ has established in his church to be disturbed thus by the correct concurrent and ever-increasing labor of all catholics the truth will flash out more brilliantly than ever viz that truth and true prosperity flourish especially among those peoples whom the church controls and influences and that she holds it as her sacred duty to admonish every one of what the law of god enjoins to unite the rich and the poor in the bonds of fraternal charity and to lift up and strengthen men's souls in the times when adversity presses heavily upon them let our commands and our wishes be confirmed by the words which are so full of apostolic charity which the blessed paul addressed to the romans i beseech you therefore brethren be reformed in the newness of your mind he that giveth with simplicity he that roweth with carefulness he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness let love be without dissimulation hating that which is evil clinging to that which is good loving one another with the charity of brotherhood with honor preventing one another in carefulness not slothful rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation instant in prayer communicating to the necessities of the saints pursuing hospitality rejoice with them that rejoice weep with them that weep being of one mind to one another to no man rendering evil for evil, providing good things not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. As a pledge of these benefits, receive the apostolic benediction, which, venerable brethren, we grant most lovingly in the Lord to you and your clergy and people. End of section 25section twenty six of the great encyclical letters of pope leo the thirteenth this librivox recording is in the public domain the religious congregations in france one letter from the pope to the archbishop of paris december twenty third nineteen hundred amid the consolations afforded us during the holy year by the pious eagerness of the pilgrims who have flocked to rome from all parts of the world we have been struck with sadness at the news of the dangers which threaten the religious congregations in france by dint of misunderstanding and prejudice it has come to be thought that it will be necessary for the good of the state to put restraints upon their liberty and perhaps to proceed against them with even greater rigour the duty of our supreme ministry and the deep affection which we bear for france leads us to address you on this grave and important subject in the hope that on being better enlightened upright and fair-minded men will hearken back to more equitable counsels and in addressing you we address also our venerable brethren your colleagues in the french episcopate in the name of the heavy cares which you share with us it is for you to dissipate the prejudice which exists among your countrymen and to prevent as far as possible any irreparable misfortunes befalling the church and france origin and object the religious orders, as every one knows, have their origin and the reason of their existence in those sublime evangelical counsels which our divine Redeemer gave to those who, in every succeeding age, would attain to Christian perfection. To those brave and generous souls who, by prayer and contemplation, by pious austerities and the observance of certain rules, endeavor to climb to the highest summits of the spiritual life. Born and cradled under the action of the Church, whose authority gives sanction to their government and administration, the religious orders form a chosen portion of the flock of Jesus Christ. They are, according to the expression of St. Chrysostom, the honor and ornament of spiritual grace, whilst, at the same time, they are a witness to the sacred fecundity of the Church. Their vows, made freely and spontaneously, after ripening in the meditations of the novitiate, have ever been regarded and respected by people in every age, as sacred things and the sources of the rarest virtue their object is twofold first the raising of those who take them to a higher degree of perfection and secondly by purifying and strengthening their souls to prepare them for a ministry which is exercised for the everlasting salvation of their neighbour and for the alleviation of the numberless miseries of humanity thus working under the supreme direction of the apostolic see 
for the realization of the ideal of perfection traced by our lord and living under rules which have nothing in contradiction of any form of civil government the religious congregations cooperate on a large scale in the mission of the church which consists essentially in the sanctification of souls and in doing good to men this is why wherever the church is in possession of her liberty wherever the natural right of a citizen to choose the sort of life he considers best suited to his taste and his moral advancement is respected there too the religious orders have arisen as a spontaneous product of catholic soil and the bishops have rightly regarded them as valuable auxiliaries in the sacred ministry and in works of christian charity services to civil society but it is not to the church alone that the religious orders have from their first appearance rendered immense services they have benefited also civil society itself they have had the merit of preaching virtue to the multitude by the apostolate of good example as well as by that of word of mouth of forming and adorning men's minds by the teaching of sacred and profane knowledge and of enlarging the heritage of the fine arts by splendid works that will live whilst their doctors shed renown on the universities by the depths and breadth of their learning and their houses became the refuge of divine and human knowledge and in the shipwreck of civilization saved from certain destruction the masterpieces of ancient wisdom other religious have penetrated in hospitable regions swamps or tangled forests and there braving every danger in draining and clearing and cultivating the land by the sweat of their brow they found it round their monasteries and beneath the shadow of the cross centres of population which grew into villages and flourishing towns whence under a kindly rule agriculture and industry began to spread abroad when the small number of priests or the needs of the day demanded it legions of apostles eminent for their piety and learning were seen issuing forth from the cloisters who by their valiant cooperation with the bishops exerted the happiest influence on society by putting an end to feuds stifling enmity bringing people back to the thought of duty and by setting up again in honor the principles of religion and christian civilization such briefly indicated are the merits of the religious orders in the past they have been registered by the hand of impartial history and it is superfluous to dwell on them at any greater length nor is their activity their zeal or their love of their fellow men diminished in our own day the good that they do strikes every eye and their virtues shine with a brilliance which no accusation no attack can tarnish in this noble arena in which the religious congregations vie with each other in beneficent activity those of france we say it again with joy occupy a foremost and honourable place some devoted to teaching instruct the young in secular knowledge and the principles of religious virtue and duty upon which public peace and the welfare of states absolutely depend others consecrated to various works of charity afford effective aid to every physical and moral misery in the numberless houses wherein they tend the sick the infirm and the aged the orphan the deranged and the incurable without allowing the danger or unpleasantness of their work or the ingratitude they may meet with to dampen their courage or check their ardour these meritorious services recognized again and again by men above any suspicion of favouritism and time after time rewarded by public honours make these congregations the glory of the church at large and the particular and shining glory of france which they have ever nobly served in which they love as we have many times seen with a patriotism that fear not to face death itself with joy the disappearance of these champions of christian charity would it is evident bring on the country an irreparable loss by the drying up of such an abundant source of voluntary aid public misery would be notably increased and at the same time an eloquent preaching of brotherhood and concord would be silenced the society in which so many elements of trouble and enmity are fermenting needs assuredly great examples of self-sacrifice love and disinterestedness and what is better fitted to raise and pacify men's minds than the sight of these men and women who giving up a happy distinguished and oftentimes an illustrious position voluntarily make themselves the brothers and sisters of the children of the people practising in their regard true equality by utterly devoting themselves to the disinherited the abandoned and the suffering so admirable is the activity of the french congregations that it could not be kept within the frontiers of the country but has gone forth to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth and with the gospel the name the language and the prestige of france exiles of their own free will 
the french missionaries go out across stormy sea and sandy desert seeking to gain souls for christ in the most distant and often unexplored regions they are seen settling among savage tribes in order to civilize them by teaching the elements of christianity the love of god and their neighbors work regard for the weak and cleanly living and they devote themselves to this without looking for any earthly reward even till death which is often hastened by fatigue the difficulties of the church or the sword of the executioner respecting the laws and submissive to the civil authorities they bring with them wherever they come civilization and peace their only ambition is to enlighten the less fortunate people to whom they devote themselves and to lead them to christian morality and to a knowledge of their dignity as men nor is it an uncommon thing for them to make important contribution to science by the help they give to the researches which are being made in such different domains as a study of the differences of race and tongue of history the nature and products of the soil and other questions it is moreover precisely upon the laborious patient and tireless action of these admirable missionaries that the protectorate of france is founded which government after government has always been jealous to preserve and which we ourselves have publicly acknowledged the inviolable attachment of the french missionaries to their country the eminent services which they render her the great influence which they secure for her especially in the east all these are facts recognized by men of the most varied opinions and only lately solemnly proclaimed by the voice of the highest authority under these circumstances to deprive the religious congregations at home of the freedom and peace which alone can ensure the recruiting of their members and the long and laborious task of their training would not only be to requite so many great services with inexplicable gratitude but would also at the same time be a clear renunciation of the benefits that flow from them other nations have already had sorry experience of such a policy after having checked the expansion of the religious congregations at home and so gradually dried up their seed they have seen their own influence and prestige abroad proportionately decline for it is useless to seek fruit of a tree from which you lop the branches it is easy to see that all the great interests at stake in this question would be seriously compromised even if the missionary orders were spared that the others might be struck for careful consideration shows that the existence and action of the one are bound up with the existence and action of the others as a matter of fact the vocation of the missionary religious germinates and develops under the word of the preacher religious under the pious direction of the teaching religious and even under the supernatural influence of the contemplative religious one can imagine too the difficult situation in which the missionaries would be placed and the decline of their authority and prestige which would follow on the people whom they are seeking to evangelize learning that the religious congregations far from meeting with protection and respect in their own country were there treated with hostility and harshness but looking at the question from a higher standpoint we may point out that the religious congregations as we have already said represent the public practice of christian perfection and if it be certain that there are in the church and always will be elect souls aspiring to it under the influence of grace it would be unjust to hinder their designs it would moreover be an assault on the liberty of the church which is in france guaranteed by a solemn treaty for everything that hinders her from leading souls to perfection injures the free exercise of her divine mission to strike at the religious orders would be to deprive the church of devoted cooperators at home where there are the necessary auxiliaries of the bishops and clergy and the exercise of the sacred ministry and the function of catholic teaching and preaching which the church has the right and the duty of dispensing and which is demanded by the conscience of the faithful and abroad where the general interests of the apostolate and its chief power in all parts of the world are for the greater part represented by the french congregations the blow which struck them would be felt everywhere and the holy see bound by a divine command to provide for the spread of the gospel would find itself under the necessity of offering no opposition to the occupation of the vacancies left by french missionaries for the missionaries of other nations lastly we should point out that to strike the religious congregations would be to forsake to one's own undoing those democratic principles of liberty and equality which form the very foundations of constitutional right in france and guarantee the individual and collective liberty of every citizen so long as his actions and manner of living have an honest aim which in no way injures the rights and legitimate interests of any one 
Now, in a state of such advanced civilization as that of France, we refuse to think that there is neither protection nor respect for a class of citizens who are honest, peaceable, and devoted to their country, who, possessing all the rights and fulfilling all the duties of their fellow countrymen, have, either in the vows they make or the life they lead, no other end in view but to work for the perfection of their own souls and the good of their neighbor. They only ask for liberty, and the measures taken against them would appear to be all the more unjust and odious, since societies of quite another sort receive at the same time a treatment altogether different. Of course we are not unaware that as a justification for these rigors there are people who go about declaring that the religious congregations encroach upon the jurisdiction of the bishops and interfere with the rights of the secular clergy. This assertion cannot be sustained if one cares to consult the wise laws published on this point by the Church and which we have recently reenacted. In perfect harmony with the decrees and spirit of the Council of Trent, they regulate on the one hand the conditions of existence of persons vowed to the practice of the evangelical councils and to the apostolate, and on the other they respect as far as is necessary the authority of the bishops in their respective dioceses. Whilst they safeguard the dependence due to the head of the church, they also, in a majority of cases, give to the bishop supreme authority over the congregations by way of delegation apostolic. As for the attempts to make out that the episcopate and clergy of France are disposed to give a favorable welcome to the ostracism with which it is desired to strike the religious orders, it is an insult which the bishops and priests can only repel with all the energy of their priestly soul. There is no need to give any more importance to the other reproach that is made against the congregations of being too rich. Even if we admit that the value set upon their property is not exaggerated, there is no contesting that they are an honorable and legal possession, and consequently to despoil them would be an attack upon the rights of property. It is, moreover, necessary to remark that they possess nothing for their personal interest or for the good of their individual members, but for works of religion, charity, and beneficence, which turn to the profit of the French nation at home and abroad, whether they go to increase its prestige by contributing to the mission of civilization which Providence has entrusted to it. Passing over in silence other considerations which are made on the subject of the religious congregations, we confine ourselves to this important remark. France maintains amicable relations with the Holy See, founded upon a solemn treaty. If, then, the inconveniences indicated have upon given points any reality, the way is open to bring them to the notice of the Holy See, which is ready to make them the subject of a serious investigation, and, if need be, to apply suitable remedies. We desire, however, to reckon upon the equitable impartiality of the men who guide the destinies of France, and upon the fair-mindedness and good sense which distinguish the French people. We feel confident that they will not wish to lose the precious moral and social heritage of which the religious congregations are the representatives that they have no desire, in seeking to secure general liberty, by laws of exception, to wound the feelings of Catholics, and to aggravate to its own great detriment their country's internal discords. A nation is truly great and strong, and can regard the future with any assurance of security, only if its people are closely united in working for the common good, in full regard for the rights of all, and with consciences free and undisturbed. From the beginning of our pontificate, we have never omitted to make any effort to further this work of pacification in France, which would have brought her incalculable benefits, not only in the religious, but also in the civil and political order. Undeterred by any difficulties, we have not ceased to give France particular proofs of our respect, solicitude, and affection, always feeling sure that she would respond to them as a great and generous nation should. We should be overwhelmed with the deepest sorrow if in the evening of our days we should discover that we have been deceived in these hopes, deprived of the price of our fatherly solicitude, and condemned to watch in the country which we love a rancorous struggle between party passions, with no power to know how far their excesses would extend, or to ward off the misfortunes which we have done all we could to prevent, and for which we decline, in advance, to be held in any way responsible." In any case, the duty which is at present incumbent on the French bishops is to labor in perfect harmony of thought and action 
to prevail upon the people to save the rights and interests of the religious congregations, which we love with all our fatherly heart, and whose existence, liberty, and prosperity concern the Catholic Church, France, and humanity. May the Lord vouchsafe to hear our ardent prayers, and to grant success to the efforts which we have now for so long made in this noble cause. And as a token of our benevolence and of divine favors, we grant you, dear Son, and to the whole Episcopate, clergy, and people of France, the apostolic benediction. 2. Letter of His Holiness Leo XIII, June ninth, 1901, to the superiors of the religious orders and institutes in France. At all times the religious families have received from the apostolic see particular assurance of loving and considerate solicitude, whether they were in the enjoyment of the benefits of peace, or, as in our days, undergoing such trials as those which now assail them. The onslaught which, in certain countries, has been recently made against the orders and the institutes subject to your authority, causes the profoundest grief, and Holy Church is bowed down in sorrow because of it. For it feels itself cut to the quick in its own inherent rights, and seriously impeded in the fulfillment of its work, which, for its proper exercise, requires the concurrence of both clergies, secular and religious. In truth, who touches its priests, touches the apple of its eye. For our part, you know that we have endeavored, by all the means in our power, to prevent this unworthy persecution, and have striven to avert from those countries the consequent disasters which will be as great as they are undeserved. Hence it is that on many occasions, in the name of religion, of justice, and of civilization, we have pleaded your cause with all the power at our command. But we have hoped in vain that our remonstrances will be listened to, for, lo, a nation which was singularly fruitful in religious vocations, a nation on which we have always bestowed the greatest consideration, has, by the authority of its government, approved and promulgated these unjust and discriminating laws, against which, a few months ago, we had lifted our voice in the hope of preventing their being put upon the statutes. Remembering our sacred duties, and following the example of our illustrious predecessors, we have put the seal of condemnation on these laws as being contrary to that natural and evangelical right which is conferred by constant tradition, the right, namely, to form associations for the purpose of leading lives which are not only honest in themselves, but marked by exalted sanctity. We have condemned them because they are contrary to that unquestionable right which the Church possesses of founding religious institutions exclusively subject to its authority, to aid it in the accomplishment of its divine mission, especially when, in this instance, the exercise of that right has resulted in the greatest benefits in the religious and civil order, and redounded to the advantage of that noble nation itself. And now we feel moved to open to you our paternal heart and the desire to give you, and to receive from you, some holy consolation, and, at the same time, to address to you the advice which the occasion calls for, in order that remaining still more firm in the time of trial, you will gain greater merit in the sight of God and men. Among the many motives of courage which spring from our faith, recall, dear sons, that solemn word of Jesus Christ, Blessed are ye when they shall revile and persecute you, and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. Reproaches, calumnies, vexations of all kinds will be poured out upon you for my sake, but then shall you be blessed. It is vain to multiply against you those calumnious accusations which seek to dishonor you. The sad reality is flashed only the more vividly on men's eyes, that the true reason for which you are persecuted is that deep-seated hatred which the world cherishes against the Catholic Church, the City of God, that the real intention is, if possible, to nullify in society the reparative action of Jesus Christ, from which such beneficent and salutary results universally flow. No one is ignorant of the fact that the religious of both sexes form a chosen body in the city of God, that they represent particularly the spirit and the mortifications of Jesus Christ, that by the practice of the evangelical councils they tend to carry Christian virtue to the summit of perfection, and that, in a multitude of ways, they powerfully second the action of the Church. Hence it is not astonishing that today, as in other times, under other iniquitous forms, the city of the world rises against them, and chiefly those men who, by a sacrilegious compact, are most intimately united 
and most servilely bound to him who is the prince of this world it is clear that they consider the dissolution and extinction of religious orders as a successful manoeuvre in the furthering of their deep-laid designs of driving the catholic nations into the ways of apostasy and alienation from jesus christ and because of that we may say in all truth blessed are you because you are hated and persecuted it is only because you have chosen your kind of life out of love for jesus christ if you follow the maxims and the ways of the world the world would not trouble you but would shower its favors upon you if you had been of the world the world would love its own but because you are walking in opposite ways you are assailed and warred against it is because the world hates you christ himself foretold it hence he regards you with all the more love and predilection as he sees you more like himself in your suffering for justice's sake but if you partake of the suffering of christ rejoice aspire to the courage of those heroes who went from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer reproach for the name of jesus to this glory which comes from the testimony of your conscience there is added though you do not seek it the blessing of all honest men all those who have at heart the peace and prosperity of their country are aware that there are no more honorable citizens no more useful men no more devoted patriots than the members of religious congregations and they tremble at the thought of losing in you so many precious advantages which depend upon your existence there are the throngs of the poor the abandoned and the unfortunate for whose sake you have founded and sustained every variety of establishment with supreme intelligence and admirable charity there are the fathers of families who have entrusted their sons to you and who until the present moment relied upon you to impart that moral and religious education which is strong vigorous and fruitful and solid virtue and which was never more needed than in our time there are the priests who find in you valuable auxiliaries in their important and laborious ministry there are the men of all ranks who in these times of apostasy find useful direction and encouragement in your advice backed as it is by the integrity of your lives there are above all the bishops who honor you with their confidence and who consider you as tried teachers of their younger clergy and who recognize in you the true friends of their brothers and their people offering as you do for them to the divine mercy your incessant prayers and expiatory sacrifices but no one appreciates the exceptional merits of religious orders with greater justice than we ourselves who from this apostolic see are watching over the needs of the universal church already in other acts we have made particular mention of all this let it suffice now to call attention to that splendid ardor with which these religious bodies follow not only the directions but the least expression of wish of the vicar of jesus christ undertaking every work which may contribute to the advantage of the church and society whenever he indicates it hurrying to the most inhospitable shores braving every suffering and accepting death itself as many have done in the most glorious manner in the recent upheavals of the empire of china if among the dearest remembrances of our long pontificate we count the fact that by our authority we have raised a great number of the servants of god to the honors of the altar those remembrances are all the more dear to us because the majority of those saints belong to religious orders either as founders or as simple religious we moreover wish to recall for your consolation that among people of the world distinguished by their position and by their knowledge of what society needs there have not been lacking many honorable and upright men who have come forward to praise your works to defend your inviolable right as citizens and your still more inviolable liberty as catholics surely one must be blinded by passion not to see that it is unwise and dishonorable to crush those who hoping for nothing and asking for nothing give themselves up entirely to the service of their fellow men let it be considered with what zeal these religious apply themselves to develop among the children of the people those germs of natural goodness which without them would perish and leave these little ones to grow up a danger to themselves and to others these religious have with the help of grace cultivated patiently and assiduously these precious seeds have preserved them from destruction and have succeeded in bringing them to maturity under their influence they have developed the splendid fruitage of intelligent love for truth of honesty a sense of duty of strength of character and of generosity and sacrifice 
and what is there better calculated than all this for the order and prosperity of the state nevertheless dear sons since the hatred of the world pursues you so far as to pretend that it is a useful and praiseworthy work to trample under foot in your persons the most sacred rights and that in so doing a service is done to god adore with a trusting humility the designs of the almighty in permitting this if at times he suffers right to succumb to violence he does so only for the purpose of some greater good but remember that he often comes to our rescue in unforeseen ways when we suffer for him and trust in him if he places obstacles and obstructions in the path of those whose state is that of christian perfection it is in order to test and fortify their virtue and it is more particularly to strengthen and reinvigorate their souls which might else have grown feeble and protracted peace endeavor therefore to correspond to those paternal designs of almighty god give yourselves up with redoubled ardor to a life of prayer and faith and holy works make regular discipline reign among you let a brotherly union of hearts prevail among you with humble and eager obedience austerity and detachment and a pious ardor for the glory of god let your thoughts be always high your resolutions generous and your zeal indefatigable for the glory of god and the extension of his kingdom since by the misfortune of the times you find yourselves either already struck or threatened by the fatal laws of dispersion you must recognize that these very circumstances impose upon you the duty of defending with more zeal than ever the integrity of your religious spirit against the contamination of the world and of holding yourselves ever ready and ever armed against all attacks on this point you will recall the different instructions which have been addressed to regulars by the apostolic see and these other prescriptions which have emanated from your own superiors let both one and the other keep their full vigour and be most conscientiously observed and now religious of every age young and old lift your eyes to your illustrious founders their maxims speak to you their statutes guide you their examples are before your eyes let your sweetest and holiest desires be to hear them to follow them to imitate them it is thus that multitudes of your ancestors have acted in times of trial it is thus they have transmitted to you a rich heritage of sublime courage and virtue long to make yourselves worthy of your sires and of your brethren in order that you may be able all of you to say while justly glorifying yourselves we are the sons and brothers of the saints it is thus that you will obtain the greatest advantage for yourself for the church and for society by spurring yourselves onward to reach that degree of sanctity to which god has called you you will fulfil the designs of providence in your regard and you will merit the abundant recompense which he has promised you the church your tender mother who has heaped favours upon you will obtain and return for it all a more faithful and more efficacious cooperation than ever in its mission of peace and salvation peace and salvation they are the two urgent needs of society at the present time which so many causes tend to corrupt and degrade to arouse it and to bring it repentant to the feet of the merciful saviour we must have men of superior virtue of living eloquence of apostolic hearts and men who possess at the same time the power of drawing abundant graces from heaven you will be such men we doubt not and you will thus become the most opportune and the most glorious benefactors of society dear sons the charity of the lord inspires a last word to strengthen in you the sentiments with which you are animated towards those who attack your institutes and who wish to destroy your liberty just as your conscience prompts you to keep a firm and dignified attitude so by your profession you must always show yourselves sweet and indulgent because it is especially in the religious that the perfection of that true charity should be resplendent revealing itself as always open to pity and ever incapable of harboring hate without doubt to see yourselves rewarded with ingratitude and thrust aside by those you have benefited would naturally cause bitterness of heart but dear sons let your faith and what it tells you give you comfort bear in mind the sublime exhortation overcome evil by good that faith places before your eyes the incomparable magnanimity of the apostle we are reviled and we bless we are persecuted and we suffer it we are blasphemed and we entreat above all it invites you to repeat the supplication of the supreme benefactor of the human race jesus christ suspended on his cross father forgive them therefore dear sons the vicar of jesus christ 
you have with you the whole catholic world which regards you with affection respect and gratitude your glorious founders and your glorious brothers encourage you your sovereign chief jesus christ girds you with his strength and covers you with the mantle of his virtue well beloved sons turn to the divine heart with a fervent confidence and fervent prayers you will find there all the strength necessary to conquer the fear of the world there is one word which rings through the centuries always living and always full of consolation have confidence i have conquered the world may you find besides some consolation in our blessing which on this day consecrated to the triumphant memory of the apostles we are happy to accord you in all its plenitude to each one of you, to all of you, and to each one of your families, who are most true to us in the Lord. End of section 26。section 27 of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Congratulations to the American Hierarchy Pope Leo's Letter Addressed to Cardinal Gibbons and the American Bishops April 15, 1902 Certainly we have reason to rejoice, and the Catholic world, on account of its reverence for the Apostolic See, has reason to rejoice at the extraordinary fact that we are to be reckoned as the third in the long line of Roman Pontus, to whom it has been happily given to enter upon the twentieth year of the Supreme Priesthood. But in this circle of congratulations, while the voices of all are welcome to us, that of the bishops and faithful of the United States of North America brings us special joy, both on account of the conditions which give your country prominence over many others, and of the special love we entertain for you. You have been pleased, beloved son and venerable brothers, in your joint letter to us, to mention in detail what, prompted by love for you, we have done for your churches during the course of our pontificate. We, on the other hand, are glad to call to mind the many different ways in which you have ministered to our consolation throughout this period. If we found pleasure in the state of things which prevailed among you when we first entered upon the charge of the Supreme Apostolate, now that we have advanced beyond twenty-four years in the same charge, we are constrained to confess that our first pleasure has never been diminished, but, on the contrary, has increased from day to day by reason of the increase of Catholicity among you. The cause of this increase, although first of all to be attributed to the providence of God, must also be ascribed to your energy and activity. You have, in your prudent policy, promoted every kind of Catholic organization with such wisdom as to provide for all necessities and all contingencies, in harmony with the remarkable character of the people of your country. Your chief praise is that you have promoted and sedulously continue to foster the union of your churches with this chief of churches and with the vicar of christ on earth herein as you rightly confess is the apex and centre of government of teaching and of the priesthood the source of that unity which christ destined for his church and is one of the most striking notes distinguishing it from all human sects as we have never failed to exercise with advantage this most salutary office of teaching and government in every nation so we have never permitted that you or your people should suffer the lack of it for we have gladly availed ourselves of every opportunity to testify the constancy of our solicitude for you and for the interest of religion among you and our daily experience obliges us to confess that we have found your people through your influence endowed with perfect docility of mind and alacrity of disposition therefore while the changes and tendencies of nearly all the nations which were catholic for many centuries give cause for sorrow the state of your churches and their flourishing youthfulness cheers our heart and fills it with delight true you are shown no special favor by the law of the land but on the other hand your lawgivers are certainly entitled to praise for the fact that they do nothing to restrain you in your just liberty you must therefore and with you the catholic host behind make strenuous use of the favorable time for action which is now at your disposal by spreading abroad as far as possible the light of truth against the errors and observed imaginings of the sects that are springing up we are not unaware venerable brothers of all that has been done by every one of you for the establishment and the success of schools and academies for the proper education of children 
by your zeal in this respect you have clearly acted in conformity with the exhortations of the apostolic see and the prescriptions of the council of baltimore your magnificent work on behalf of the ecclesiastical seminaries has assuredly been calculated to increase the prospects of good to be done by the clergy and to add to their dignity nor is this all you have wisely taken measures to enlighten dissidents and to draw them to the truth by appointing learned and worthy members of the clergy to go about from district to district to address them in public and familiar style in churches and other buildings and to solve the difficulties that may be advanced an excellent plan and one which we know has already borne abundant fruit nor has your charity been unmindful of the sad lot of the negro and the indian you have sent them teachers help them liberally and you are most zealously providing for their eternal salvation we are glad to add a stimulus if such be necessary to enable you to continue these undertakings with full confidence that your work is worthy of commendation finally not to omit the expression of our gratitude we would have you know what satisfaction you have caused us by the liberality with which your people are endeavouring to contribute by their offerings to relieve the penury of the holy see many indeed and great are the necessities for which the vicar of christ as supreme pastor and father of the church is bound to provide in order to avert evil and to promote the faith hence your generosity becomes an exercise and a testimony of your faith for all these reasons we wish to declare to you again and again our affection for you let the apostolic blessing which we bestow most lovingly in the lord upon you all and upon the flocks entrusted to each one of you be taken as a token of this affection and an augury of divine gifts end of section twenty seven Section twenty eight of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Most Holy Eucharist. Encyclical Letter, Mire Caritatis, May twenty eighth, nineteen o two. To examine into the nature and to promote the effects of those manifestations of His wondrous love, which, like rays of light, stream forth from Jesus Christ, this, as befits our sacred office, has ever been and this with his help to the last breath of our life will ever be our earnest aim and endeavour for whereas our lot has been cast in an age that is bitterly hostile to justice and truth we have not failed as you have been reminded by the apostolic letter which we recently addressed to you to do what in us lay by our instructions and admonitions and by such practical measures as seem best suited for their purpose to dissipate the contagion of air in its many shapes and to strengthen the sinews of the christian life among these efforts of ours there are two in particular of recent memory closely related to each other from the recollection whereof we gather some fruit of comfort the more seasonable by reason of the many causes of sorrow that weigh us down one of these is the occasion on which we direct it as a thing most desirable that the entire human race should be consecrated by a special act to the sacred heart of christ our redeemer the other that on which we so urgently exhorted all those who bear the name christian to cling loyally to him who by divine ordinance is the way the truth and the life not for individuals alone but for every rightly constituted society and now that same apostolic charity ever watchful over the vicissitudes of the church moves and in a manner compels us to add one thing more in order to fill up the measure of what we have already conceived and carried out this is to commend to all christians more earnestly than heretofore the all-holy eucharist for as much as it is a divine gift proceeding from the very heart of the redeemer who with desire desireth this singular mode of union with men a gift most admirably adapted to be the means whereby the solitary fruits of his redemption may be distributed indeed we have not failed in the past more than once to use our authority and to exercise our zeal in this behalf it gives us much pleasure to recall to mind that we have officially approved and enriched with canonical privileges not a few institutions and confraternities having for their object the perpetual adoration of the sacred heart that we have encouraged the holding of eucharistic congresses the results of which have been as profitable as the attendance at them has been numerous and distinguished that we have designated as the heavenly patron of these and similar undertakings st pascal balon whose devotion to the mystery of the eucharist was so extraordinary 
accordingly venerable brethren it has seemed good to us to address you on certain points connected with this same mystery for the defence and honour of which the solicitude of the church has been so constantly engaged for which martyrs have given their lives which has afforded to men of the highest genius a theme to be illustrated by their learning their eloquence their skill in all the arts and this we will do in order to render more clearly evident and more widely known those special characteristics by virtue of which it is so singularly adapted to the needs of these of our times it was towards the close of his mortal life that christ our lord left this memorial of his measureless love for men this powerful means of support for the life of the world and precisely for this reason we being so soon to depart from this life can wish for nothing better than that it may be granted to us to stir up and foster in the hearts of all men the dispositions of mindful gratitude and due devotion towards this wonderful sacrament wherein most especially lie as we hold the hope and the efficient cause of salvation and of that peace which all men so anxiously seek some there are no doubt who will express their surprise that for the manifold troubles and grievous afflictions by which our age is harassed we should have determined to seek for remedies and redress in this quarter rather than elsewhere and in some perchance our words will excite a certain peevish disgust but this is only the natural result of pride for when this vice has taken possession of the heart it is inevitable that christian faith which demands the most willing docility should languish and that a murky darkness in regard of divine truths should close in upon the mind so that in the case of many these words should be made good whatever things they know not they blaspheme we however so far from being hereby turned aside from the design which we have taken in hand are on the contrary determined all the more zealously and diligently to hold up the light for the guidance of the well-disposed and with the help of the united prayers of the faithful earnestly to implore forgiveness for those who speak evil of holy things to know with an entire faith what is the excellence of the most holy eucharist is in truth to know what that work is which in the might of his mercy god made man carried out on behalf of the human race for as a right faith teaches us to acknowledge and to worship christ as the sovereign cause of our salvation since he by his wisdom his laws his ordinances his example and by the shedding of his blood made all things new so the same faith likewise teaches us to acknowledge him and to worship him as really present in the eucharist as verily abiding through all time in the midst of men in order that their master their good shepherd their most acceptable advocate with the father he may impart to them of his own inexhaustible abundance the benefits of that redemption which he has accomplished now if any one will seriously consider the benefits which flow from the eucharist he will understand that conspicuous and chief among them all is that in which the rest without exception are included in a word it is for men the source of life of that life which best deserves the name the bread which i will give is my flesh for the life of the world in more than one way as we have elsewhere declared is christ the life he himself declared that the reason of his advent among men was this that he might bring them the assured fullness of a more than merely human life i am come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly every one is aware that no sooner had the goodness and kindness of god our saviour appeared that there at once burst forth a certain creative force which issued in a new order of things and pulsed through all the veins of society civil and domestic hence arose new relations between man and man new rights and new duties public and private henceforth a new direction was given to government to education to the arts and most important of all man's thoughts and energies were turned towards religious truth and the pursuit of holiness thus was life communicated to man a life truly heavenly and divine and thus we are to account for those expressions which so often occur in holy writ the tree of life the word of life the book of life the crown of life and particularly the bread of life but now since this life of which we are speaking bears a definite resemblance to the natural life of man as the one draws its nourishment and strength from food so also the other must have its own food whereby it may be sustained and augmented and here it will be opportune to recall to mind 
on what occasion and in what manner christ moved and prepared the hearts of men for the worthy and due reception of the living bread which he was about to give them no sooner had the rumour spread of the miracle which he had wrought on the shores of the lake of tiberius when with the multiplied loaves he fed the multitude then many forthwith flocked to him in the hope that they too perchance might be the recipients of a like favour and just as he had taken occasion from the water which she had drawn from the well to stir up in the samaritan woman a thirst for that water which springeth up unto life everlasting so now jesus availed himself of this opportunity to excite in the minds of the multitude a keen hunger for the bread which endureth unto life everlasting nor as he was careful to explain to them was the bread which he promised the same as that heavenly manna which had been given to their fathers during their wanderings in the desert or again the same as that which to their amazement they had recently received from him but he was himself that bread i said he am the bread of life and he urges this still further upon them all both by invitation and by precept if any man shall eat of this bread he shall live for ever and the bread which i will give is my flesh for the life of the world and to these other words he brings home to them the gravity of the precept amen amen i say to you unless you shall eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you shall not have life in you away then with the widespread but most mischievous air of those who give it as their opinion that the reception of the eucharist is in a manner reserved for those narrow-minded persons as they are deemed who rid themselves of the cares of this world in order to find rest in some kind of professedly religious life for this gift then which nothing can be more excellent or more conductive to salvation is offered to all those whatever their office or dignity may be who wish as every one ought to wish to foster in themselves that life of divine grace whose goal is the attainment of a life of blessedness with god indeed it is greatly to be desired that those men would rightly esteem and would make due provision for life everlasting whose industry or talents or rank have put it in their power to shape the course of human events but alas we see with sorrow that such men too often profoundly father themselves that they have conferred upon this world as it were a fresh leaf of life and prosperity inasmuch as by their own energetic action they are urging it on to the race for wealth to a struggle for the possession of commodities which minister to the law of comfort and display and yet whithersoever we turn we see that human society if it be estranged from god instead of enjoying that peace in its possessions for which it had sought is shaken and tossed like one who is in the agony and heat of fever for while it anxiously strives for prosperity and trusts to it alone it is pursuing an object that ever escapes it clinging to one that ever eludes the grasp for as men and states alike necessarily have their being from god so they can do nothing good except in god through jesus christ through whom every best and choicest gift has ever proceeded and proceeds but the source and chief of all these gifts is the venerable eucharist which not only nourishes and sustains that life the desire whereof demands our most strenuous efforts but also enhances beyond measure that dignity of man of which in these days we hear so much for what can be more honourable or a more worthy object of desire than to be made as far as possible sharers and partakers in the divine human nature now this is precisely what christ does for us in the eucharist wherein after having raised man by the operation of his grace to a supernatural state he yet more closely associates and unites him with himself for there is this difference between the food of the body and that of the soul that whereas the former is changed into our substance the latter changes us into its own so that st augustine makes christ himself say you shall not change me into yourself as you do the food of your body but you shall be changed into me moreover in the most admirable sacrament which is the chief means whereby men are engrafted on the divine nature men also find the most efficacious help towards progress in every kind of virtue and first of all in faith in all ages faith has been attacked for although it elevates the human mind by bestowing on it the knowledge of the highest truths yet because while it makes known the existence of divine mysteries it yet leaves in obscurity the mode of their being it is therefore thought to degrade the intellect 
but whereas in past times particular articles of faith have been made by turns the object of attack, the seat of war has since been enlarged and extended, until it has come to this, that men deny altogether that there is anything above and beyond nature. Now nothing can be better adapted to promote a renewal of the strength and fervor of faith in the human mind than the mystery of the Holy Eucharist, the mystery of faith, as it has been most appropriately called. For in this one mystery, the entire supernatural order, with all its wealth and variety of wonders, is in a manner summed up and contained. He hath made a remembrance of his wonderful works, a merciful and gracious Lord. He has given food to them that fear him. For whereas God has subordinated the whole supernatural order to the incarnation of his word, in virtue whereof salvation has been restored to the human race, according to those words of the Apostle, he hath purposed to re-establish all things in Christ, that are in heaven and on earth, in him. The Eucharist, according to the testimony of the Holy Fathers, should be regarded as in a manner of continuation and extension of the Incarnation. For in and by it the substance of the Incarnate Word is united with individual men, and the supreme sacrifice offered on Calvary is in a wondrous manner renewed, as was signified beforehand by Malachi in the words, In every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a pure oblation. And this miracle, itself the very greatest of its kind, is accompanied by innumerable other miracles. For here all the laws of nature are suspended. The whole substance of the bread and wine are changed into the body and the blood. The species of bread and wine are sustained by the divine power, without the support of any underlying substance. The body of Christ is present, in many places, at the same time, that is to say, wherever the sacrament is consecrated. And in order that human reason may the more willingly pay its homage to this great mystery, there have not been wanting, as an aid of faith, certain prodigies wrought in his honor, both in ancient times and in our own, of which in more than one place there exist public and notable records and memorials. It is plain that by this sacrament faith is fed, and that the mind finds its nourishment, the objections of rationalists are brought to naught, and abundant light is thrown on the supernatural order. But that decay of faith in divine things, of which we have spoken, is the effect not only of pride, but also of moral corruption. For if it is true that a strict morality improves the quickness of man's intellectual powers, and if, on the other hand, as the maxims of pagan philosophy and the admonitions of divine wisdom combine to teach us, the keenness of the mind is blunted by bodily pleasures, how much more, in the region of revealed truths, do these same pleasures obscure the light of faith, or even, by the just judgment of God, entirely extinguish it? For these pleasures, at the present day, an insatiable appetite rages, infecting all classes, as with an infectious disease, even from tender years. Yet even for so terrible an evil, there is a remedy close at hand in the divine Eucharist, for in the first place it puts a check on lust by increasing charity, according to the words of St. Augustine, who says, speaking of charity, as it grows, lust diminishes. When it reaches perfection, lust is no more. Moreover, the most chaste flesh of Jesus keeps down the rebellion of our flesh, as St. Cyril of Alexandria taught. For Christ, abiding in us, lulls to sleep the law of the flesh which rages in our members. Then, too, the special and most pleasant fruit of the Eucharist is that which is signified in the words of the prophet, What is the good thing of him, that is, of Christ, and what is his beautiful thing, but the corn of the elect and the wine that engendereth virgins? Producing, in other words, that flower and fruitage of a strong and constant purpose of virginity, which, even in an age enervated by luxury, is daily multiplied and spread abroad in the Catholic Church, with those advantages to religion and to human society, wherever it is found, which are plain to see. To this it must be added that by the same sacrament our hope of everlasting blessedness, based on our trust in the divine assistance, is wonderfully strengthened. For the edge of that longing for happiness, which is so deeply rooted in the hearts of all men from their birth, is wedded even more and more by the experience of the deceitfulness of earthly goods, by the unjust violence of wicked men, and by all those other affections, to which mind and body are subject. Now the venerable sacrament of the Eucharist is both the source and the pledge of blessedness and of glory, and this not for the soul alone, but for the body also. 
for it enriches the soul with an abundance of heavenly blessings and fills it with a sweet joy which far surpasses man's hope and expectations it sustains him in adversity strengthens him in the spiritual combat preserves him for life everlasting and as a special provision for the journey accompanies him thither and in the frail and perishable body that divine host which is the immortal body of christ implants the principle of resurrection a seed of immortality which one day must germinate but to this source man's soul and body will be indebted for both these wounds has been the constant teaching of the church which has dutifully reaffirmed the affirmation of christ he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life and i will raise him up at the last day in connection with this matter it is of importance to consider that in the eucharist seeing that it is instituted by christ as a perpetual memorial of his passion is proclaimed to the christian the necessity of a solitary self-chastisement for jesus said to those first priests of his do this in memory of me that is to say do this for the commemoration of my pains my sorrows my grievous afflictions my death upon the cross wherefore this sacrament is at the same time a sacrifice seasonable throughout the entire period of our penance and it is likewise a standing exhortation to all manner of toil and a solemn and severe rebuke to those carnal pleasures which some are not ashamed so highly to praise and extol as often as ye shall eat this bread and drink this chalice ye shall announce the death of the lord until he come furthermore if any one will diligently examine into the causes of the evils of our day he will find that they arise from this that as charity towards god has grown cold the mutual charity of men among themselves has likewise cold men have forgotten that they are children of god and brethren in jesus christ they care for nothing except their own individual interests the interests and the rights of others they not only make light of but often attack and invade hence frequent disturbances and strifes between class and class arrogance oppression fraud on the part of the more powerful misery envy and turbulence among the poor these are evils for which it is vain to seek a remedy in legislation in threats or penalties to be incurred or in any other device of merely human prudence our chief care and endeavor ought to be according to the admonitions which we have more than once given at considerable length to secure the union of classes and a mutual interchange of dutiful services a union which having its origin in god shall issue in deeds that reflect the true spirit of jesus christ in a genuine charity this charity christ brought into the world with it he would have all hearts on fire for it alone is capable of affording to soul and body alike even in this life a foretaste of blessedness since it restrains men's inordinate self-love and puts a check on avarice which is the root of all evil and whereas it is right to uphold all the claims of justice as between the various classes of society nevertheless it is only with the efficacious aid of charity which tempers justice that the equality which st paul commended and which is so salutary for human society can be established and maintained this then is what christ intended when he instituted this venerable sacrament namely by awakening charity towards god to promote mutual charity among men for the latter as is plain is by its very nature rooted in the former and springs from it by a kind of spontaneous growth nor is it possible that there should be any lack of charity among men or rather it must needs be enkindled and flourish if men will but ponder well the charity which christ has shown in this sacrament for in it he has not only given the splendid manifestation of his power and wisdom but has in a manner poured out the riches of his divine love towards men having before our eyes this noble example set us by christ who bestows on us all that he has assuredly we ought to love and help one another to the utmost being daily more closely united by the strong bond of brotherhood add to this that the outward and visible elements of the sacrament supply a singularly appropriate stimulus to union on this topic st cyprian writes in a war the lord's sacrifice symbolizes the oneness of heart guaranteed by a persevering and inviolable charity which should prevail among christians for when our lord calls his body bread a substance which is kneaded together out of many grains he indicates that we his people whom he sustains are bound together in close union and when he speaks of his blood as wine 
in which the juice pressed from many clusters of grapes is mingled in one fluid he likewise indicates that we his flock are by the commingling of a multitude of persons made one in like manner the angelic doctor adopting the sentiments of st augustine writes our lord has bequeathed to us his body and blood under the form of substances in which a multitude of things have been reduced to unity for one of them namely bread consisting as it does of many grains is yet one and the other that is to say wine has its unity of being from the confluent juice of many grapes and therefore st augustine elsewhere says o sacrament of mercy o sign of unity o bond of charity all which is confirmed by the declaration of the council of trent that christ left the eucharist in his church as a symbol of that unity and charity whereby he would have all christians mutually joined and united a symbol of that one body of which he is himself the head and to which he would have us as members attached by the closest bonds of faith hope and charity the same idea has been expressed by st paul when he wrote for we being many are one bread one body all we who partake of the one bread very beautiful and joyful too is the spectacle of christian brotherhood and social equality which is afforded women of all conditions gentle and simple rich and poor learned and unlearned gather round the holy altar all sharing alike in this heavenly banquet and if in the records of the church it is deservedly reckoned to the special credit of its first age that the multitude of the believers had but one heart and one soul there can be no shadow of doubt that this immense blessing was due to their frequent meetings at the divine table for we find it recorded of them they were persevering in the doctrine of the apostles and in the communion of the breaking of bread besides all this the grace of mutual charity among the living which derives from the sacrament of the eucharist so great an increase of strength is further extended by virtue of the sacrifice to all those who are numbered in the communion of saints for the communion of saints as every one knows is nothing but the mutual communication of help expiation prayers blessings among all the faithful who whether they have already attained to the heavenly country or are detained in the purgatorial fire or are yet exiles here on earth all enjoy the common franchise of that city whereof christ is the head and the constitution is charity for faith teaches us that although the venerable sacrifice may be lawfully offered to god alone yet it may be celebrated in honour of the saints reigning in heaven with god who has crowned them in order that we may gain for ourselves their patronage and it may also be offered in accordance with an apostolic tradition for the purpose of expiating the sins of those of the brethren who having died in the lord have not yet fully paid the penalty of their transgressions that genuine charity therefore which knows how to do and to suffer all things for the salvation and the benefit of all leaps forth with all the heat and energy of a flame from that most holy eucharist in which christ himself is present and lives in which he indulges to the utmost his love towards us and under the impulse of that divine love ceaselessly renews his sacrifice and thus it is not difficult to see whence the arduous labors of apostolic men and whence those innumerable designs of every kind for the welfare of the human race which have been set on foot among catholics derive their origin their strength their permanence their success these few words on a subject so vast will we doubt not prove most helpful to the christian flock if you in your zeal venerable brethren will cause them to be expounded and enforced as time and occasion may serve but indeed a sacrament so great and so rich in all manner of blessings can never be extolled as it deserves by human eloquence nor adequately venerated by the worship of man this sacrament whether as the theme of devout meditation or as the object of public adoration or best of all as a food to be received in the utmost purity of conscience is to be regarded as a centre towards which the spiritual life of a christian in all its ambit gravitates for all other forms of devotion whatsoever they may be lead up to it and in it find their point of rest in this mystery more than in any other that gracious invitation and still more gracious promise of christ is realized and finds its daily fulfilment come to me all ye that labor and are heavily burdened and i will refresh you in a word this sacrament is as it were the very soul of the church 
and to it the grace of the priesthood is ordered and directed in all its fullness and in each of its successive grades from the same source the church draws and has all her strength all her glory her every supernatural endowment and adornment every good thing that is hers wherefore she makes it the chiefest of all her cares to prepare the hearts of the faithful for an intimate union with christ through the sacrament of his body and blood and to draw them thereto and to this end she strives to promote the veneration of this august mystery by surrounding it with holy ceremonies to this ceaseless and ever watchful care of the church her mother our attention is drawn by that exhortation which was uttered by the holy council of trent and which is so much to the purpose that for the benefit of the christian people we here reproduce it in its entirety the holy synod admonishes exhorts asks and implores by the tender mercy of our god that all and each of those who bear the name of christian should at last unite and find peace in this sign of unity in this bond of charity in this symbol of concord and that mindful of the great majesty and singular love of jesus christ our lord who gave his precious life as the price of our salvation and his flesh for our food they should believe and reverse these sacred mysteries of his body and blood with such constancy of unwavering faith with such interior devotion and worshipful piety that they may be in condition to receive frequently that supersubstantial bread and that it may be to them the life of their souls and keep their mind in soundness of faith so that strengthened with its strength they may be enabled after the journey of this sorrowful pilgrimage to reach the heavenly country there to see and feed upon that bread of angels which here they eat under the sacramental veils history bears witness that the virtues of the christian life have flourished best wherever and whenever the frequent reception of the eucharist has most prevailed and on the other hand it is no less certain that in days when men have ceased to care for this heavenly bread and have lost their appetite for it the practice of christian religion has gradually lost its force and vigor and indeed it was as a needful measure of precautions against a complete falling away that innocent the third and the council of the lateran most strictly enjoined that no christian should abstain from receiving the communion of the lord's body at least in the solemn paschal season but it is clear that this precept was imposed with regret and only as a last resource for it has always been the desire of the church that at every mass some of the faithful should be present and should communicate the holy synod would wish that in every celebration of the mass some of the faithful should take part not only by devoutly assisting thereat but also by the sacramental reception of the eucharist in order that they might more abundantly partake of the fruits of this holy sacrifice most abundant assuredly are the solitary benefits which are stored up in this most venerable mystery regarded as a sacrifice a sacrifice which the church is accordingly wont to offer daily for the salvation of the whole world and it is fitting indeed in this age is especially important that by means of the united efforts of the devout the outward honor and the inward reverence paid to this sacrifice should be alike increased accordingly it is our wish that its manifold excellence may be both more widely known and more attentively considered there are certain general principles the truth of which can be plainly perceived by the light of reason for instance that the dominion of god our creator and preserver over all men whether in their private or in their public life is supreme and absolute that our whole being and all that we possess whether individually or as members of society comes from the divine bounty that we on our part are bound to show to god as our lord the highest reverence and as he is our greatest benefactor the deepest gratitude but how many are there who at the present day acknowledge and discharge these duties with full and exact observance in no age has a spirit of contumacy and an attitude of defiance towards god been more prevalent than in our own an age in which that unholy cry of the enemies of christ we will not have this man to rule over us makes itself more and more loudly heard together with the utterance of that wicked purpose let us make away with him nor is there any motive by which many are hurried on with more passionate fury than the desire utterly to banish god not only from the civil government but from every form of human society and although men do not everywhere proceed to this extremity of criminal madness it is a lamentable thing that so many are sunk in oblivion of the divine majesty and of his favors and in particular of the salvation wrought for us by christ 
Now a remedy must be found for this wickedness on the one hand, and this sloth on the other, and a general increase among the faithful of fervent devotion towards the Eucharistic sacrifice, than which nothing can give greater honor, nothing be more pleasing to God. For it is the divine victim which is here immolated, and accordingly, through this victim, we offer to the most blessed Trinity all that honor which the infinite dignity of the Godhead demands. Infinite in value and infinitely acceptable is the gift which we present to the Father in His only begotten Son, so that for His benefits to us we not only signify our gratitude but actually make an adequate return. Moreover, there is another twofold fruit which we may and must derive from this great sacrifice. The heart is saddened when it considers what a flood of wickedness the result, as we have said, of forgetfulness and contempt of the divine majesty has inundated the world. It is not too much to say that a great part of the human race seems to be calling down upon itself the anger of heaven, though indeed the crop of evils which has grown up here on earth is already ripening to a just judgment. Here, then, is a motive whereby the faithful may be stirred to a devout and earnest endeavor to appease God, the avenger of sin, and to win from him the help which is so needful in these calamitous times. And they should see that such blessings are to be sought principally by means of this sacrifice. For it is only in virtue of the death which Christ suffered that man can satisfy, and that most abundantly, the demands of God's justice, and can obtain the plenteous gifts of his clemency. And Christ has willed that the whole virtue of his death, alike for expiation and impetration, should abide in the Eucharist, which is no mere empty commemoration thereof, but a true and wonderful, though bloodless and mystical, renewal of it. To conclude, we gladly acknowledge that it has been a cause of no small joy to us that during these last years a renewal of love and devotion towards the sacrament of the Eucharist has, as it seems, begun to show itself in the hearts of the faithful, a fact which encourages us to hope for better times and a more favorable state of affairs. Many and varied, as we said at the commencement, are the expedients which an inventive piety has devised, and worthy of special mention are the confraternities instituted either with the object of carrying out the Eucharistic ritual with greater splendor, or for the perpetual adoration of the venerable sacrament by day and night or for the purpose of making reparation for the blasphemies and insults of which it is the object. But neither we nor you, venerable brethren, can allow ourselves to rest satisfied with what has hitherto been done, for there remain many things which must be further developed or begun anew, to the end that this most divine of gifts, this greatest of mysteries, may be better understood and more worthily honored and revered, even by those who already take their part in the religious services of the Church. Wherefore, works of this kind, which have been already set on foot, must be ever more zealously promoted. Old undertakings must be revived, wherever perchance they may have fallen into decay. For instance, confraternities of the Holy Eucharist, intercessory prayers before the Blessed Sacrament, exposed for the veneration of the faithful, solemn processions, devout visits to God's tabernacle, and other holy and solitary practices of the same kind. Nothing must be omitted which a prudent piety may suggest as suitable. But the chief aim of our efforts must be that the frequent reception of the Eucharist may be everywhere revived among Catholic peoples. For this is the lesson which is taught us by the example already referred to, of the primitive church, by the decrees of the councils, by the authority of the fathers and of holy men in all ages. For the soul, like the body, needs frequent nourishment, and the Holy Eucharist provides that food which is best adapted to the support of its life. Accordingly, all hostile prejudices, those vain fears to which so many yield, and their specious excuses from abstaining from the Eucharist, must be resolutely put aside. For there is question here of a gift, then, which none other can be more serviceable to the faithful people, either for the redeeming of them from the tyranny of anxious cares concerning perishable things, or for the renewal of the Christian spirit, and perseverance therein. To this end, the exhortation and example of all those who occupy a prominent position will powerfully contribute, but most especially the resourceful and diligent zeal of the clergy. For priests, to whom Christ our Redeemer entrusted the office of consecrating and dispensing the mystery of his body and blood, can assuredly make no better return for the honor which has been conferred upon them 
than by promoting with all their might the glory of his eucharist and by inviting and drawing the hearts of men to the health-giving springs of this great sacrament and sacrifice seconding hereby the longings of his most sacred heart may god grant that thus in accordance with our earnest desire the excellent fruits of the eucharist may daily manifest themselves in greater abundance to the happy increase of faith hope and charity and of all christian virtues and may this turn to the recovery and advantage of the whole body politic and may the wisdom of god's most provident charity who instituted this mystery for all time for the life of the world shine forth with an ever brighter light encouraged by such hopes as these venerable brethren we as a presage of the divine liberality and as a pledge of our own charity most lovingly bestow on each of you and on the clergy and flock committed to the care of each our apostolic benediction end of section twenty eight Section 29 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Holy Scriptures, the Biblical Commission, Apostolical Letter, Vigilantiae, October 30th, 1902. Faithful to the tradition of watchfulness and zeal by which we, first of all, because of our office, are bound to preserve the deposit of faith safe and inviolate, we gave to the world in the year 1893 the encyclical Providentissimus. In it we included, after due examination, a number of questions concerning the study of Holy Scripture. The grandeur and extreme utility of the subject impelled us, in effect, to determine, as far as in us lay, the directive principle of those studies so necessary now that the increase of erudition confronts us every day with the consideration of novel questions, which are sometimes in danger of being treated in a manner fraught with rashness. Wherefore, we have warned all Catholics, and especially those in holy orders, of the work which each one should undertake in this matter in accordance with the abilities with which he is endowed, and we applied ourselves with the greatest care to show how and in what manner these studies should be developed, in conformity with the needs of our epoch. This document has not been without result, and it is with joy that we recall the testimonies of submission which the bishops and a great number of men eminent in science hasten to give us, while proclaiming at the same time the opportunities and the importance of what we had written, and promising to conform with the greatest diligence to our instructions. Another remembrance no less agreeable comes to us in the fact that excellent beginnings were immediately made by some in the direction indicated, and an enthusiasm awakened in various places in the prosecution of such studies. Nevertheless, we remark that the causes which prompted us to publish the previous letter are still persistent and more serious. It is therefore necessary to insist more emphatically on what has already been enjoined, and more than ever to express our desire that our venerable brethren of the episcopate should watch with the greatest vigilance over these studies to ensure greater facility as well as fruitfulness we have resolved to add new strength to our authority in this matter as the task now before us of explaining these divine books and maintaining them intact is too difficult for our catholic interpreters to acquit themselves well of if left to their individual efforts and because the work is nevertheless so necessary on account of the manifold developments of science and the appearance of such multitudinous error it is deemed proper that a federation of energies should be made and that assistance should be afforded under the auspices and direction of the apostolic see this result it appears to us can be easily attained if we make use in the present instance of the means which we have already employed for advancing other studies wherefore it has seemed good to us to institute a council or as it is termed a commission of men of learning whose duty shall be to effect that in every possible manner the divine text will find here and from every quarter the most thorough interpretation which is demanded by our times and be shielded not only from every breath of air but also from every temerarious opinion it is proper that the principal seat of this commission should be in rome under the very eyes of the sovereign pontiff as it is the seat of the mistress and garden of christian knowledge it should also be the centre from which there should flow through the whole body of the christian commonwealth 
the pure and incorruptible teaching of this science, which is now so indispensable. The men of whom this commission shall be composed, in order to satisfy fully the serious obligation which is laid upon them, and which confers on them such distinction, should regard as peculiarly and especially their own the tasks which are here proposed to their zeal. In the first place, having established exactly what is the actual intellectual trend of the present day with regard to this science, they should bear in mind that none of the recent discoveries which the human mind has made is foreign to the purpose of their work. On the contrary, let them make haste in any case where our times have discovered something useful in the matter of biblical exegesis, to avail themselves of it forthwith, and by their writings to put it at the service of all. Wherefore they should devote themselves with the greatest care to the study of philology and kindred sciences, and keep themselves abreast of the progress of the day. As it is generally on this point that the attacks on Holy Scripture are made, it is there that we should likewise gather our arms of defense, so that there may be no inequality in the struggle between truth and error. Likewise, they shall take measures that the knowledge of the ancient and oriental languages, and above all the art of deciphering the ancient texts, should be assiduously cultivated. Both of these branches are, as a matter of fact, a precious help in biblical studies. In what concerns the integral safeguarding of the authority of the scriptures, the members of the commission will employ an act of vigilance and unremitting assiduity. The main point to be attained is that Catholics should not admit the malignant principle of granting more than is due to the opinion of heterodox writers, and of thinking that the true understanding of the scriptures should be sought first of all in the researches which the erudition of unbelievers has arrived at. Indeed, no Catholic can consider as subject to doubt these truths which we have elsewhere referred to at greater length, and they must know that God has not delivered the scriptures to the private judgment of the learned but has confided the interpretation of them to the teaching of the church. In the matter of faith and morals which pertains to the teaching of Christian doctrine, the sense of Holy Scripture, which must be considered as a true sense, is that which has been adopted and is adopted by our Holy Mother, the Church, whose office it is to judge of the real meaning and interpretation of Holy Scriptures. It is, therefore, not permitted to any one to interpret the Holy Scriptures in any way contrary to this sense, or even in any way contrary to the universal opinion of the fathers. As we were saying, the nature of the divine books is such that in order to dissipate the religious obscurity with which they are shrouded, we must never count on the laws of hermeneutics, but must address ourselves to the church which has been given by God to mankind as the guide and mistress. In brief, the legitimate sense of the divine scriptures is not to be found outside the church, nor can it be pronounced by those who have repudiated her teaching and authority. The men who are to compose this commission should therefore watch with great care to safeguard these principles, and to keep them, as time goes on, with still greater strictness. And if certain minds profess an exaggerated admiration for heterodox writers, they must be led by persuasion to follow and to obey more faithfully the direction of the church. Doubtless there may arise an occasion when the Catholic interpreter may find some assistance in authors outside of the Church, especially in matters of criticism, but here there is need of prudence and discernment. Let our doctors cultivate with care the science of criticism, for it is of great utility in order to grasp in its complete sense the opinion of hagiographers, and in that they will receive our warmest approbation." Let them draw from this science new resources by availing themselves even of the assistance of non-Catholic scholars. In doing so, they need not fear our disapprobation. They should, however, be careful not to draw from habitual association with such writers and dependence of judgment. For in point of fact, the system which is known in our days as higher criticism frequently leads to such results. Its dangerous rashness we have more than once already condemned. In the third place, it is of importance that this commission should consecrate its most special attention to that of those studies which properly concerns the explanation of the scriptures, and which opens to the faithful a great source of spiritual profit. In whatever touches the text, whose sense has been fixed in an authentic manner, either by the sacred writers or by the church, the commission, it is needless to say, should be convinced that only that interpretation can be adopted." such as the rule of sound hermeneutics. 
but there exist numerous passages upon which the church has not yet given any fixed or precise definition with regard to which it is permitted to each doctor in his individual capacity to profess and to sustain the opinion which seems to him to be correct they must know however that on these points they should keep as the rules of interpretation the analogy of faith and of catholic doctrine moreover we must be on our guard in this matter against transgressing in the excessive ardour of debate the limits of mutual charity it is also of importance not to seem to discuss revealed truths and divine traditions if they make light of intellectual concord and if these principles are not safeguarded we cannot have any right to expect that the divergent labors of such a great number of scholars will accomplish any noble progress in this science hence this commission will have as its task to regulate in a legitimate and suitable manner the principal questions which are pending between catholic doctors in order to arrive at a conclusion to settle them the assembly will lend sometimes the light of its judgment sometimes the weight of its authority their investigations will also have a result of the greatest advantage namely that of furnishing to the holy see an opportune occasion to declare what ought to be inviolably maintained by catholics what ought to be reserved for more profound research and what ought to be left to the free judgment of each having therefore in view to ensure the maintenance of catholic authority in its integrity and to promote the studies which relate to holy scripture in conformity with the rules which we have herein laid down we by these present letters establish in this illustrious city a council or a special commission we wish it to be composed of some cardinals of the holy roman church who shall be chosen in virtue of our authority it is our intention to add to them with the functions and titles of consultors taking part in the same studies and the same labors as it is customary in the sacred roman commissions certain eminent men who belong to different nationalities who are recommended by their knowledge in sacred studies and above all in whatever appertains to biblical science the commission will hold its fixed reunions and publish its writings which will appear periodically or as need may require if advice is asked of it it will reply to those who consult it in a word it will labor by all means in its power to maintain and to develop the studies of which we speak we desire that a report concerning all the questions which may be treated in common should be addressed to the sovereign pontiff by the consultor to whom the commission will have confided the office of secretary in order to furnish members of the commission with available help which will be of service to them in any of these studies we herewith assign to them for this purpose a certain portion of our vatican library we shall take care that a numerous collection of manuscripts and volumes of every epoch which treat of biblical questions shall without delay be classified and placed at the disposition of the commissioners it is very desirable that well-to-do catholics should come to our assistance to establish and enlarge this library and sending to us resources to be employed for this end or useful books and in so doing they will render a service in a most fitting manner to almighty god who is the author of scriptures and of the church moreover we have confidence that divine providence will amply bless this undertaking which has for its direct object the safeguarding of christian faith and the eternal salvation of souls and that catholics who are devoted to the holy books will respond with an absolute and complete submission to the declarations of the holy see on this point we wish and we ordain that all and every one of these prescriptions and decisions which it has seemed good to us to make and to formulate on this point shall be and shall remain ratified and confirmed in the manner which we have adopted and formulated any clause to the contrary notwithstanding end of section twenty nine section thirty of the great encyclical letters of pope leo the thirteenth this LibriVox recording is in the public domain the church in the philippines the broad stretch of islands bounded by the china sea and the pacific ocean which philip the second king of spain called the philippines were scarcely opened up by ferdinand magellan at the beginning of the sixteenth century when with the image of the holy cross planted on their shores they were consecrated to god and offered as a first fruit offering of the catholic religion from that time the roman pontiffs with the aid of charles v and philip his son both remarkable for their zeal for spreading the faith have thought nothing more urgent than to convert the islanders who were idol worshippers to the faith of christ 
with God's help, by the strenuous efforts of the different religious orders, this came about very favorably, and in such a short time that Gregory the Thirteenth decided to appoint a bishop for the growing church there, and constitute Manila an Episcopal see. With this happy beginning, the growth which followed in after years corresponded in every way. Owing to the united measures of our predecessors and of the Spanish kings, slavery was abolished, the inhabitants were trained in the ways of civilization by the study of arts and letters, so that the people and church in the Philippines were deservedly distinguished by the renown of their nation and their meritorious zeal for religion. In this way, under the direction of the kings of Spain, in the patronage of the Roman Pontus, Catholicity was maintained in due order in the Philippine Islands. But the change which the fortunes of war have wrought in civil matters there has affected religion also, for when the Spanish yoke was removed, the patronage of the Spanish kings ceased, and as a result the church attained to a large share of liberty, ensuring for every one rights which are safe and unassailable. To provide against the relaxation of ecclesiastical discipline in this new state of affairs, a plan of action and of organization had to be sought promptly and with great care. For this purpose, we sent our venerable brother, Placid Louis Chapelle, Archbishop of New Orleans, as our delegate extraordinary to the Philippine Islands, who, after examining in person and putting to rights whatever would not admit of delay or postponement, was then to report to us. The duties thus imposed he has discharged faithfully in our behalf, and deserves, for this reason, that we should bestow on him well-merited praise. Later, it happened auspiciously that the government of the United States of America undertook, by means of a special legation, to consider plans for a way of adjusting certain questions regarding Catholic interest in the Philippines. This enterprise we gladly encouraged, and by the skill and moderation of the negotiators, a way has been opened for a settlement, which is to be effected on the ground itself. After hearing the opinions of some of the Holy Roman and Eminent Cardinals of the Sacred Congregation, presiding over extraordinary affairs, we decree and declare in this apostolical constitution what has seemed, after long deliberation, to be most conducive for the interests of the Church in the Philippine Islands, trusting that what we, by our supreme authority ordain, may, with the civil government righteously and favorably disposed, be zealously and piously observed. First of all, therefore, it is our intention and purpose to increase the sacred hierarchy. When the Diocese of Manila had been created by Gregory the Thirteenth, as we have said, as the faithful rapidly increased in numbers, both by reason of the natives who embraced the Catholic religion and of the arrivals from Europe, Clement the Eighth decided to increase the number of bishops. He therefore elevated the church in Manila to the dignity of an archiepiscopate, making the bishops of the three new dioceses he created, Cebu, Cachiras, and Nueva Segovia, suffragans to it. To these was added later, in the year 1865, the Episcopal See of Jero. Now these dioceses are so vast that, owing to the distance by which the settlements are separated and the difficulties of travel, the bishops can scarcely visit them thoroughly without extreme labor. Wherefore, it is necessary to avail ourselves of the present opportunity to reduce the dioceses already established to narrower limits and to form new ones. Hence, keeping the Archiepiscopal See of Manila in the diocese of Cebu, Saqueras, Nuevo Segovia, and Jero, we add to them and create four new dioceses, Lipa, Tugagararo, Capiz, and Zamboanga, all like the others, suffragan to the Manila metropolis. Moreover, in the Marian Islands, we create a prefecture apostolic subject without any intermediate authority to ourselves and to our successors. The Archbishop of Manila is the one who will bear the title of Metropolitan in the Philippine Islands, and all the other bishops, those who fill the old as well as those who are to occupy the newly created sees, will be subject to him, the suffragans both in rank and in name. The rights and functions of the Metropolitan are laid down by the ecclesiastical laws already extant. As we wish that these laws be inviolably observed, so also do we wish that the bonds of holy friendship and charity between the Metropolitan and his suffragans be ever unimpaired, and grow always closer and more binding by mutual services, exchange of counsel, and especially by frequent Episcopal conventions, so far as distance may permit. Concord is the mother and guardian of the great benefits. The dignity and precedence of the Metropolitan Church require that it should be honored by a college of canons. The delegate apostolic will see and determine how to obtain in future the stipend for each of the canons, 
which hitherto was paid by the Spanish government. If, owing to the shrinkage of revenue, the number of canons cannot be maintained as heretofore, let it be reduced so as to consist of ten at least, and retain those who are canons by right of their office. The archbishop may, by his own unrestricted right, confer the aforementioned dignities and canonry, and all the benefices which belong to the metropolitan church, except, indeed, those which either by common law are reserved to the apostolic see, or are the gift of some other person, or are controlled by the conditions of the concursus. We earnestly desire to have colleges of canons formed in the other cathedral churches also. Until such time as this can be done, the bishops are to choose for consultors some priests, secular and religious, distinguished by their piety, learning, and experience in administration, as is done in other dioceses in which there is no canonical chapter. To provide for the proper dignity of the sacred ceremonies, the consultors just mentioned should attend the bishop when officiating. If, for any reason, they be prevented from doing so, the bishop will substitute others, worthy members of the clergy, both secular and religious. Should it happen that any suffragan diocese, in which there is no canonical chapter, should lose its bishop, the metropolitan will assume its administration. Should there be none, the charge will fall to the nearest bishop, with the condition, however, that a vicar be chosen as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the vicar-general of the deceased bishop will manage the diocese. Since it is proved by experience that a native clergy is most useful everywhere, the bishops must make it their care to increase the number of native priests, in such a manner, however, as to form them thoroughly in piety and character, and to make sure that they are worthy to be entrusted with ecclesiastical charges. Let them gradually appoint to the more responsible positions those whom practical experience will prove to be more efficient. Above all things, the clergy should hold to the rule that they are not to allow themselves to be mixed up in party strifes. Although it is a maxim of common law that he who fights for God should not be involved in worldly pursuits, we deem it necessary that men in holy orders, in the present condition of affairs in the Philippine Islands, should avoid this in a special manner. Moreover, since there is great power and harmony of sentiment for accomplishing every great useful work for the sake of religion, let all the priests, whether secular or religious, cultivate it most zealously. It is certainly proper that they who are one body of the one head, Christ, should not envy one another, but be of one will, loving one another with brotherly charity. To foster this charity and maintain a vigorous discipline, the bishops are reminded how very useful it is to convene a synod occasionally, as time and place may require. In this way, there will easily be unity in thought and action. To keep the first fervor of the priests from cooling, and to preserve and increase the virtues which are worthy of the priesthood, the practice of the spiritual exercises is most helpful. The bishops must therefore see that all who have been called to the vineyard of the Lord should at least every third year go into retreat in some suitable place to meditate on the eternal truce, to remove the stains contracted by worldly contaminations and renew their ecclesiastical spirit. Effort must be made to have the study of the sacred sciences kept alive among the clergy by frequent exercise. For the lips of the priest shall keep knowledge, which he can teach the faithful, who shall seek the law at his mouth. For this purpose there is nothing better than to have conferences frequently, both on moral and on liturgical questions. If the difficulties of traveling, or the small number of priests, or any other similar cause, prevents them from meeting for such discussions, it will be well to have those who cannot attend the conferences treat in writing the questions proposed, and submit them to the bishop at the appointed time. How much the Church thinks of seminaries for the young men who are educated with a view to the priesthood, it is clear from the decree of the Council of Trent, by which they were first instituted. The bishops should therefore make the most diligent effort to have one in each diocese, in which young candidates for the sacred warfare may be received, and trained for a holy living, and in the lower and higher sciences. It is advisable that the boys who are studying literature should occupy their own building, and the young men who, after finishing the humanities, are devoted to philosophy and theology should dwell in another. In both departments the students should remain until, if deserving, they shall have been ordained priests, and never be permitted, except for grave reasons, to return to their homes. The bishop will entrust the administration of the seminary to one of the clergy, whether secular or religious, who is distinguished for his prudence and experience in governing and for holiness of life. 
the rules laid down by us and our predecessors show very clearly in what way the studies are to be regulated in seminaries where there is no seminary the bishop will have candidates educated in one of the seminaries of the neighboring diocese on no account shall the bishops admit to these seminaries any but the young men who are likely to give themselves to god and holy orders those who wish to study for the civil professions should have other schools if it be possible known as episcopal institutions or colleges above all things the bishop following the precept of the apostle is not lightly to lay hands on any one but to raise to orders and to employ in sacred things only those who when well tried and duly advanced in science and virtue can be of credit and of service to a diocese they are not to leave those who go out from the seminary entirely to themselves but to keep them from idleness and from abandoning the study of the sacred sciences it is an excellent thing to have them every year for at least five years after ordination submit to an examination in dogmatic and moral theology before men of learning and authority since the halls of rome are also open to young students from the philippines who may wish to pursue the higher studies it will afford us much pleasure if the bishops send hither from time to time young men who may one day communicate to their fellow citizens the knowledge of religion acquired in this very center of truth the holy see will do its share in the most effective way to advance the secular clergy in higher learning in better ecclesiastical training so that in good time it may be worthy to assume the pastoral charges now administered by the regular priests it is not to the ecclesiastical seminaries only that the bishops are to devote their attention the young laymen who go to other schools are also committed to their care and providence it is therefore the duty of the consecrated bishops to make every effort that the minds of the young who are instructed in the public schools should not lack knowledge of their religion to have it taught properly the bishops must see and insist that the teachers are fitted for this task and that the books in use contain no errors since there is question of public schools we do not wish to proceed without a word of praise well deserved for the great lyceum of manila founded by the dominicans and authorized by innocent the tenth since it has always been distinguished for sound doctrine and excellent teachers for the great good it has accomplished not only do we wish that it be treated with favor by all the bishops but besides we take it under our own care and that of our successors wherefore confirming absolutely the privileges and honors granted to it by the roman pontiffs innocent the tenth and clement the twelfth we bestow upon it the title of pontifical university and wish that the academic degrees conferred by it may have the same value as the degrees given by other pontifical universities yielding to the opportunities of the new order of things in that region the holy apostolic see has decided to make suitable provision for the religious men who look to a manner of life proper to their institute devoted entirely to the duties of the sacred ministry for the advancement of public morality the increase of christianity and peaceful social intercourse we recommend earnestly therefore to the members of the religious orders to discharge holily the duties which they have assumed when pronouncing their vows giving no offence to any man we command them to keep their role of cloister inviolably and wish therefore that all should be bound by the decree issued by the congregation of bishops and regulars july twentieth seventeen thirty one which clement the thirteenth our predecessor confirmed by apostolic letters nuper pro parte august twenty sixth the same year the rule and boundary of the cloister are those which are laid down in another decree issued with the approbation of pius the sixth by the sacred congregation for the propagation of the faith august twenty fourth seventeen eighty for the rest the religious who labor in the philippines must remember to treat with great reverence and honor those whom the holy ghost hath placed to rule the church of god and bound together with the secular clergy by the closest ties of concord and charity let them hold nothing more pressing than to work hand in hand throwing all their energy into the work of the ministry and the building up of the body of christ furthermore to remove every element of dissension we wish that in future in the philippine islands the constitution Fermandus of benedict the twelfth dated november sixth seventeen forty four and the other romanus pontificus may eighth eighteen eighty one in which we decided certain points in dispute between the bishops and missionary regulars in england and scotland be observed 
the bishops will determine what parishes are to be entrusted to pastors from the religious orders after conferring with the superiors of these orders should any question arise in this matter which cannot be settled privately the case is to be referred to the delegate apostolic to the other means by which the church as teacher provides that faith and good morals and all that makes for the salvation of souls should suffer no harm must be added one of the very greatest utility the spiritual exercises commonly known as missions it is altogether desirable therefore that in each province at least one house be founded as a dwelling for about eight religious men whose one duty it will be to visit occasionally the towns and villages and better the people by pious exhortations if this is so useful for the faithful it is surely necessary for those who have not yet received the light of the gospel wherever therefore uncivilized peoples are still buried in monstrous idolatry the bishops and priests must know that they are bound to try to convert them let them therefore establish stations among them for priests who will act as their apostles and not only lead the idolaters to christian practices but also devote themselves to the instruction of the children these stations are to be so located that in due time they may be made prefectures or vicariates apostolic to provide those who labor in them with means for support and for the propagation of the faith we recommend that in each diocese without interfering with the leon society for the propagation of the faith special congregations of men and women be formed to manage the collection of the alms of the faithful and hand over the contributions to the bishops to be distributed entirely and equally to the missions but when the esteem of the faithful there is no better way than for the clergy to do in effect what as priests they preach for since as the council of trent says they are regarded as removed above worldly things to a higher plane others lift their eyes to them for a model and imitate what they get from them wherefore it is highly proper that priests should so regulate all their manners that in their dress carriage walk conversation and in all things they may appear grave moderate and altogether religious they should avoid even lighter faults which in them are serious so that all their actions may inspire veneration it is for this restoration of ecclesiastical discipline and for the full execution of this constitution we have sent our venerable brother john baptist guidi archbishop of steropolis as extraordinary delegate apostolic to the philippine islands carrying thither our person on him we have conferred all necessary faculties and we have given him besides our mandate to convene and hold a provincial synod as soon as circumstances permit it remains for us now only to address ourselves with paternal charity to all the inhabitants of the philippine islands and to exhort them with all the persuasion in our power to maintain union in the bonds of peace this the duty of our christian profession requires for greater is the brotherhood in christ than of blood for the brotherhood of blood means only a lightness of body but the brotherhood in christ is unanimity in heart and in soul as it is written in acts four thirty two and the multitude of believers had but one heart and one soul this too is required for the good of religion which is the chief source and ground of the praiseworthy things that have distinguished the philippine people in the past this finally is required by a sincere love of country which will derive nothing but loss and destruction from public disturbances let them reverence those who exercise authority according to the apostle for all power is from god and although separated from us by the broad expanse of ocean let them know that they are one in faith with the apostolic sea which embraces them with special affection and will never abandon its charge of protecting their interests here follow the usual affirmations of the validity of this constitution and the penalties for disobeying and opposing it end of section thirty Section 31 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Review of His Pontificate Apostolical Letter, March 19, 1902 Having come to the twenty-fifth year of our apostolic ministry, and being astonished ourselves at the length of the way which we have traveled amidst painful and continual cares, we are naturally inspired to lift our thoughts to the ever-blessed God, who with so many other favors has deigned to accord us a pontificate the length of which has scarcely been surpassed in history to the father of all mankind therefore 
to him who holds in his hands the mysterious secret of life ascends as an imperious need of the heart the canticle of our thanksgiving assuredly the eye of man cannot pierce all the depths of the designs of god in thus prolonging our old age beyond the limits of hope here we can only be silent in the door but there is one thing which we do well understand namely that as it has pleased him and still pleases him to preserve our existence a great duty is incumbent on us to live for the good and the development of his immaculate spouse the holy church and far from losing courage in the midst of cares and pains to consecrate to him the remainder of our strength unto our last sigh after paying a just tribute of gratitude to our heavenly father to whom be honour and glory for all eternity it is most agreeable to us to turn our thoughts and address our words to you venerable brothers who called by the holy ghost to govern the appointed portions of the flock of jesus christ share thereby with us in the struggle and triumph the sorrows and joys of the ministry of pastors no they shall never fade from our memory those frequent and striking testimonials of religious veneration which you have lavished upon us during the course of our pontificate and which you still multiply with emulation full of tenderness in the present circumstances intimately united with you already by our duty and our paternal love we are more closely drawn by those proofs of your devotedness so dear to our heart less for what was personal in them in our regard then for the inviolable attachment which they denote to this apostolic see centre and mainstay of all the seas of catholicity it has always been necessary that according to the different grades of the ecclesiastical hierarchy all the children of the church should be sedulously united by the bonds of mutual charity and by the pursuit of the same objects so as to form but one heart and one soul this union is become in our day more indispensable than ever for who can ignore the vast conspiracy of hostile forces which aims to-day at destroying and making disappear the great work of jesus christ by endeavouring with a fury which knows no limits to rob man in the intellectual order of the treasure of heavenly truths and in the social order to obliterate the most holy the most salutary christian institutions but by all this you yourselves are impressed every day you who more than once have poured out to us your anxieties and anguish deploring the multitude of prejudices the false systems and errors which are disseminated with impunity amongst the masses of the people what snares are set on every side for the souls of those who believe what obstacles are multiplied to weaken and if possible to destroy the beneficent action of the church and meanwhile as if to add derision to injustice the church herself is charged with having lost her pristine vigor and with being powerless to stem the tide of overflowing passions which threaten to carry everything away we would wish venerable brothers to entertain you with subjects less sad and more in harmony with the great and auspicious occasion which induces us to address you but nothing suggests such tenor of discourse neither the grievous trials of the church which calleth instance for prompt remedies nor the conditions of contemporary society which already undermined from a moral material point of view tend toward a yet more gloomy future by the abandonment of the great christian traditions a law of providence confirmed by history proving that the great religious principles could not be renounced without shaking at the same time the foundations of order and social prosperity in those circumstances in order to allow souls to recover to furnish them with a new provision of faith and courage it appears to us opportune and useful to weigh attentively in its origin causes and various forms the implacable war that is waged against the church and in announcing its pernicious consequences to indicate a remedy may our words therefore resound loudly though they but recall truths already asserted may they be hearkened to not only by the children of catholic unity but also by those who differ from us and even by the unhappy souls who have no longer any faith for they are all children of one father all destined for the same supreme good may our words finally be received as a testament which at the short distance that separates us from eternity we would wish to leave to the people as a presage of the salvation which we desire for all during the whole course of her history the church of christ has had to combat and suffer for truth and justice instituted by the divine redeemer himself to establish throughout the world the kingdom of god she must by the light of the gospel law lead fallen humanity to its immortal destinies 
that is, to make it enter upon the possession of the blessings without end, which God has promised us, and to which our unsighted natural power could never rise. A heavenly mission in the pursuit of which the church could not fail to be opposed by the countless passions begotten of man's primal fall and consequent corruption, pride, cupidity, and brutal desire of material pleasures, against all the vices and disorders springing from those poisonous roots, the church has ever been the most potent means of restraint. Nor should we be astonished at the persecutions which have arisen, in consequence, since the divine master foretold them, and they must continue as long as this world endures. What words did he address to his disciples when sending them to carry the treasure of his doctrines to all nations? They are familiar to all of us. You will be persecuted from city to city. You will be hated and despised for my name's sake. You will be dragged before the tribunals and condemned to extreme punishment. And wishing to encourage them for the hour of trial, he proposed himself as their example. If the world hate you, know ye that it hath hated me before you. Certainly, no one who takes a just and unbiased view of things can explain the motive of this hatred. What offense was ever committed? What hostility deserved by the divine Redeemer? Having come down amongst men through an impulse of divine charity, he had taught a doctrine that was blameless, consoling, most efficacious to unite mankind in a brotherhood of peace and love. He had coveted neither earthly greatness nor honor. He had usurped no one's right. On the contrary, he was full of pity for the weak, the sick, the poor, the sinner, and the oppressed. Hence his life was but a passage to distribute with munificent hand his benefits amongst men. We must acknowledge, in consequence, that it was simply by an excess of human malice, so much the more deplorable because unjust, that, nevertheless, he became in truth, according to the prophecy of Simeon, a sign to be contradicted. What wonder, then, if the Catholic Church, which continues his divine mission and is the incorruptible depositary of his truths, has inherited the same lot? The world is always consistent in its way. Near the sons of God are constantly present the satellites of that great adversary of the human race, who, a rebel from the beginning against the Most High, is named in the gospel the prince of this world. It is on this account that the spirit of the world, in the presence of the law and of him who announces it in the name of God, swells with the measureless pride of an independence that ill befits it. Alas, how often, in more stormy epics, with unheard of cruelty and shameless injustice, and to the evident undoing of the whole social body, have the adversaries banded themselves together for the foolhardy enterprise of dissolving the work of God. And not succeeding with one manner of persecution, they adopted others. For three long centuries, the Roman Empire, abusing its brute force, scattered the bodies of martyrs through all its provinces, and bathed them with their blood, every foot of ground in this sacred city of Rome, while heresy, acting in concert, whether hidden beneath a mask or with open effrontery, with sophistry and snare, endeavored to destroy at least the harmony and unity of faith. Then were set loose, like a devastating tempest, the hordes of barbarians from the north and the Muslims from the south, leaving in their wake only ruins and a desert. So has been transmitted from age to age the melancholy heritage of hatred by which the spouse of Christ has been overwhelmed. There followed a Caesarism, as suspicious as powerful, jealous of all other power, no matter what development it might itself have thence acquired, which incessantly attacked the church, to usurp her rights, and tread her liberties underfoot. The heart bleeds to see this mother so often oppressed with anguish and woes unutterable. However, triumphing over every obstacle, over all violence and all tyrannies, she pitched her peaceful tents more and more widely. She saved from disaster the glorious patrimony of arts, history, science, and letters, and imbuing deeply the whole body of society with the spirit of the gospel, she created Christian civilization, that civilization to which the nations subjected to its benefit influences, owe the equity of their laws, the mildness of their manners, the protection of the weak, pity for the afflicted and the poor, respect for the rights and dignities of all men, and thereby, as far as it is possible, amidst the fluctuation of human affairs, that calm of social life which springs from the just and prudent alliance between justice and liberty. 
those proofs of the intrinsic excellence of the church are as striking and sublime as they have been enduring nevertheless as in the middle ages and during the first centuries so in those nearer our own we see the church assailed more harshly in a certain sense at least and more distressingly than ever through a series of well-known historical causes the pretended reformation of the sixteenth century raised the standard of revolt and determining to strike out straight into the heart of the church audaciously attacked the papacy it broke the precious link of the ancient unity of faith and authority which multiplying a hundredfold power prestige and glory thanks to the harmonious pursuit of the same objects united all nations under one staff and one shepherd this unity being broken a pernicious principle of disintegration was introduced amongst all ranks of christians we do not indeed hereby pretend to affirm that from the beginning there was a set purpose of destroying the principle of christianity in the heart of society but by refusing on the one hand to acknowledge the supremacy of the holy see the effective cause and bond of unity and by proclaiming on the other the principle of private judgment the divine structure of faith was shaken to its deepest foundations and the way was open to infinite variations to doubts and denials of the most important things to an extent which the innovators themselves had not foreseen the way was opened then came the contemptuous and mocking philosophism of the eighteenth century which advanced farther it turned to ridicule the sacred canon of the scriptures and rejected the entire system of revealed truths with the purpose of being able ultimately to root out from the conscience of the people all religious belief and stifling within it the last breath of the spirit of christianity it is from this source that have flowed rationalism pantheism naturalism and materialism poisonous and destructive systems which under different appearances renew the ancient airs triumphantly refuted by the fathers and doctors of the church so that the pride of modern times by excessive confidence in its own lights was stricken with blindness and like paganism subsisted thenceforth on fancies even concerning the attributes of the human soul and the immortal destinies which constitute our glorious heritage the struggle against the church thus took on a more serious character than in the past no less because of the vehemence of the assault than because of its universality contemporary unbelief does not confine itself to denying or doubting articles of faith what it combats is the whole body of principles which sacred revelation and sound philosophy maintain those fundamental and holy principles which teach man the supreme object of his earthly life which keep him in the performance of his duty which inspire his heart with courage and resignation and which in promising him incorruptible justice and perfect happiness beyond the tomb enable him to subject time to eternity earth to heaven but what takes the place of these principles which form the incomparable strength bestowed by faith a frightful scepticism which chills the heart and stifles in the conscience every magnanimous aspiration this system of practical atheism must necessarily cause as in point of fact it does a profound disorder in the domain of morals for as the greatest philosophers of antiquity have declared religion is the chief foundation of justice and truth when the bonds are broken which unite man to god who is the sovereign legislator and universal judge a mere phantom of morality remains a morality which is purely civic and as it is termed independent which abstracting from the eternal mind and the laws of god descends inevitably till it reaches the ultimate conclusion of making man a law unto himself incapable in consequence of rising on the wings of christian hope to the goods of the world beyond man will seek a material satisfaction in the comforts and enjoyments of life there will be excited in him a thirst for pleasure a desire of riches and an eager quest of rapid and unlimited wealth even at the cost of justice there will be enkindled in him every ambition and a feverish and frenzied desire to gratify them even in defiance of law and he will be swayed by a contempt for right and for public authority as well as by licentiousness of life which when the condition becomes general will mark the real decay of society perhaps we may be accused of exaggerating the sad consequences of the disorders of which we speak 
no for the reality is before our eyes and warrants what too truly are forebodings it is manifest that if there is not some betterment soon the bases of society will crumble and drag down with them the great and eternal principles of law and morality it is in consequence of this condition of things that the social body beginning with the family is suffering such serious evils for the lay state forgetting its limitations and the essential object of the authority which it wields has laid its hands on the marriage bond to profane it and has stripped it of its religious character it has dared as much as it could in the matter of that natural right which parents possess to educate their children and in many countries it has destroyed the stability of marriage by giving a legal sanction to the licentious institution of divorce all know the result of these attacks more than words can tell they have multiplied marriages which are prompted only by shameful passions which are speedily dissolved and which at times bring about bloody tragedies at others the most shocking infidelities we say nothing of the innocent offspring of these unions the children who are abandoned or whose morals are corrupted on one side by the bad example of the parents on the other by the poison which the officially lay state constantly pours into their hearts along with the family the political and social order is also endangered by doctrines which ascribe a false origin to authority and which have corrupted the genuine conception of government for if sovereign authority is derived formally from the consent of the people and not from god who is the supreme and eternal principle of all power it loses in the eyes of the governed its most august characteristic and degenerates into an artificial sovereignty which rests on unstable and shifting bases namely the will of those from whom it is said to be derived do we not see the consequences of this error and the carrying out of our laws too often these laws instead of being sound reason formulated in writing are but the expression of the power of the greater number and the will of the predominant political party it is thus that the mob is cajoled in seeking to satisfy its desires that a loose rein is given to popular passion even when it disturbs the laboriously acquired tranquillity of the state when the disorder in the last extremity can only be quelled by violent measures and the shedding of blood consequent upon the repudiation of these christian principles which had contributed so efficaciously to unite the nations in the bonds of brotherhood and to bring all humanity into one great family there has arisen little by little in the international order a system of jealous egoism in consequence of which the nations now watch each other if not with hate at least with the suspicion of rivals hence in their great undertakings they lose sight of the lofty principles of morality and justice and forget the protection which the feeble and the oppressed have a right to demand in the desire by which they are actuated to increase their national riches they regard only the opportunity which circumstances afford the advantages of successful enterprises and the tempting bait of an accomplished fact sure that no one will trouble them in the name of right or the respect which right can claim such are the fatal principles which have consecrated material power as the supreme law of the world and to them is to be imputed the limitless increase of military establishments and that armed peace which in many respects is equivalent to a disastrous war this lamentable confusion in the realm of ideas has produced restlessness among the people outbreaks and the general spirit of rebellion from these has sprung the frequent popular agitations and disorders of our times which are only the preludes of much more terrible disorders in the future the miserable condition also of a large part of the poorer classes who assuredly merit our assistance furnishes an admirable opportunity for the designs of scheming agitators and especially of socialist factions which hold out to the humbler classes the most extravagant promises and use them to carry out the most dreadful projects those who start on a dangerous descent are soon hurled down in spite of themselves into the abyss prompted by an inexorable logic a society of veritable criminals has been organized which at its very first appearance has by its savage character startled the world thanks to the solidarity of its construction and its international ramifications it has already attempted its wicked work 
for it stands in fear of nothing and recoils before no danger repudiating all union with society and cynically scoffing at law religion and morality that adepts have adopted the name of anarchists and propose to utterly subvert the actual conditions of society by making use of every means that a blind and savage passion can suggest and as society draws its unity in its life from the authority which governs it so it is against authority that anarchy directs its efforts who does not feel a thrill of horror indignation and pity at the remembrance of the many victims that of late have fallen beneath its blows emperors empresses kings presidents of powerful republics whose only crime was the sovereign power with which they were invested in presence of the immensity of the evils which overwhelm society and the perils which menace it our duty compels us to again warn all men of good will especially those who occupy exalted positions and to conjure them as we now do to devise what remedies the situation calls for and with prudent energy to apply them without delay first of all it behooves them to inquire what remedies are needed and to examine well their potency in the present needs we have extolled liberty and its advantages to the skies and have proclaimed it as a sovereign remedy and an incomparable instrument of peace and prosperity which will be most fruitful in good results but facts have clearly shown us that it does not possess the power which it attributed to it economic conflicts struggles of the classes are surging around us like a conflagration on all sides and there is no promise of the dawn of the day of public tranquillity in point of fact and there is no one who does not see it liberty as it is now understood that is to say a liberty granted indiscriminately to truth and to error to good and to evil ends only in destroying all that is noble generous and holy and in opening the gates still wider to crime to suicide and to a multitude of the most degrading passions the doctrine is also taught that the development of public instruction by making the people more polished and more enlightened would suffice as a check to unhealthy tendencies and to keep man in the way of uprightness and probity but a hard reality has made us feel every day more and more of how little avail is instruction without religion and morality as a necessary consequence of inexperience and of the promptings of bad passions the mind of youth is enthralled by the perverse teachings of the day it absorbs all the errors which an unbridled press does not hesitate to sow broadcast and which depraves the mind and the will of youth and ferments in them that spirit of pride and insubordination which so often trouble the peace of families and cities so also was confidence reposed in the progress of science indeed the century which is just closed has witnessed progress that was great unexpected stupendous but is it true that it has given us all the fullness and healthfulness of fruitage that so many expected from it doubtless the discoveries of science have opened new horizons to the mind it has widened the empire of man over the forces of matter and human life has been ameliorated in many ways through its instrumentality nevertheless every one feels and many admit that the results have not corresponded to the hopes that were cherished it cannot be denied especially when we cast our eyes on the intellectual and moral status of the world as well as on the records of criminality when we hear the dull murmurs which arise in the depths or when we witness the predominance which might have won over right not to speak of the throngs who are a prey to every misery a superficial glance at the condition of the world will suffice to convince us of the indefinable sorrow which weighs upon souls and the immense void which is in human hearts man may subject nature to his sway but matters cannot give him what it has not and to the questions which most deeply affect our gravest interests human science gives no reply the thirst for truth for good for the infinite which devours us has not been slacked nor have the joys and riches of earth nor the increase of the comforts of life ever soothed the anguish which tortures the heart are we then to despise and fling aside the advantages which accrue from the study of science from civilization and the wise and sweet use of our liberty assuredly not on the contrary we must hold them in the highest esteem 
guard them and make them grow as a treasure of great price for they are means which of their nature are good designed by god himself and ordained by the infinite goodness and wisdom for the use and advantage of the human race but we must subordinate the use of them to the intentions of the creator and so employ them as never to eliminate the religious element in which their real advantage resides for it is that which bestows on them a special value and renders them really fruitful such is the secret of the problem when an organism perishes and corrupts it is because it has ceased to be under the action of the causes which had given it its form and constitution to make it healthy and flourishing again it is necessary to restore it to the vivifying action of those same causes so society in its foolhardy effort to escape from god has rejected the divine order and revelation and it is thus withdrawn from the salutary efficiency of christianity which is manifestly the most solid guarantee of order the strongest bond of fraternity and the inexhaustible source of all public and private virtue this sacrilegious divorce has resulted in bringing about the trouble which now disturbs the world hence it is the pale of the church which this lost society must re-enter if it wishes to recover its well-being its repose and its salvation just as christianity cannot penetrate in the soul without making it better so it cannot enter into public life without establishing order with the idea of a god who governs all who is infinitely wise good and just the idea of duty seizes upon the consciences of men it assages sorrow it calms hatred it engenders heroes if it has transformed pagan society and that transformation was a veritable resurrection for barbarism disappeared in proportion as christianity extended its sway so after the terrible shocks which unbelief has given to the world in our days it will be able to put the world again on the true road and bring back to order the states and peoples of modern times but the return of christianity will not be efficacious and complete if it does not restore the world to a sincere love of the one holy catholic and apostolic church in the catholic church christianity is incarnate it identifies itself with that perfect spiritual and in its own order sovereign society which is the mystical body of jesus christ and which has for its visible head the roman pontiff successor of the prince of the apostles it is the continuation of the mission of the saviour the daughter and the heiress of his redemption it has preached the gospel and has defended it at the price of its blood and strong in the divine assistance and of that immortality which had been promised it it makes no terms with error but remains faithful to the commands which it has received to carry the doctrine of jesus christ to the uttermost limits of the world and to the end of time and to protect it in its inviolable integrity legitimate dispenser of the teachings of the gospel it does not reveal itself only as the consoler and redeemer of souls but it is still more the internal source of justice and charity and the propagator as well as the guardian of true liberty and of that equality which alone is possible here below in applying the doctrine of its divine founder it maintains a wise equilibrium and marks the true limits between the rights and privileges of society the equality which it proclaims does not destroy the distinction between the different social classes it keeps them intact as nature itself demands in order to oppose the anarchy of reason emancipate it from faith and abandon to its own devices the liberty which it gives in no wise conflicts with the rights of truth because those rights are superior to the demands of liberty nor does it infringe upon the rights of justice because those rights are superior to the claims of mere numbers or power nor does it assail the rights of god because they are superior to the rights of humanity in the domestic circle the church is no less fruitful in good results for not only does it oppose the nefarious machinations which incredulity resorts to in order to attack the life of the family but it prepares and protects the union and stability of marriage whose honor fidelity and holiness it guards and develops at the same time it sustains and cements the civil and political order by giving on one side most efficacious aid to authority and on the other by showing itself favorable to the wise reforms and the just aspirations of the classes that are governed by imposing respect for rulers and enjoining whatever obedience is due to them 
and by defending unwaveringly the imprescribable rights of the human conscience. And thus it is that the people who are subject to her influence have no fear of oppression, because she checks in their efforts the rulers who seek to govern as tyrants. Fully aware of this divine power, we, from the very beginning of our pontificate, have endeavored to place in the clearest light the benevolent designs of the Church, and to increase, as far as possible, along with the treasures of her doctrine, the field of her solitary action. Such has been the object of the principal acts of our pontificate, notably in the encyclicals on Christian philosophy, on human liberty, on Christian marriage, on Freemasonry, on the powers of government, on the Christian constitution of states, on socialism, on the labor question, and the duties of Christian citizens, and other analogous subjects. But the ardent desire of our souls has not been merely to illumine the mind. We have endeavored to move and to purify hearts by making use of all our powers to cause Christian virtue to flourish among the peoples. For that reason, we have never ceased to bestow encouragement and counsel in order to elevate the minds of men to the goods of the world beyond, to enable them to subject the body to the soul, their earthly life to the heavenly one, man to God. Blessed by the Lord, our word has been able to increase and to strengthen the convictions of a great number of men, to throw light on their minds in the difficult questions of the day, to stimulate their zeal and to advance the various works which have been undertaken. It is especially for the disinherited classes that these works have been inaugurated and have continued to grow in every country, as is evident from the increase of Christian charity, which has always found in the midst of the people its favorite field of action. If the harvest has not been more abundant, venerable brothers, let us adore God, who is mysteriously just, and beg him, at the same time, to have pity on the blindness of so many souls, to whom unhappily the terrifying word of the apostle may be addressed. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not shine to them. The more the Catholic Church devotes itself to extend its zeal for the moral and material advancement of the peoples, the more the children of darkness arise in hatred against it, and have recourse to every means in their power to tarnish its divine beauty and paralyze its action of life-giving reparation. How many false reasonings have they not made, and how many calumnies have they not spread against it? Among their most perfidious devices is that which consists in repeating to the ignorant masses and to suspicious governments that the Church is opposed to the progress of science, that it is hostile to liberty, that the rights of the state are usurped by it, and that politics is a field which it is constantly invading. Such are the mad accusations that have been a thousand times repudiated and a thousand times refuted by sound reason and by history and, in fact, by every man who has a heart for honesty and a mind for truth. The Church, the enemy of knowledge and instruction. Without doubt she is the vigilant guardian of revealed dogma, but it is this very vigilant which prompts her to protect science and to favor the wise cultivation of the mind. No, in submitting his mind to the revelation of the word, who is the supreme truth from whom all truths must flow, man will in no wise contradict what reason discovers. On the contrary, the light which will come to him from the divine word will give more power and more clearness to the human intellect, because it will preserve it from a thousand uncertainties and errors. Besides, nineteen centuries of a glory achieved by Catholicism and all the branches of learning amply suffice to refute this calumny. It is to the Catholic Church that we must ascribe the merit of having propagated and defended Christian philosophy, without which the world would still be buried in the darkness of pagan superstitions and in the most abject barbarism. It is preserved and transmitted to all the generations the precious treasure of literature and of the ancient sciences. It has opened the first schools for the people and crowded the universities which still exist, or whose glory is perpetuated even to our own days. It has inspired the loftiest, the purest, and the most glorious literature, while it has gathered under its protection men whose genius in the arts has never been eclipsed. The Church, the enemy of liberty. Ah, how they travesty the idea of liberty, which has for its object one of the most precious of God's gifts when they make use of its name to justify its abuse and excess. 
What do we mean by liberty? Does it mean the exemption from all laws, the deliverance from all restraint, and as a corollary, the right to take man's caprice as a guide in all our actions? Such liberty the church certainly reproves, and good and honest men reprove it likewise. But do they mean by liberty the rational faculty to do good magnanimously without check or hindrance, and according to the rules which eternal justice has established? That liberty, which is the only liberty worthy of man, the only one useful to society, none favors or encourages or protects more than the church. By the force of its doctrine and the efficaciousness of its action, the church has freed humanity from the yoke of slavery in preaching to the world the great law of equality in human fraternity. In every age it has defended the feeble and the oppressed against the arrogant domination of the strong. It has demanded liberty of Christian conscience while pouring out in torrents the blood of its martyrs. It has restored to the child and to the woman the dignity and the noble prerogatives of their nature, and making them share by virtue of the same right that reverence and justice which is their due, and it has largely contributed both to introduce and maintain civil and political liberty in the heart of the nations. The Church the usurper of the rights of the State, the Church invading the political domain, why, the Church knows and teaches that her divine founder has commanded us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's, and that he has thus sanctioned the immutable principle of an enduring distinction between those two powers, which are both sovereign in their respective spheres, a distinction which is most pregnant in its consequences, and eminently conducive to the development of Christian civilization. In its spirit of charity it is a stranger to every hostile design against the State, it aims only at making these two powers go side by side for the advancement of the same object, namely, for man and for human society, but by different ways, and in conformity with the noble plan which has been assigned for its divine mission. Would to God that its action were received without mistrust and without suspicion. It could not fail to multiply the numberless benefits of which we have already spoken. To accuse the Church of ambitious views is only to repeat the ancient calumny, a calumny which its powerful enemies have more than once employed as a pretext to conceal their own purposes of oppression. Far from oppressing the State, history clearly shows, when it is read without prejudice, that the Church, like its divine founder, has been, on the contrary, most commonly the victim of oppression and injustice. The reason is that its power rests not on the force of arms, but on the strength of thought and of truth. It is therefore assuredly with malignant purpose that they hurl against the Church accusations like these. It is a pernicious and disloyal work, in the pursuit of which, above all others, a certain sect of darkness is engaged, a sect which human society these many years carries within itself and which, like a deadly poison, destroys its happiness, its fecundity, and its life. Abiding personifications of the revolution, it constitutes a sort of retrogressive society, whose object is to exercise an occult suzerainty over the established order, and whose whole purpose is to make war against God and against his church. There is no need of naming it, for all will recognize in these traits the society of Freemasons, of which we have already spoken expressly in our encyclical Humanum Genus of the 20th of April, 1884. While denouncing its destructive tendency, its erroneous teachings, and its wicked purpose of embracing, in its far-reaching grasp, almost all nations, and uniting itself to other sects, which its secret influence puts in motion, directing first, and afterwards retaining its members by the advantages which it procures for them, bending governments to its will, sometimes by promise and sometimes by threats. It has succeeded in entering all classes of society, and forms an invisible and irresponsible state, existing within the legitimate state. Full of the spirit of Satan, who, according to the words of the Apostle, knows how to transform himself at need into an angel of light, it gives prominence to its humanitarian object, but it sacrifices everything to its sectarian purpose, and protests that it has no political aim, while in reality it exercises the most profound action on the legislative and administrative life of the nations, and while loudly professing its respect for authority and even for religion, 
has for its ultimate purpose as its own statutes declare the destruction of all authority as well as of the priesthood both of which it holds up as the enemies of liberty it becomes more evident day by day that it is to the inspiration and the assistance of the sect that we must attribute in great measure the continual troubles with which the church is harassed as well as the recrudescence of the attacks to which it has recently been subjected for the simultaneousness of the assaults and the persecutions which have so suddenly burst upon us in these latter times like a storm from a clear sky that is to say without any cause proportionate to the effect the uniformity of means employed to inaugurate this persecution namely the press public assemblies theatrical productions the employment in every country of the same arms to wit calumny and public uprisings all this betrays clearly the identity of purpose and a program drawn up by one in the same central direction all this is only a simple episode of a prearranged plan carried out on a consistently widening field to multiply the ruins of which we speak thus they are endeavouring by every means in their power first to restrict and then to completely exclude religious instruction from the schools so as to make the rising generation unbelievers or indifferent to all religion as they are endeavouring by the daily press to combat the morality of the church to ridicule its practice and its solemnities it is only natural consequently that the catholic priesthood whose mission is to preach religion and to administer the sacraments should be assailed with a special fierceness in taking it as the object of their attacks the sect aims at diminishing in the eyes of the people its prestige and its authority already their audacity grows hour by hour in proportion as it flatters itself that it can do so with impunity it puts a malignant interpretation on all the acts of the clergy bases suspicion upon the slenderest proofs and overwhelms it with the vilest accusations thus new prejudices are added to those with which the clergy are already overwhelmed such for example as the subjection to military service which is such a great obstacle for the preparation for the priesthood and the confiscation of the ecclesiastical patrimony which the pious generosity of the faithful had founded as regards the religious orders and religious congregations the practice of the evangelical councils made them the glory of society and the glory of religion these very things rendered them more culpable in the eyes of the enemies of the church and were the reasons why they were fiercely denounced and held up to contempt and hatred it is a great grief for us to recall here the odious measures which were so undeserved and so strongly condemned by all honest men by which the members of religious orders were lately overwhelmed nothing was of avail to save them neither the integrity of their life which their enemies were unable to assail nor the right which authorizes all natural associations entered into for an honorable purpose nor for the right of the constitutions which loudly proclaim their freedom to enter into those organizations nor the favor of the people who were so grateful for the precious services rendered in the arts in the sciences and in agriculture and for the charity which poured itself out upon the most numerous and poorest classes of society and hence it is that these men and women who themselves had sprung from the people and who had spontaneously renounced all the joys of family to consecrate to the good of their fellow men in those peaceful associations their youth their talent their strength and their lives were treated as malefactors as if they had formed criminal associations and have been excluded from the common and prescriptive rights at the very time when men are speaking loudest of liberty we must not be astonished that the most beloved children are struck when the father himself that is to say the head of catholicity the roman pontiff is no better treated the facts are known to all stripped of the temporal sovereignty and consequently of that independence which is necessary to accomplish his universal and divine mission forced in rome itself to shut himself up in his own dwelling because the enemy had laid siege to him on every side he has been compelled in spite of the derisive assurances of respect and of the precarious promises of liberty to an abnormal condition of existence which is unjust and unworthy of his exalted ministry we know only too well the difficulties that are each instant created to thwart his intentions and to outrage his dignity it only goes to prove what is every day more and more evident that it is the spiritual power of the head of the church which little by little they aim at destroying when they attack the temporal power of the papacy 
those who are the real authors of this violation have not hesitated to confess it judging by the consequences which followed this action was not only impolitic but was an attack on society itself for the assaults that are made upon religion are so many blows struck at the very heart of society in making man a being destined to live in society god in his providence has also founded the church which as the holy text expresses it he has established on mount zion in order that it might be a light which with its life-giving rays would cause the principle of life to penetrate into the various degrees of human society by giving it divinely inspired laws by means of which society must establish itself in that order which would be most conducive to its welfare hence in proportion as society separates itself from the church which is an important element in its strength by so much does it decline or its woes are multiplied for the reason that they are separated whom god wished to bind together as for us we never weary as often as the occasion presents itself to inculcate these great truths and we desire to do so once again and in a very explicit manner on this extraordinary occasion may god grant that the faithful will take courage from what we say and be guided to unite their efforts more efficaciously for the common good that they may be more enlightened and that our adversaries may understand the injustice which they commit in persecuting the most loving mother and the most faithful benefactress of humanity we would not wish that the remembrance of these afflictions should diminish in the souls of the faithful that full and entire confidence which they ought to have in the divine assistance for god in his own hour and in his mysterious ways will bring about a certain victory as for us no matter how great the sadness which fills our heart we do not fear for the immortal destiny of the church as we have said in the beginning persecution is its heritage because in trying and in purifying its children god thereby obtains for them greater and more precious advantages and in permitting the church to undergo these trials he manifests the divine assistance which he bestows upon it for he provides new and unlooked-for means of assuring the support and the development of his work while revealing the futility of the powers which are leagued against it nineteen centuries of a life passed in the midst of the ebb and flow of all human vicissitudes teach us that the storms pass by without ever affecting the foundations of the church we are able all the more to remain unshaken in this confidence as the present time affords indications which forbid depression we cannot deny that the difficulties that confront us are extraordinary and formidable but there are also facts before our eyes which give evidence at the same time that god is fulfilling his promise with admirable wisdom and goodness while so many powers conspire against the church and while she is progressing on her way deprived of all human help and assistance is she not in effect carrying on her gigantic work in the world and is she not extending her action in every clime in every nation expelled by jesus christ the prince of this world can no longer exercise his proud dominion as heretofore and although doubtless the efforts of satan may cause us many a woe they will not achieve the object at which they aim already a supernatural tranquillity due to the holy ghost who provides for the church and who abides in it reigns not only in the souls of the faithful but also throughout christianity a tranquillity whose serene development we witness everywhere thanks to the union ever more and more close and affectionate with the apostolic see a union which is in marvellous contrast with the agitation the dissension and the continual unrest of the various sects which disturb the peace of society there exists also between bishops and clergy a union which is fruitful in numberless works of zeal and charity it exists likewise between the clergy and laity who more closely knit together and more completely freed from human respect than ever before are awakening to a new life and organizing with a generous emulation in defense of the sacred cause of religion it is this union which we have so often recommended and which we recommend again which we bless that it may develop still more and may rise like an impregnable wall against the fierce violence of the enemies of god there is nothing more natural than that like the branches which spring from the roots of the tree these numberless associations which we see with joy flourish in our days in the bosom of the church should arise grow strong and multiply there is no form of christian piety which has been omitted whether there is question of jesus christ himself or his adorable mysteries or his divine mother 
or the saints whose wonderful virtues have illumined the world nor has any kind of charitable work been forgotten on all sides there is a zealous endeavor to procure christian instruction for youth help for the sick moral teaching for the people and assistance for the classes least favored in the goods of this world with what remarkable rapidity this movement would propagate itself and what precious fruits it would bear if it were not opposed by the unjust and unfriendly efforts with which it finds itself so often in conflict god who gives to the church such great vitality in civilized countries where it has been established for so many centuries consoles us besides with other hopes these hopes we owe to the zeal of the catholic missionaries not permitting themselves to be discouraged by the perils which they face by the privations which they endure by the sacrifices of every kind which they accept their numbers are increasing and they are gaining whole countries to the gospel and to civilization nothing can diminish their courage although after the manner of their divine master they receive only accusations and calumnies as the reward of their untiring labors thus our sorrows are tempered by the sweetest consolations and in the midst of the struggles and the difficulties which are our portion we have wherewith to refresh our souls and to inspire us with hope this ought to suggest useful and wise reflections to those who view the world with intelligence and who do not permit passions to blind them for it proves that god has not made man independent in what regards the last end of life and just as he has spoken to him in the past so he speaks again in our day by his church which is visibly sustained by the divine assistance and which shows clearly where salvation and truth can be found come what may this eternal assistance will inspire our hearts with an incredible hope and persuade us that at the hour marked by providence and in a future which is not remote truth will scatter the mists in which men endeavor to shroud it and will shine forth more brilliantly than ever the spirit of the gospel will spread life anew in the heart of our corrupted society and in its perishing members in what concerns us venerable brethren in order to hasten the day of divine mercy we shall not fail in our duty to do everything to defend and develop the kingdom of god upon earth as for you your pastoral solicitude is too well known to us to exhort you to do the same may the ardent flame which burns in your hearts be transmitted more and more to the hearts of all your priests they are in immediate contact with the people if full of the spirit of jesus christ and keeping themselves above political passion they unite their action with yours they will succeed with the blessing of god in accomplishing marvels by their word they will enlighten the multitude by their sweetness of manner they will gain all hearts and in succoring with charity their suffering brethren they will help them little by little to better the condition in which they are placed the clergy will be firmly sustained by the active and intelligent cooperation of all men of good will thus the children who have tasted the sweetness of the church will thank her for it in a worthy way viz by gathering around her to defend her honor and her glory all can contribute to this work which will be so splendidly meritorious for them literary and learned men by defending her in books or in the daily press which is such a powerful instrument now made use of by her enemies fathers of families and teachers by giving a christian education to children magistrates and representatives of the people by showing themselves firm in the principles which they defend as well as by the integrity of their lives and in the profession of their faith without any vestige of human respect our age exacts lofty ideals generous designs and the exact observance of the laws it is by perfect submission to the directions of the holy see that this discipline will be strengthened for it is the best means of causing to disappear or at least of diminishing the evil which party opinions produce in fermenting divisions and it will assist us in uniting all our efforts for attaining that higher end namely the triumph of jesus christ and his church such is the duty of catholics as for her final triumph she depends upon him who watches with wisdom and love over his immaculate spouse and of whom it is written jesus christ yesterday to-day and the same for ever it is therefore to him that at this moment we should lift our hearts in humble and ardent prayer to him who loving with an infinite love our erring humanity has wished to make himself an expiatory victim for the sublimity of his martyrdom to him who seated although unseen in the mystical bark of his church 
can alone still the tempests and command the waves to be calm and the furious winds to cease without doubt venerable brethren you with us will ask this divine master for the cessation of the evils which are overwhelming society for the repeal of all hostile laws for the illumination of those who more perhaps through ignorance than through malice hate and persecute the religion of jesus christ and also for the drawing together of all men of good will in close and holy union may the triumph of truth and of justice be thus hastened in the world and for the great family of men may better days dawn days of tranquillity and of peace meanwhile as a pledge of the most precious and divine favor may the benediction which we give you with all our heart descend upon you and all the faithful committed to your care end of section thirty one recording by maria therese end of the great encyclical letters of pope leo the thirteenth